Hi there, welcome along to Wimbledon Uncovered on day two of the championships. Yesterday brought us plenty of exciting action as we celebrated a hundred years of centre court with Emma Raducanu and Andy Murray winning in fine style in that most famous of sporting arenas. There was also a bit of rain, but it wouldn't be Wimbledon without some rain, would it? Pleased to say, as you can see there, it's sunny right now, some blue skies overhead. There are lots more big matches for us to look forward to today and players already begun on the outside courts as players in the men's and ladies singles battle for a place in the second round. Lovely shot there of the beautiful surroundings here at the All England Club. Delighted to say Adam Hunt here alongside Rachel Stringer for the first time at the Championships this year. Day one in the books. Always look forward to day one but it's always a little bit stressful. You wonder how it's going to go. Day two, just that little bit calmer. How was day one for you? Yeah, I think it was great, apart from you just te teased it, didn't you? I hate to start with something negative, but as soon as Radzi and myself came on uh, with Laura Robson, the heavens absolutely opened. We saved we the rain for you, because Anne and I dodged it. <laughs> but um, no, it was great to be back, of course, and back with full capacity crowds, which I think was pretty special. Mm. The queue being back as well, I think everyone loves to go there and try and get some either ground passes or sit in the ticket resale queue, which is actually just behind us, which wasn't here last year either. So I really think Wimbledon is back to its best. That was the thing I noticed was the buzz around the ground. There was a, there's always a buzz at Wimbledon, and there was that last year, but with it just being a little bit quieter because of the cap on the capacity, the number of people that were allowed inside the show courts and also just in the grounds generally, with a grounds pass, it wasn't quite the same, and that buzz is back this year. Yeah, I think the beauty of it as well, I spoke to a couple of fans, and they said they had tickets for 2020 and actually deferred last year because they just wanted to, to come back when they wanted at their leisure. And they said, you know, picked a great year. They had centre court tickets of seeing Radicanu and Andy Murray, and they're both British fans. Actually, they were Scottish fans, so they were really treated. They said they were in row Z, but still, centre court, centre court. Exactly. And I think people were also remembering all those little things about women Wimbledon that they love, not necessarily the tennis, the flowers. I know you and I both we love our gardening, so we like the beautiful flowers, and there's so many of them around the grounds here at SW19. The strawberries and cream, you know, a glass of pims later on in the day when the sun starts to set. And it, it was just a, a beautiful day and a real celebration, I think, of tennis and sport to have everything back as normal uh, here at the Championships. Got loads to look forward to today, as we said. Let's have a, uh, go through the order of play. We shall start with Centre Court. As I said, the centenary uh, this year, 100 years of that uh, lovely arena, the world number one. 
and uh, the Roland Garros uh, champion from a few weeks ago, Iga Swiatek, against Jana Fett is first up, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a great matchup, of course. Um, Ash Barty's not here, so Sviantec is going to get the honour of opening up proceedings here today there. And um, I think everyone's saying she's looking in fine form. On that 35 match, a, a match run winning streak, of course, can she go better? Um, so she's in great form against Jana Fett from Croatia, who I think is going to have a, a pretty tough ask, but you never know what happens and on she... centre court because it does bring that added pressure. But with the new kind of walkout this year, there's something to be celebrated about that as well. Yes, it's like a gladiator's arena, isn't it? The way they walk out through the middle. Jana Fett, as you said, has had some good results against top 10 players. Maybe not here on the grass, but some of the other slams. But that winning streak, absolutely incredible. 35 wins in a row. She hasn't lost a match since February. What were you doing in February? I don't know. It was amazing how long it's lasted. Uh, then after that, Rafa Nadal. We're talking about things it's great to see back at Wimbledon this year. It's great to see Rafa Nadal back. I think both of these next two matches are, are about returns, really, aren't they? Rafa Nadal coming back first time in a couple of years. He's been here at Wimbledon. He says his foot's all right. I mean, he was having injections at Roland Garros just to get through the matches, but he says it's OK now. Um, he's playing against the world number 41, Francisco Sarundolo, second on centre court. Yeah, he kind of said as well, didn't he? After his first round matchup, don't speak about the foot. We've already put that to bed. He's here, he's ready to play. Um, and he obviously did some matches at the Hurlingham Club and a little bit of preparation. But usually he comes into Wimbledon, have playing, have played, sorry, a couple of grass court matches. He hasn't really got maybe as many as he hoped to under his belt. He's always on the contrast, isn't he, to Novak, mm. who doesn't ever play many matches here and then loses his first set and then goes on to win on centre right. court like he did again yesterday. Yesterday. But yeah, hasn't been here since 2019, so he's definitely filling that gap that Roda Federer is leaving open. Uh, and then after that, of course, Serena Williams. Great to see her back as well. How is she going to get on? Hard to really tell. She played doubles at Eastbourne last week, but no form coming into this. She's against Harmony Tan. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about her, the French lady there on centre court last up. On court one, we've got three matches uh, to look forward to on there as well. They start, or well, they're out on court. Um, at the moment have just uh, walked out there um, because they start half an hour earlier uh, on court number one compared to centre court. Bit of a change uh, here because a uh, bit of a, a blow, I suppose, for, for the fans and for Matteo Berrettini. Unfortunately, he's been ruled out of the championships, last year's finalist, due to COVID. I think that's very disappointing, isn't it, for the fans and for everybody here. You know, six times Queen's champion coming into this. Obviously, he won Stuttgart Open as well. Andy Murray did pick up that injury. And I think everyone wanted to see if he could reach the same heights that he did last year in game to the final. And I was really excited to see him play here, but not to be this year. So we've yes. got someone else up on court one, haven't we? Alex Timonur is taking on Hugo. Delin from Bolivia, which will be an exciting matchup. Aussie number one there. Yeah, they managed to find some people to go and play on court number one. It was easy <laughs> enough, I imagine. Who wants to play on court one? I do. Um, and then after that is the culmination of Heather Watson's match. This match was going to be on a different court last night, but they got moved um, onto a show court just so they could, they could get started. And it was a really entertaining one. 7-6, uh, the first set to Tamara Korpach of Germany. Then Watson struck back and won the second 7-5 and they'll begin for that third set. Then after that, Simona Halep. Great to see her back at the championships against Karolina Mukova, who I believe is Rebel Wilson's best friend. Wasn't that the, the story? Uh, You're telling me that ago. one. I haven't we'll, obviously we'll have been on social media. Up. I think she was in her box. Uh, and then after that, Stefano Tsitsipas. Uh, great to watch against Alexandra Richard as well from Switzerland. OK, let's go over to uh, court two to watch some uh, live action. And we can see Coco Goff, one of the exciting young stars of the game, against Elena Gabriela Roos. First time that they've met, as you can see, on any level, really, either at the Grand Slams or the uh, WTA Tour. Uh, and uh, everyone getting ready for this uh, inside court uh, two. It's been a few years now since court two was rebuilt, but it is a lovely arena down there. The, the court is, you've been down there many times, haven't you, Rachel? It, it's slightly sunken, so it has a bit of a different feel, I would say, to a lot of the other courts here at uh, SW19. Yeah, I mean, some of the bigger courts like court two there are just beautiful to go and sit in and watch, and you can see the people are already down there. Not everyone's taken their seats yet. A couple of green chairs still available. They'll want to get down there to see Coco Goff. I mean, she's been on great form since Roland Garros um, when she reached her first 
slam final there and she'll have great memories of playing here from 2019 wasn't it when she burst onto the scene so she's definitely a star of the future so the 18 years of age, mm. I believe. Well, I think that was it, wasn't it? That was, that was, if last year the fairy tale was about Emma Raducanu and coming out of nowhere, she just finished her A-levels to play here at Wimbledon. There's always a, always a storyline, always a darling. Last year it was Emma. The year before that we were cancelled. And then the year before that it was, it was Coco Goff. So she knows what it feels like. Everyone was wondering after that, how would she get on? Would it be a flash in the pan? Would she be able to follow it up? Will she become a Grand Slam champion? She hasn't quite done that yet. But she did, as you said, produce a brilliant performance to get to the final at Roland Garros. And I think she's many people's, perhaps not favourite, to win the title here at uh, Wimbledon, but certainly to go uh, a long, long way and challenge those uh, top players. Um, she's also super mature for yes. her age, isn't she? And she's an advocate for so many social issues as well. She, she realises... Um, the role that she plays, not just within tennis, but also in the wider world, a bit like Serena Williams has done, and she's spoken about her as a, as a role model and also wanting to be her own woman. Uh, she is, it's amazing to think how young actually she is. Yeah, exactly. So she's definitely using her platform, and that's what she says, isn't she? She wants to get to these Grand Slam finals to be able to, I guess, capture more of the world's attention on pressing issues, which, you know, she feels really strongly about so she'll be wanting to go on a great run here at the championship so she obviously will be starting her campaign then on court number two again it's it's funny isn't it when you've had such great experiences here she maybe thinks again should i have deserved to go on a, on maybe court one or on center court but i don't really think it matters especially in the, no. the early days of the competition just get the job done under the radar adam which is what she can do she probably looks at likes of Emma Raducanu, the British darling, the British hopeful, and says, you know what, I'm happy to be the person on, on court two here. Yes, I'm sure she will enjoy it. So the stage is set, the sun is out, we couldn't want any more. Let's join the commentators there on court number two. Excuse me, behind the players, can you sit down, please? Law 15. Law 30. Rocky start, edgy Coco Golf. Well, not in the plans of Coco Goff. Three break points in the opening game. I've just managed to grab a couple, a few, of the court services team. Ladies, thanks for stopping. I know you're obviously very, very busy. Can you just tell us a bit about your role here at Wimbledon? Um, so our role is a very complex role. We are mainly here for the courts, obviously. We dress in the morning. We cover the courts when it rains. We are there to shade the players when, it, when it's sunny. Um, but we, we do a multitude of jobs. We're always running around We're very busy. You know, we look after these courts. We keep them in top-notch condition. You really do. They are absolutely pristine. Um, obviously, it's so exciting. We're up and running now. Yesterday, there was a lot of heavy rain. Tell me, like, okay, what goes through your head and how quickly do you need to respond and react? 
It's an immediate response. We have numbers that are, let us know what, at what stage we need to be at, if we should be courtside ready to go or if we need to be covering immediately. That obviously gets sent to us from headquarters and we, we react as soon as possible and get those courts covered, stop any rain from getting on the court and get as much as that um, prepared as we can. So on a court, how many of you guys are there per court and you have a supervisor per court and kind of just talk us through the system of it all because you know as a spectator and viewer it is so impressive like Wimbledon has it oh slick but like what goes into that from your point of view yeah, so on a court there are six of us um, six per team and everyone has their role some people take the chairs off um, and everyone's there to pull a tape um, so when people are pulling um, everyone's got their position and knows exactly what they're doing um, and there's a supervisor that looks after two or three courts um, or more um, throughout the championships just to make sure everything's in running order. Uh, and have you all done this before? Is it your first year? And how did you get involved and why would you want to get involved? I mean, I think I know the answer to that, but you tell me. I mean, I've, actually, this is my ninth championship. I was a ball girl for three years, so that's how I first started, my first ever paid job, and I just kept coming back. Um, and then, you know, I went to university and this was the perfect summer job. So Isn't it? I've um, done the rounds on the courts and now supervising multitude of courts. So it's, I, love, I love it and keep coming back. I mean, I get it. But also, you guys are such an integral and iconic part of the setup. I'm sure all the championships have it, but the Wimbledon lot, yeah. they're the best ones. Um, is this your first year or tell me about your experience here? This is my third year doing it. Um, I spent the first year um, just as a court attendant and the last two years I've been running the logistics. So that's everything involving towels, water, Gatorade, bananas, anything <laughs> that the players might need. Dates sometimes yeah. better asks for, racket restrings. We're in charge of all of that. Wow. So any towels you see have come straight from the logistics team. There's so much to think about. And as a spectator, you don't even think about it. So do you kind of get um, a kind of a diva wish list from each player or how does it work? Or you know, t tell me about the like literal process of it all. Um, so every morning we pack the bags for towels for everything that's needed for play that day. We get calls through from the referee's office if anyone needs anything extra. You do the, get the occasional such as Federer asking for dates and things like that. But Again, I love a date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But everyone's very nice. All the players I've ever spoken to have been extremely friendly and they're so amazing. They respect us and we respect them back. So it's a really great team. And are you big tennis fans? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm so sad Federer's not playing. Yeah, absolutely gutted. Um, but yeah, absolutely love watching it um, and get different matches every day. Sometimes you get to sit on centre, which is absolutely amazing. So that's um, another question. Do you rotate your courts or use fixed uh, your court for the whole championships or tournament? Yeah, so most people get assigned a court. I'm on the logistics team, so is Hattie. Um, and so we sometimes get different courts. But sitting on centre is amazing and holding the umbrellas for the players is oh, amazing. Wow. Um, and being up close is is really great and it's an amazing experience so honestly it really is and what a thing for your cv i always think like that must be a great talking point moving yeah. forward what do you hope to do you've left university yeah, so what's so your goal I'm, now um i'm currently part way through becoming a qualified architect so that's what i do wow. outside of this um i've obviously done my undergrad done my masters and i'm working but yeah i'm working my way to be uh, formally qualified so <laughs> Wow, and the architecture here is just fantastic. And also, what do you make of how stunning all the kind of horticultural elements are? For me, that's really something great because I work in um, hydroponic vertical farming, so anything to do with crops is definitely down my street. So um, that's something I really love seeing, all the different varieties of flowers and everything around. And how incredible the grass courts are and how well they're maintained. I mean, they're maintained 365 days of the year. They're constantly looked after by the ground staff who just do an amazing job. But yeah, I think everyone respects the grass and try and keeps it nice. But obviously, after a few days of tennis, it's, it's not much can be done. It's the canvas, let the artists do their thing. Okay, and finally, who, what court are you on today and who do you hope to see then? I'm on court two today, um, so lots of action. Um, who, who are the main people playing today? Dimitrov, there you go. So I need to get over, run over to court two. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let us stop you. Go, go, go. Thank you so much, ladies. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. You too. Hello, a warm welcome to day one of Wimbledon 2022. A big year with the centenary of the Centre Court. And the doors open, it's match one on Centre Court 2022.
realised that it wasn't without some difficulty. Djokovic is back. All my dreams, childhood dreams came true here in this court, in this tournament. So, of course, it's an absolute uh, honour and pleasure to come back to, to the centre court of Wimbledon. And Chabert, third seed and the world number two, safely into the second round. It's a great start for me. Hopefully, you know, I want to go as far as I can in this tournament. And uh, jumping for games is a start, you know. Excellent. Just the finish he wanted. Cam Norrie makes it through to the second round at Wimbledon. Good-looking lob. Yeah. Perfect. She wraps it up convincingly enough. Happy to have got it done. A nervous performance, really, from Annette Contevate. Well, the sun has come out for Emma Raducanu on her very first outing to the centre court. on her centre court debut. I want to say like thank you to everyone who's you know been here supporting and through the tough times as well. But uh, yeah, it's all worth it to play on centre court and especially come through with a win. <laughs> and one more Andy Murray win to add to the century of centre court stories. Obviously, I'm getting on a bit now, so I don't know how many more opportunities I get to play on this court, so I want to make the most of every time um, I get to come out here now. And um, yeah, glad I managed to, to get through and hopefully get another match on here in a couple of days. Well, it was a great day on centre court for Emma Raducanu, Novak Djokovic and Andy Murray. Igor Sviantek will open up proceedings on centre court in about 10 minutes time. Uh, she's out at Rangi at the moment, just having a bit of a, a warm-up practice uh, before she heads out onto that iconic centre court. And like Andy Murray said there, you know, you just want to make the most of every occasion when you get to play on that iconic court. They may not come around that often, but they might for this 21-year-old who feels, Adam, like she's still just at the beginning of her career. It feels like yesterday, 2018, when she came and was a junior champion here. You know, she's got such a, a career ahead of her at the age of only 21. But this is a championship that I'm sure will be on her list of ones to win. She's won Roland Garros twice, not Wimbledon yet. Yes, I think every tennis player growing up dreams of of lifting uh, the title one day on centre court here at Wimbledon. It's interesting you said there, obviously she had a good record as a junior here at Wimbledon, but a lot of people who've been looking at her game have said that grass is the surface that perhaps doesn't suit her game quite as much as clay and the slower surfaces, because as we're seeing here, she moves so beautifully and she's so, so quick around the baseline and moving forward as well. And that has helped her enjoy the results that she has done on all surfaces, but particularly on clay and hard court. And she's having to modify her game. She's been quite open about this in interviews, talking about how she's had to learn and modify her game for grass to enjoy um, success at this level on this surface. And what I really like as well about Iga Svantec is she is very open and honest in her interviews. Sometimes tennis players and, and sports stars, and, and you can understand the reason they do this, they can be quite closed in interviews. They don't give too much away about their own process, how they're feeling. But Svantec, by comparison, in her interview, she talks about her uh, mental state, how she feels on court, what she's been working on, um, and, and she is just a breath of, of fresh air for the women's game. Yeah, that's like something she's been talking about quite a lot, was that she has a psychologist travelling with her now, which has really changed how she performs and how she, I guess, uh, takes care of herself on the tour. But everyone here on the hill will be excited to watch that match when it gets underway in just a few moments' time. But for now, let's go over to Renee Stubbs, who caught up with Igor Sviantec ahead of the tournament. 
how does it feel for you to be back at Wimbledon? And uh, I mean, what are you most looking forward to about this, this place and this tournament? Um, hmm. It's hard to choose one thing, honestly, but I'm just looking forward to, I don't know, getting used to grass and realizing how, how I should play to play my most efficient tennis here. Um, but I'm pretty happy just to be here and to experience this whole atmosphere and uh, in different conditions than last year. and I can enjoy just, you know, staying in Wimbledon and seeing all the places. Yeah, that was my next question to you. It's, this is the first time in a number of years where we're going to have a full crowd. It's going to be a very different atmosphere. How do you um, feel about that? Well, for me, the most important thing is to, like, show the people my tennis and kind of, um, it depends. Because sometimes when I feel like I'm not playing um, my kind of game, it can really stress me out when people are watching. <laughs> but I, most of times, I really like it, and it's like giving me extra motivation, extra energy. So hopefully, I'm gonna use it this time. And um, yeah, I'm pretty excited for it. Your form, obviously, coming in here is extraordinary. Coming after winning the French Open, especially, but. This is a different court surface for you. You yeah. didn't play a lead-up tournament, so I guess how do you feel coming in to play Wimbledon without any grass court matches? I feel differently than actually people are like describing my position because um, I feel like I'm not a favorite here because uh, what I just played like I don't know eight weeks on grass on, in my whole life, so uh, so basically I'm here to to learn and to kind of acknowledge all the process and I'm going to try to play without expectations. This is the 100 years of centre court, which you see on the uh, umpire's chair down there. It doesn't it's look that old. No, it doesn't look that old, does it? It looks pretty great. But it is why we are sitting here particularly today with you. Um, what's your earliest memory of centre court, whether it be watching it on television or being here in person? What's the earliest you can remember? What's so special about this particular court? The first match that I watched was probably the final in uh, 20 um, in 2008. Rafa and Roger, right? Did I mess up the dates or not? Yeah, yeah, well, they played here a lot of times, but, uh, <laughs> but they played a lot of times, so it's okay that you forgot. But uh, yes. So I was seven, and I don't remember a lot, <laughs> but I was pretty excited for the match. Um, and um, I remember just having a little tour around here um, in 2018 when I won junior tournament. It was. It was right before the tournament. I remember it was pretty inspirational, and uh, I was also able to see the trophies, um, <laughs> and they were so shiny. <laughs> um, They're actually down there. They were down there earlier. Really? Do you go and take a look sometimes at the trophy inside center court in there? Am I allowed to? Yeah, of course you are. Number okay. one seed. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, I'm not the kind of person who's like imagining myself with trophies and stuff, but um, but here you can feel all the tradition and all the I don't know the you can feel different atmosphere when you look at them. So um, back then, when I played junior tournament, it was amazing, and I'm pretty sure that it would be right now. But um, I still feel like it's a long way for me to leave those, so... <laughs> <laughs> Gotta believe in yourself a little more. What is unique about this court? Hmm. Well, the surface, um, for sure. I mean, I would say I really love how it's built and that uh, part of the audience is like in a shadow because it feels like you're in the, in the center of it more and um, you feel like you can really be more focused of, or what's going on in here, um, but that's a hard question. You should have told me that you're going to ask it. Um, <laughs> we like to catch you off, that's why. I love the, the colors of Wimbledon and the design, because actually green and purple, green is my favorite color and purple is the second one, so oh. coincidence? Oh, I don't, I don't know. So. <laughs> the specifics of playing on this court, when you walk on this court, what is the difference about walking on this court to any other stadium court uh, on our tours? When I'm gonna focus on, you know, the tradition and that I'm on Wimbledon on center court, I think it may really stress me out. So for sure, my goal when I'm gonna be walking out on Tuesday is gonna be just to have my focus in the right place and um, just to kind of play my game as if it would be any other match. I know it sounds weird, but that's the best way to to perform. You know, 
and uh, I don't want to think about all the stuff that is around because it may really stress me out. So don't go there. All right. Well, let's say I'm not going to stress you out on this question. This is obviously one of the great stadiums in the world. But if you had a chance to play a tennis match on any other, other than a tennis facility, a stadium around the world that, that you would love to play a tennis match in, what would it be? I mean, it's not a stadium, but I saw photos where I think Rafa and Roger played on water. I would love to try that. <laughs> and when I'm going to get angry and lose a point, I'm just going to jump out and swim well, and get my anger out. Okay. Does not not your racket. You're just going to swim out there yourself. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> this court has seen some incredible matches through the last 100 years. Um, if you could transport yourself here into the, sta into the stadium to sit and watch it, what match would you love to be here for live and see? Um, 2008 men's final. On Tuesday, you get to come out here and open up the court. It's usually a tradition that has uh, belonged to the past champion from the previous year. What does that mean to you? Because, of course, Ash Barty, who is a very good friend of yours, um, is not here. So what does that mean to you to walk on this particular court this year? Well, it's a huge privilege. And I feel like there are many you know, players in a draw who actually won this tournament even a couple of times. So, <laughs> um, so I feel like I need to kind of prove myself that I, I was <laughs> the right person to, to go out there on Tuesday. But, um, yeah, I feel I just really want to make it a good show and um, just show what I can do on grass because I feel like I still, like I still uh, haven't been uh, able, to, be able like, to like play with play potential, potential here potential and, here um, and um, I want to use I wanna next year, next, next year, maybe this 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 year, maybe Pretty weird, pretty actually, actually, actually wishing the goal that I wanted to, to, to reach, to reach. Um, um, because, because I was really, I was really this year I this year really worked, I worked hard, hard um, in 2018, 2018 to, win to win Junior Grand Slam. Grand Slam. Um, I was really pumped up around Garros, then there was, then there the, was huge the, huge, it was a huge disappointment for me because I lost in semi-final. Semi -final. And um, I remember how much energy and how much you know willingness and just motivation I had coming to this tournament. They really used it properly. So. Um, hopefully I'm going to have the same energy here. We asked the local community here um, about some inspirational moments that they have, whether it's viewing their child ride the bike for the first time or them in particular. What's a, a, junior, what's, a, what's a moment in your life that you just found so inspiring, whether it be you or something you saw or someone you, an event you saw, what, what inspired you? I would say um, coming to my first Junior Grand Slams in uh, 2016, I was 15 and I didn't really know if I'm gonna, you know, belong to the tennis world or not. So I went to French Open, then Wimbledon, and just seeing all these players around and uh, it felt like the whole world is focusing suddenly on tennis, you know, and yeah. I realized that this is the place I'm gonna, I want to be in the future and I'm gonna do anything to get there. So um, before I didn't really believe that it's possible, but then I realized that maybe it's my place to be. There's some amazing things that are happening across the road. Um, I don't know if you've taken a look, but uh, Wimbledon have really tried to change what's happening across the street. We have new courts over there. They're bringing qualifying over there in particular. What do you think that's going to make a change for the, certainly the kids growing up to come here and play qualifying across the street and uh, the opportunities of that beautiful building across the street now. I think it's great that everything is going to be in one place, you know, because uh, yeah, w even when I was playing junior tournament, um, we played mostly the qualifying are in Rohampton, right? Yeah. So you still feel like it's it's not Wimbledon, you know? So yeah. um, it's great that people are going to be able to experience the whole atmosphere a little bit earlier. And um, yeah, it's going to help also to, I don't know, get more experience. I think you've inspired a lot of kids, not only in Poland, but around the world um, to <laughs> play tennis. And let's uh, hope that you have the success here that you've uh, had um, in the last three or four months. So Thank good luck, Iga.
Yeah, it was great to hear the thoughts of Iga Swiatek. And here she is taking to centre court for the first time in her career. Always a special moment, I'm sure, for any uh, young tennis player, even given the success that she's enjoyed in the last few years. Winning those Grand Slam titles, always a special moment to step out in the sunshine uh, on centre court. And she is uh, facing the creation in your picture here, uh, Jana Fett. So much expected of uh, Sviontek. As we were saying, Rachel, she hasn't always had her best results um, on a grass court. A game much more suited perhaps to the slower surfaces, clay and, and hard courts. But given the way she's been playing, that incredible winning run, 35 wins in a row, stretching back to... Uh, February, she's hoping to overtake uh, Venus Williams, who set the record, or the Open Era record, a long, long time ago. Shows how long Venus Williams' career has been. 22 years ago, in 2000, she set the record at 35. That's been equaled by Iga Svantec. And if she can win today, she would make it to 36. Uh, the crowd's starting to fill up. There's always a few empty seats. People are enjoying a, a longer lunch than perhaps first expected as we uh, tick past 1.30. Uh, local time here in London. We're all ready for this match and we can join the commentators for the first game and the end of this warm-up on centre court. It's certainly tightened up on the knock-up these days. One minute to get to the coin toss. Four minutes uh, you're allowed to knock up rather than five and then once uh, the umpire has called time you've got one minute to we call it faffing about with your with your bag and bits and pieces to get to, to start the match. Yeah, I guess they realised people were taking way too it long. Was, it more. was. Now you're working in TV, you'll realise that the five minute knock up became a sort of eight or nine minute occasion. <laughs> I do remember feeling sometimes a little bit rushed, you know, getting to the mm -hmm. chair, yep. getting up from the chair. <laughs> but. Well, the centre court looking absolutely immaculate. Neil Stubbley and his team have done a fabulous job. Of course, we'll be using this court for 14 consecutive days now. And this is a man you know well, Thomas Witkarowski. Absolutely. He was the former coach of Agnieszka Radmanska, who obviously played the finals here. And a great friend of yours. Great friend of mine. And he's done an amazing job with uh, Iga Schwantek and has elevated her tennis yes. to even greater heights. And I mean, she's been playing fantastic. Her forehand has gotten to become a huge weapon. She, her serve has gotten much better. It's a, it's a great combination, a great duo. Ready, play. spending uh, 13th and 14th weeks at the top of women's tennis. She is very much in the winning habit. She has won, goodness me, her last six events, stretching all the way back to mid-February. Dubai, Indian Wells, Miami, the Sunshine Double. That's only been done by Graf and Kleisters and Azarenka in tennis history. Champion in Stuttgart on the clay. And in Rome, defended her title. And then a second uh, Grand Slam trophy in Paris. Yeah, she's had an incredible run winning so many tournaments in a row is 
something we were only used to seeing Serena yep. do for a while. Ever remember <laughs> eager foot faulting, and that is uh, if you've just tuned in to Tennessee, that is when your back foot or your front foot goes over the baseline, crosses the baseline before you've struck the ball. Would you have liked a forehand like that, Carol? <laughs> I would have loved to be able to finish it off easily like this. She just gets so much easy power from that wing. Schwantek had to work a little bit for that first game, but she takes it. Don't forget, you can continue to watch that match on Wimbledon's major broadcasters all around the world. That's the picture of the beautiful All England Club bathed in sunshine here on day two of the championships. And I'm delighted to say, Rachel, we're joined by someone who's got 23 more Grand Slam titles than we have. We've got a big fat zero between us. It's Bob Bryan, How you doing? star of the Bryan brothers, Bob and Mike. A um, couple of years since you yeah. stopped playing, yeah. obviously, COVID and the pandemic had, had something to do with that. But what, what's life like for you now? What are you up to? It's, it's pretty relaxed. You know, a lot of school pickups. You know, I feel like an Uber driver. Um, <laughs> but a lot of fun. You know, it just it's settled down. I, I'm at home a lot, a lot more. It's my first time at Wimbledon in three years. But the kids are going in tennis. I got three, three little ones that are playing every day. I'm playing a lot of music. You know, I'm jumping on the piano a ton. I'm playing a lot of chess. But good to be back here. I mean, this place is beautiful. So many great memories from here. My mom played here back in the day, so uh, it's, it's good to be back with you. You're a household name here, but how is it to, to be more of a fan this time out? Are you getting to go to places that you didn't get to as a player and, and see some different things? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a suit for the first time in a long time, and uh, just seeing a lot of the faces that we played against for so many years, good catching up with old friends. But really, yeah, I'm a fan now. I'm enjoying the tennis. Love seeing Alcaraz yesterday. I, you know, I saw him in the Miami Open for the first time. Love his game, so it was good to see him win yesterday. And yeah, I'm riding the rails. You know, I've, I was at Isner's practice today. I saw Andy Murray at Arangi Park, and uh, I'm hitting a few balls as well. You know, there's a, the Invitational coming up next week, so I'm trying to get it back, get it back. But uh, yeah, it's just a blast. A lot of former players tell us that no matter how long their career was, and, and you and Mike both enjoyed a really long period at the top of the game it always they feel like when they stop playing it yeah. went by in a heartbeat how did we play at Wimbledon 16 17 years yeah. in a row and it's gone no, do you true. feel like that now you look back over your career uh, and are grateful for for the length of the career but also just how quickly those good times went definitely grateful to to play here so many times but you're right I mean you're you're in the moment you're getting ready for the next match you're going to sleep early waking up uh, trying to eat as best you can and, and just warm-ups and then it's gone but uh, yeah, the 23 years went uh, in an instant. A lot of adrenaline, a lot of fun moments, a lot of lows, you know, a lot of long plane flights back home where you're feeling depressed and you're looking forward to get back on the court again. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, th those were great, great memories. Um, I actually didn't miss it when I retired. You know, I think it was nice to get out of that pressure and just kind of take a deep breath and relax. Um, and I think I'm finally at the point where I, I'm happy to be back and seeing a lot of those same faces. And your brother Mike is here yeah. as well. Obviously, you've been here, like Adam just said, so many years on the bounce. And Centre Court must have some special yeah. memories for you. We're actually going to transport you back to yesteryear, yeah. back to 2013, Bob. Can you remember this moment well? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, one of the best stretches of our career. We started at the Olympics in 12. And uh, when we won that gold medal, 
it gave us so much momentum and so much confidence that we we carry that you know for at least 12 months and um, you know that was our fourth Grand Slam title in a row which you know was hard to believe at the time and we were, we were going for the Grand Slam um, in the US Open we came up short but yeah that marked a, just a, an incredible stretch um, there's no, no greater feeling than winning on center court um, a lot of people say that, and you're lucky you have a home slam. There's a lot of tennis players who don't have a home slam. You've got that at the US Open. I'm sure it's special playing on Arthur Ashe, and yeah. you've lifted the title on that amazing stadium. But no matter where players are from, they, they say exactly what you've said about centre yeah. court being no, special. What is it about it? It's just the history. You know, you feel like you're going into like a haunted house. They call you from the locker room, and you're, you're walking down the carpeted tunnel. You're seeing all the trophies, the, the faces on the wall of the great champions, black and white photos. And you come down this grand staircase and suddenly out into this magnificent arena. It's very quiet out there. Um, the, the fans are very polite, but um, there's no other place in the world where I got goosebumps like that. For doubles players as well, you really have to earn the right to get yeah. on center court. It's a bit unlike, I mean, I'm not saying that Andy Murray or Emma Raducanu hasn't earned the right to be out there. Of course they have, but the singles players get there from day one. Yeah. You have to get through to, I mean, I don't know when was the earliest in a tournament you got to center court, but it's, it's certainly not until the, maybe the quarters or the semis. Yeah. You've got to earn the right to be on there. No, that's right. You've got to get through those early matches on court 14 or wherever it is where you're playing for, you know, 100 fans. And uh, you gotta just battle to get to a stage like that. You feel like you've really earned it. It's a reward. Um, sometimes they throw you on late in the day if, if someone pulls out a singles or if the matches go quick. And uh, yeah, you just feel blessed to get out there. And I think those are the, mo the moments you remember. And all, all four players are usually in a great mood um, just because they're on the, the gr grandest stage in tennis. And um, yeah, and then obviously if you can hoist the trophy on that court and go up into the royal box and shake the hands of the dignitaries. Um, that's when you really feel like you've made it. And this time out, obviously, it's a bit different for you being here. You mentioned you've gone over to Rangi and seen like some yeah. John Isner, Andy Murray. Do any of them kind of come up to you and ask for advice? Do you offer advice to any of the young uh, U.S. guys or girls yeah. coming up? Yeah, I mean, we've offered some advice to some of the U.S. players, some of the doubles players, Rajiv Rams, how having a great uh, time in his career. He's up to number two in the world. You got the, the British player, Joe Salisbury at number one. I think if Ram can hold on for another few months, he might go co-number one with Salisbury. Um, but yeah, these are players we've played against. Um, you know, you're never offering advice when you're on the tour. Obviously these are your rivals, but <laughs> we're all, I mean, I'm willing to share any knowledge I have with the Americans. I, I love helping out with the Davis Cup team. I might go to Glasgow uh, in a couple months to help out the US team. But yeah, I was on the court yesterday with a, a new American, Will Blumberg, who's playing doubles with Christian Rude. It's his first Wimbledon. Yeah, and just sharing some of the drills and some of the stuff that helped, um, you know, us win matches, the movement, the poaching. A lot of the players, uh, you know, are willing to, to pick our brain. And, you know, a lot of it's like just reflexes and how to hold the racket and how to be quick on the, you know, loosen the hand and a lot, a lot of stuff you can learn. You've got a lot of knowledge to impart, I'm sure, picked up over the course of your career. Bob, great stuff so far. We're looking Thanks. forward to continuing uh, chatting to you. But let's head down to Arangi. Bob mentioned it. The practice courts are here at uh, Wimbledon. We can catch up with Nick McCarver, who's there for us. 22 matches on the trot now for Novak Djokovic, three-time champion here, three-time reigning champion, six Wimbledons to Djokovic's credit, and he's on the practice court today getting his steps in with Yannick Sinner, the Italian player, just on the opposite side of the court of Djokovic. And for the top seed here, one of the favorites, of course, for the title once again is Novak. And always an interesting look to get up close at a Djokovic practice. You can hear the ball the way it comes off the strings the way he moves the ball around the court so well. There's Goran Ivanisevic. He's been part of the Djokovic team for the last couple of years. A four set win to start his 2022 campaign for Djokovic, taking out the Korean player and Kwon Soon Woo. Had a couple hiccups in that match, but had not played since his French Open loss to Rafael Nadal. 
good win on center. to open the proceedings for the 2022 championships. And that win, an 80th here at Wimbledon, he becomes the first player, male or female, to have 80 wins at all four slams. So interesting to watch the top players. They're very meticulous about everything that they do. You can see here Djokovic particular about his toss exactly where that ball is going. Those last couple of serves just up the tee. That one up the tee too to the center backhand. Next up he's got Thanasi Kokonakis, the Australian who got his first ever Wimbledon win just yesterday. There's Ivanisevic giving him some tips. Again up the tee. Very particular about what he wants Novak to do exactly with that toss for the T-serve. I was just actually speaking with Kokonakis about the opportunity to play Djokovic in the second round here. Of course, assuming that match will be on the number one court or center court. Another beautiful T-serve from Novak. Thanasi saying he looks forward to the opportunity. They've played just once before. That was seven years ago at the French Open. Sinner on the opposite side of the court. He had a four set win over another familiar Grand Slam winner in the men's draw. Stan Wawrinka, Sinner winning that match in four sets late on Monday. Djokovic was first on center court. But just a beautiful sunny day here in Orangi as the players go through their steps. Andy Murray just next door practicing with Kyle Edmund. Djokovic just making sure that he's getting all the right details right at the slams. You've got that day off between the matches versus on the ATP where they're going to play oftentimes back to back. So these days off are really important for the players, making sure they're taking care of every little detail in their practice time. And for Djokovic to be hitting with Yannick Sinner, that's a player that he'd certainly have the opportunity to work with and be a part of. So Novak Djokovic here at Orangi getting ready for a second round match against Thanasi Kokonakis going for 23 in a row and as we know going for a seventh Wimbledon title four in a row. Djokovic on the off day putting in the work we're gonna see him back on court on Wednesday. Now it's a big day on centre court and first up of course is Iga Świątek and oh, look who I found a couple of pure Polish supporters here supporting their girl Peter, Kasia, how are you both? We are very excited. well, very are you? excited. Yes. And so why would you be so excited today? Because it's, this is the, the most beautiful place to be and, uh, and, and just to support pool number one for the first time ever Polish player is just out of this world. So we are very privileged to be here today. Yes, we are. Yeah. And what does it mean to you to be able to be here? You obviously, you live in London, you've been here 20 years, but what does it mean to be here at Wimbledon supporting her, center court tickets, like, just describe it. It's, it's just overwhelming, to be yeah, honest. It it's a, I'm it's speechless, a, actually. I can't find words it's a, now. It's a, we feel so special that we yeah. can be here on that I'm day. And, 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 and you got and tickets on yes. day. How did you do uh, it? Uh, oh. uh, we, just click, uh, we just clicked in the application yesterday. yesterday. No way. Yes, yes. and yes. Oh we managed God. to get two. It's pure luck. It's just like it a miracle. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Wow. Have you been to Wimbledon before? Uh, we've been last year on the court one. Wow. Okay. So we have a little taste how good it is oh, and yeah. how special place it is to, to see and to enjoy and just to see these fighters on the court live yes. because I'm a tennis fan myself yeah. and to see it live is just, just out of this world. It's something it's, else, isn't it? Yes, the it energy, is. the feeling, exactly. the yeah. emotion. Okay, so obviously you've got Iga, exciting. And then you've got Rafa Nadal yeah. and Serena Williams. Know, oh, what is this for you? A day of tennis? Two legends. Oh. You know, the, 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 I can't you, believe both of them, what like a 40 Grand Slams plus? It's just, but to Rafa, come back this way after Australian Open and 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 and, and French. I know. Uh, and you, now Wimbledon. So it's a, it, 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 that's that's no that's a, that's a tennis god for me. Really? And, uh, Is he yeah. your ultimate? 
Yes, it is. Really, yes, Rafa. Yes. Such a, Rafa. And he's the best friend of Iga Świątek. So what can oh, I ask more for? Yes, yes. Oh. I don't know if best friend, okay. but Iga Świątek loves him. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't? Find me a person who doesn't. Okay, so really, this is an iconic day. I feel like you guys are lucky charms. You got yes. tickets yesterday. Yes. I we think are, they're all yeah. going to go all the way. Do you think you're going to see wins on of all course. the big names? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. No yeah. doubt for you? No. No? And do you think Egan We, we hope so, because after Hurkacz, our Polish player, got That's out okay. yesterday, unfortunately. Yeah. So we hope for a better day today. It's, it's going to uh, be a good day. It's going to be a good day. It's, uh, whatever good. happens, we just, we just want to yes. see some good quality tennis yes, and really enjoy good. a day. But what a day it is. It's just, and so tell me, we're going to eat here, going to drink here, going to pop in the shop? We, do, we will do absolutely everything, everything we can, yes. Big day out. Yes, absolutely. Oh, enjoy yes. it, you two. Thank I hope so it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's always great to see what's going on around the ground, but let's jump over to court three then. Nick Kyrgios and Paul Jubb in action in their first round matchup. I mean, we were just talking about it off camera actually, Paul Jubb yeah. going over to America to play yeah. in the States, just to get, I guess, a bit more experience over in Carolina. You know, did super well over there, and it's really kind of, I guess, transferring now over to, to his game. And he's, you know, out here against Kyrgios, a great player. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, the college is a, a great pathway for young players. If you're not killing it in the ITFs or winning slams, I recommend all, all players, young players, go to college. You're going to play a ton of matches. Uh, it's high pressure. You're, you want to win for your team. Uh, it's super fun. I, I went to Stanford for two years with Mike, and we consider it two of the most fun uh, years we've ever had in the game. You get and, to play uh, a lot of doubles as well, which is good and for the you, volleys. And you learn and, to win. Yeah. If you come out on the pro uh, circuit too early, you know, you're losing 30 matches a year, and that's a big hit to your confidence. You and a college career doesn't necessarily, particularly on the men's side, stop you from having success. John Isner is a great example. You can come out on tour a little bit later on. You're older, more mature, um, know the way of the world a bit, and then yeah. you, you can transfer that success and into the game. these college systems have amazing facilities. They have teams of, of doctors, physios, um, you get first-class training. Um, look, if you do it the right way, it's a way to improve. Paul Jubb played number one on his team. Um, he learned how to win. He won a ton of matches, got a, a, a lot of confidence, and I think he became a better player. And look here, he's won a set off Kyrgios, and he's in a good position here in the second set. He's hungry and eager. Um, Stevie Johnson played four years for USC, won four national titles. And, you know, in the States, we grew up idolizing these college players. I went to Stanford. I was 135 pounds. You know, I left there 175, stronger. It worked for him. Um, Nick Kyrgios, you see here, he's obviously um, lost a set to, to Paul Jubb in this one. You know, when the draw came out, or prior to the draw coming out, everyone was saying, there are those players you just want to avoid, the dangerous players that are floating unseeded in the draw. Murray was one, and another one in the men's draw was Nick Kyrgios. Because, you, well, you never know, quite know what you're going to get with Nick, but when he's on, he's so hard to beat on grass. I've watched a ton of his matches this year. There's been a lot of times where he's had it together mentally, and he's super dangerous. Uh, I commentated his match against Rublev in Miami, and he destroyed him. You know, he only lost a few games. And he looked great. Uh, and then the next match against center, he kind of imploded, got a game penalty. You can see him right here talking to people in the crowd, talking to his box. So if he can just control it upstairs, uh, he's a top five favorite in, in my book. You know, that, that serve with the, the low ball toss, the quick delivery, he spots it so well. He's going to have a ton of aces. And it, it serves the most important shot in tennis, and he, a lot of times he's just taking the racket out of his opponent's hands. But if you have, I guess, Nick Kyrgios on the other side of the net, and you are Paul Job, how do you approach a player like him who is so unpredictable? Yeah, you ask, uh, worry about your side of the court. Just con uh, control what you can control. Try to get as many balls in the court. Uh, just move your feet and compete as hard as you can. You know, play every point. I don't think Nick Kyrgios plays every point. You know, he's gonna he's gonna try some trick shots. He's gonna give you know one or two opportunities a set, 
and uh, you just hope you can capitalize on those on those times. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get, but certainly he's a crowd favorite. A lot of people love watching oh, man. Uh, Nick Kyrgios. Uh, We're still fairly early stages uh, of today, day two at the championships, coming up to two o'clock local time. But some players have already won their matches, got through uh, to the second round, and Nick has caught up with one of those. Well, the first hurdle can often be the toughest, but for Maria Sakkari from Greece, she is through to round two. How good did that feel today against Zoe Hives? You went in straight sets. Yeah, it feels great. You know, as you said, first rounds can be tricky. I'm very happy, you know, that I got it out of the way. I think I played great. I was very solid. And I'm very excited to be in the second round. Yeah, you know, you've, there's obviously that first hurdle can always be tough. Coming off of the French Open where there were expectations and you wanted to get back deep, how does it feel extra good to have a win like this at Wimbledon? Of course. I mean, uh, we're still long, you know, far away from what I want to achieve in this in this tournament. Yeah. Obviously, the clay didn't go as good as I wanted, but that happens, you know. Um, I keep saying that we're not robots, um, so you know we're gonna have dips. Um, during the season um, but I'm ready you know to just uh, play better play my tennis again and I'm very confident right now yeah you're a top eight seed Ange Jabor yesterday was talking about getting to number two in the world wanting to get to number one but how have you let yourself slowly settle into this idea of having just that one single digit next to your name yeah it's been tough you know especially after Indian Wells I struggled a little bit yeah. I think that a lot of players do but uh, speaking of myself I did um, it was something very, you know, um, that I wasn't, you know, ready for it, maybe, or used to it, let's say. But uh, right now, I'm just um, very excited to be one of the best players in the world. Um, and just, um, you know, embracing it and just loving the fact that I can be here, top eight seed, as you said. Just very excited, yeah. One thing I love about the Greek players, you, Stefanos, and beyond, there's always Greek fans courtside. How cool is it to have that support wherever you go in the world? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Greeks are everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, no matter where we go, like Cincinnati, any place you can name in the world, you will always find a Greek. And we're so passionate, like we're so, you know, we love our country so much. So it's for, for us, it's something very nice to have and see in the stands because it's, um, it bring it gives us a lot of power and a lot of excitement. Um, yeah, it's very nice to have them around. One thing you've been really passionate about on social media is sustainability and the environment. Why is that something that you've chosen to, to take on and speak out about? Um, obviously, you know, Greece is uh, is a place that has a lot of beaches, and um, you know, I see a lot of plastic since I was a very young um, girl. Uh, you know, I was with my parents on the beach, and I could see plastic, cigarettes, uh, trash, everything. So for me, it's, I would really love to see um, all, all the, the entire world, you know, being more careful with that. Yeah. But of course, my country, you know, the place where I grew up, the place where, you know, I spend my summertime, my vacation. I just want everything, you know, to be protected. And it's just a, a very nice feeling, you know, to just try and do the, our best um, to protect the environment. You mentioned Indian Wells. At Indian Wells, you had the chance to speak with Lindsey Vaughn, who is an Olympic gold medal skier. And what advice did you give? What was that interaction like? And how inspiring is it to have people like that still, you know, in your side of things, helping you kind of navigate your career? I mean, she's uh, she's amazing. Um, yeah, I had a chat like for five, ten minutes with her. She's a huge tennis fan, as we know. Um, she's a very inspiring, you know, woman because. She has been a very, very successful athlete with a lot of injuries and stuff. So she overcame that, and now she's, um, you know, very like. She speaks about women. She supports uh, female athletes. So for me, having you know, you know, she's not a friend of mine, but to get to know her and having her as a person that I can text every now and then, um, it's a very important thing. She's, um, she's a person that I admire a lot. And, you know, she's great for female athletes in, in general all over the world. All right, you finished early in the day. You were first on. You spent less than an hour and a half on court. What's up for the rest of the day? Uh, not much, I have to <laughs> say. I'm playing again tomorrow because um, I was supposed to play yesterday. So just, you know, go back to the house, rest. My brother and sister are here, so I'm going to spend some time with them. I don't get to see them quite a lot. So I'm just going to, you know, you know, rest with them and chill with them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Right.
right, we have stopped two amazing looking ladies in the crowd. Alison and Christy, look at you both. You look fantastic. First up, where are you from and Phoenix, why are you here? Phoenix, Arizona, and we are here to see some great tennis. So are you huge tennis fans or is it more that you just want to experience Wimbledon and all its glory? Well, if you look at this, this will tell you who I'm a fan of. 22 uh, championships, so I'm a big wow. Rafa fan. Oh, okay. so, yes, so. so you're here supporting Rafa. Obviously, you've come today. Amazing. Did you queue up or did you already have tickets? We queued up. <gasps> did you? And do you have center court tickets? Or? We have center court tickets. I spent two days and two nights getting the tickets all night. I got them at 3.44 in the morning. Wow! So it was wonderful. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Now, talk us through the outfits, because this is what stopped us in our tracks. Well, this is, uh, you know, the show-stopping moment. Our friend Christy here decided to look up a strawberry dress. I got the red sparkly shoes, and Christy made the hats for us. <laughs> but and even the jewelry. Uh, down, look. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yes. And the I socks. The champagne earrings. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we're all in. You're all in. Are all you in. only here for today or are you going to try and come back every time that Rafa hopefully progresses? Well, that would be nice. We are here for the week, so we're going to see as, the, as it goes. We were here yesterday, had a great day, and uh, we sat up on the hill. Even though we had center court, it was so fun. Really? Yes, yeah, so fun. So you didn't even sit on center court? We did. A bit. Part of it, right, yes. Yeah. But it was fun to watch Emma up there on the hill with the rest of the, with the Brits. It Absolutely. was super fun. Yeah. What do you make of this weather? It's freezing. It's, it's not bad. Really? It's not bad. Oh, it was 110 when we yeah. left. It was 110 degrees when we left home. So this is wonderful. Oh, this is refreshing and it joyful. Is. It is. Okay, so there's more of you running around though, aren't there? There is. You'll see lots of us running around. There's six of us total. So, all yes, decked out we'll have, in the gear. Yeah, it's it's going to be a mission. It's going to be a mission to stock us all out and get us all together because it's a real treat. Yeah. So, have you been to Wimbledon before? I have not. You haven't? No, I have not. Have I have not either. Okay, so what do you think? It's absolutely beautiful. It, it actually exceeds my expectations. Really? It really does. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous here. And I have to say, and Allison will agree, the people are so friendly. Oh I mean, beyond friendly. Well, the staff and all the people who help yeah. out. And, it, and anybody that you sit next to. Like yesterday, I sat next. I came by myself to the hill to start with, and immediately everybody around me, would you like some champagne? Yes. You know. So hospitable. Very much, very much so. And did you guys bring packed lunches and picnics, or are you just enjoying all the treats? we have on offer here well yesterday we didn't bring anything right. um, so we got to experience all of uh, what Wimbledon had to offer what did you go for did you have the hot dog oh that's so good did not have a hot dog what? we did have sandwiches we did have uh, strawberries and cream good. and of course champagne because yes. you can't come to Wimbledon and not yeah. experience the champagne and are you big shoppers you've been in the shop have you bought anything <laughs> do you like this this is awesome we oh look this, this is so this you it's so comfy this, this whole bag is full yeah. so that just to answer your question, yes. It's so cool. <laughs> but isn't the stuff chic? Like, you'd actually wear it. It's not just merch. Correct. It's great. It's very I'm not sure. Shops are wonderful. The people in the shops are so unbelievably helpful. Yeah. They'll find anything for you. Yeah. Although, I'm guessing in your heat, you don't need a jumper like this, to be honest. No, no but every <laughs> once in a while, yeah. every once in a while, we get to wear sweatshirts. So, we did, yeah, the, the shops were wonderful. And I actually came here saying, I'm not going to get anything. I have so much tennis stuff. <laughs> and then we walked away with a whole bag of stuff. So, oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Rafa, obviously, you're going to be sat in your seats for that. Who else do you want to go experience today or try and see? Kyrgios is on court? Yes, we're going to Kyrgios yes. right now. Okay, great. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, yes. Better not stop you. Well, we're also going to see Riley Opelka because we want to experience the bot. Everybody has to experience the bot and John Isner, of course. Okay. So we're excited to see that he won yesterday in advance. So we'll be uh, tracking some of the Americans because, you know, that's you what know, we need to do. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. All right. So, well, yeah. girls, ladies, have the best day. It's right. such, Thank such a so pleasure. Much. Thank, Thank you. Great chatting with you. you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank very, you. Very nice. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. I saw these two on their way in, and uh, fair to say they stand out. Yeah, they've got the uh, the high vis felt on there. I think. <laughs> He's talking about the rain, I think. Oh, that was a confident call by the umpire. We're not expecting much. Maybe slight drizzle coming down. Let's hope not. Ladies and gentlemen, play suspended. Well, look, it's a race. 
Uh oh, look, number three there in the top of the picture is falling behind. Oh, no, 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 no. Look at this. Look at that. Unbelievable. That look at this. He's so fleet of foot. <laughs> he ends up needing support there. Novak's trying to take him out there, for sure. Helps you with the sun and the rain, Sam. Excellent. Now we have a bird on the court, a wagtail. And actually, the way that it's... Anyway, it's decided that there's a better match somewhere else, so it's going to watch that. The size of that water bottle. Have to stay hydrated. <laughs> Well, it's the afternoon after the night before for Emma Raducanu out there on Orangi. Just, I guess, finding her feet after her heroics of yesterday. First time on centre court. She obviously wanted to go out there and get the win, and she did just that. She had a great time out there. You could see that. She really took it all in her stride, and we didn't really know which Emma Raducanu we would see. She's had that injury, but it didn't seem to phase her, and she came out on top pretty easily in the end. We're just going to show you some beautiful Those pictures wire then. Those shots are amazing, aren't it's they? It's amazing. Absolutely Everyone fun. usually waves at this point, so Adam, uh, yeah. maybe no one has quite noticed that we're spinning around the grounds at the moment. They're but absolutely what brilliant. Well, we were saying yesterday, it's pretty, it must be tricky to drive that thing. They wouldn't <laughs> let me anywhere near it. Um, Bob Ryan, doubles superstar, is still with us. Let's chat a little bit about doubles. We'll chat about the state of American tennis as well in, in, in a few moments' time. But... Um, Obviously, the, the game of doubles has moved. I mean, you and, and Mike were a great reason for that and the success you had. And I know during your career, you were really passionate about the game, trying to make people yeah. focus a bit more on, on doubles than they, than they were doing on singles when prior to, I think, that era, the focus a lot was on, on singles. How do you feel about the game that you left a couple of years ago? Do you feel it was in a better place than when you started? I think it's in a great place. You know, 2005 was almost the end of the double specialist. Uh, the ATP had put a rule in that if you weren't in the singles draw, you weren't playing doubles either. They wanted to save on hotel rooms, whatever, meal tickets. So we actually, as doubles players, we filed a lawsuit and we were able to overturn that rule from the ATP. We had, we had to raise money for the lawsuit. We did exhibitions all over the US. And, um, you know, and then they changed the rules. So now singles players with their singles ranking can now enter doubles tournaments. So you have a mix of double specialists, single superstars. Um, you have guys staying on the baseline, ripping ground strokes. Whereas 20 years ago, it was exclusively serve and volley. So we've seen a, a, a real transition. Um, guys are playing a lot of I formation now, which they didn't in the 80s. It was standard doubles, you know, sometimes a little bit of poaching. The Woodies came in, started really moving. They didn't have the big serves. I think uh, Todd won this thing nine times just with precision volleys and picking apart uh, opponents strategically. Um, and now you have this I formation where a guy's on top of the net. Uh, I thought Mike and I were one of the first guys to really close down um, the net, you know, take away. It opens up the angles the closer you get. Um, you know, you give them the lob. If they're burning you on the lob, then you back off a little bit. But until you get burned, you play aggressive. And you see this uh, Metkic and Pavic, who won the tournament last year. They're on a roll. I think they've won four out of the last five tournaments. They're going to be tough to beat. They play the eye to perfection. And then uh, Salisbury and, and Ram have huge serves. They're going to be really dangerous. They might be the favorites uh, for this tournament. They play the eye well. And then another, another Brit, um, Skupski, who's had a, a breakthrough year. I think he's won five titles already. He plays with Kuhlhoff. And uh, they're, they're number one in the race so far this year. Um, so it's anyone's ball game. The thing though is interesting, and, and Rachel, I'm sure you've seen this when you've been speaking to people around the grounds, doubles, when you speak to a lot of spectators and also people who don't play that much tennis, doubles is what they play. Yeah. That was the thing that, that strikes me as amazing is that, it, as you said there, that if that lawsuit hadn't gone your way, that, that yeah. would have been the end of doubles in, on a professional level as we know it. But a lot of people, when they pick up the game, if they play casually at their club, they're not playing singles, they're playing doubles. Yeah. Uh, it's more it's entertaining, a, isn't it? as well. I yeah, think. I mean, it's a social game at the record yeah. level. You know, you have four players on the court, you have mixed doubles, 95% uh, of 
uh, players play doubles, and so they, they really want to see it. You know, um, there's a lot of requests coming into the tennis channel in the states to see more doubles matches. But look, you know, if you're a casual sports fan, you want to see Serena Williams, you want to see Andy Murray, you're looking to see the household name. But I mean, the grounds passes are very valuable in this first week, especially when the matches are are packed. You're going to see a lot of uh, singles guys in the doubles. Um, you know, it's three out of five sets. You're, the matches are going to be really tight. You know, very fine margins in doubles. Very little uh, blowouts on the doubles side. So you got some exciting encounters. I mean, you'll also want to be seeing this woman here, yeah. Coco Goff. I mean, she's a star. In the making, she's already a star, but you know, she's got a very bright future. At the final in Roland Garris, she's not only playing singles, she'll be playing the doubles as well. I mean, she's just confidence is high on a roll at the moment. And do you love that she kind of goes between the two as well? Yeah, you've seen her really improve um, her doubles in the last couple of years. And it's given her those uh, moments on, on the biggest courts. You know, she's gotten more experience playing on the center court, Arthur Ashe. She's obviously a, a mega star, and uh, people know her for her singles, but she's made two Grand Slam finals in doubles. And you see how much it means to her. Um, she's lost a couple tight ones, and she's actually been teary-eyed after the match. So she puts a, a lot of focus into her doubles results. And a lot of times she'll play with her friend, uh, Katie McNally. They grew up playing together. They'll throw in the chest bump or the, like you the back butt <laughs> bump or whatever. Um, but she has a lot, of, a lot of fun. And you see that with the singles players. It's a way for them to practice. They don't have to grind on their off days. They can get out there on the doubles court, hit a lot of serves, hit a lot of returns, which are the pivotal shots um, in this game. We, we also see, I was going to say, Adam, some special partnerships being made as well. Some unique ones that we don't always see, like in East Form, which is the big one, which was Serena yeah. Serena yeah. Williams and Ange Javert there. Like, how did that come apart? They just pick up the phone sometimes and go, this person's been playing well on the tour, I want to play doubles with them, which I think the fans love to see. Yeah, very yeah. valuable to, um, to Serena to get those matches on grass. Um, she probably didn't want the stress of going out there so early in the singles, um, on the singles court. So she, she gave it a run in the doubles and she got to, hit a bunch of shots. I'm sure she got to practice with a, a great singles player as, to get herself up to speed for this tournament. But, you know, look, for the fans, it doesn't matter where Serena is, whether she's walking on the street or brushing her teeth, you want to see Serena Williams. And uh, so they got an extra treat to see her in Eastbourne. Yeah, it's great to have her back here at Wimbledon. Uh, focusing on uh, Coco, a lot of people saying that she will be one of those next players to, to lift a Grand Slam title. Do you see a Grand Slam in, in the near horizon for her? I definitely see it. Um, she's so hungry. She's improving her game. I thought her forehand looked great at Roland Garros. I actually picked her to win the title. You know, I really liked what she was doing with the ball. Uh, Swiatek just had a little bit too much. The, the pace that Swiatek was hitting with in the final, I think, caught her a little bit off guard. But she's a, 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 a huge talent. She's so young, still a teenager, so many years ahead of her. And, She's only getting better. I think she's up to almost top 10 in the world already, which is how, amazing. How comfortable do you think she is here now? It's been three years since she yeah. burst onto the scene here, defeated Venus Williams. Yeah. Um, and that was such a moment and really kind of put her on, I guess, a pedestal here and put pressure on her. But, you know, we said she's on court two. Yeah. She's not really got that pressure this time out. That, the pressure is on Emma Raducanu. Everyone's got eyes on her. You know, how do you think she'll she'll deal with just playing here under the radar, possibly through the first couple of rounds? I think it feels good for any uh, pro athlete to play a little bit under the radar, not to have their names as the headlines of every paper. You know, when she comes to the States or plays at the U.S. Open, she'll be feeling that, what, what Emma Raducanu is feeling here at Wimbledon. So hopefully she can just take care of business, um, really get her grass court feet under her in, the, in these first couple of rounds and get a, get a roll going. I think that's what a lot of big players want to do is just play themselves in the tournament. You know, you can't win it on day two, but uh, you, can, you can lose it. Thinking back to your career, how difficult is it being the player that everyone else in the locker room wants to be? I'm sure when you and Mike started, no one knew who you were. But then when you had success with winning Grand Slam titles, you're the guy every single doubles pair wants to be. And it's starting to be like that for Coco Goff. A few years ago, no one knew who she was. Three years later now, she's one of those players everyone wants to be. How do you deal with that pressure? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, it's nice to, to play that underdog role and kind of catch these big stars by surprise early in her career. But 
once you start winning matches, you know, everyone has the book on you. Everyone's seen you play. They know your strengths and weaknesses. And then you start to feel the weight of expectation. Um, we had a sophomore slump in our career. You know, after finishing number one, it was tough to, to deal with being the hunted. And we really had to um, struggle to, to catch up and improve because the game moves. Um, everyone's getting better. And Coco's going to have to improve her game to lift the Grand Slam trophy. But she's, uh, I think, got over that little sophomore slump. You could tell she was dealing with the nerves a little bit um, a couple years ago. Here comes uh, Serena. But uh, she's, she has a ton of experience, this, this one. Well, I thought that was a nice segue to what you just said there. The game moves on. Yeah. Is Serena still in it? Does she still well, have she what it takes? She said she's not retired, didn't she? She was yeah. quick to say she was quick to say I'm that. not retired. But, I mean, you know, she's, she's back here. She hasn't played here since round one yeah. last year when she got the hamstring injury. She's only, we, we just mentioned it, played two matches of, of doubles. But she's not going to be here just to take part, is she? I think most players you would write off if they haven't played tennis, a competitive match, in a year. And especially she's 40 years old. Most players you'd write on, but not Serena Williams. She's a champion. I don't think she would be here if she didn't think she could do some serious damage in this tournament. Um, you know, the question is, when did she make up her mind that she was going to play at Wimbledon? Was it two months ago? Was it three months ago? I don't know how hard she's been working, but she's got the greatest women's serve of all time. And it seems like that's a consistent weapon in all of her matches. So she's going to get the aces. And I, I still think she has the fear factor in the locker room. No one wants to go up against her at Wimbledon. And I think grass courts are where she's most dangerous. She's your countrywoman, so she, you know her well. And she and her and your careers align, really, for, for much of your career. You had a front row seat to, to what Serena was doing, particularly at these big Grand Slam events that have men's and ladies uh, events. Give us an insight. What, what's Serena like? Is she what we see in front of the cameras and on the practice courts? There's a she, lighter side to her. She's so um, bubbly and giggly, and, and she's got an amazing personality. I've heard that. She's a real joker, isn't she? She's such a joker. Um, she's just like a little girl, you know, ha having fun. Obviously, you see her on the practice court or on the match court. She's in, um, you know, warrior game mode. But I played mixed. I had the pleasure of playing mixed doubles with her at a French Open. I let her down. We lost first round. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I have the title of being one of the older, only guys on tour to lose with Serena Williams in a first round of a slam. But I, I had a, a great time just laughing. We were never talking about tennis on the courts. And um, she's cool. She's helped us out. My brother and I have a foundation event in Florida that we do every year. She was just right after she had her baby. She was nice enough to join us and help us raise money for our foundation by playing tennis. Um, so... You know, nothing but love for Serena and, and everything she's, nothing but respect for everything she's accomplished. I think she would say the same about you and your brother as well. I think when you retired, she was the first person to say, the tour's not going to be the same without you two being a part of it because, you know, you really kind of started your careers at the same time. Yeah, that's right. We all grew up in Southern California. And I remember seeing, I mean, I saw that, I was the first one to go see that movie. Uh, Loved King it. Richard, Watched it was it awesome. <laughs> Because I, I lived it, you know, and there's so, there so much hype around Venus. You know, she, they, they won so much in uh, Southern California. She was undefeated as a junior Venus. And then they went to Macy's Academy out in Florida. The dad created an incredible hype. Everyone knew who the Williams sisters were, especially Venus. And then, I don't know, it was, it was such a, an event when she played her first pro match. And then when she won, it, won that match, it was pandemonium. And then the dad said, you know, I got another, another daughter who's actually better than Venus. And we were all blown away. And then here she is with 23 Grand Slams. And they've had just, their careers have gone so long. And it's just awesome to be a part of that generation, um, to witness it firsthand. Yeah, what, a, what a story it is. And it isn't finished for Serena yet. Wonder how she's going to get on here at the championships. Bob, I'd love to say... Um, you dressed up in your suit yeah, to come right. and speak yeah. to Rachel and us, but we've got to let you go. But what have you got up to for the rest of the day? Um, I might go play some tennis. Oh, I got to uh, wipe like off the rust. Not dressed like that. Yeah, my brother's waiting for me at a practice court. We might hit some balls because we got to play next Tuesday. And the Invitational, there's there's uh, Nestor, who's our old rival, and there's uh, guys that aren't very, they're not slouches, so we got to get ready. Okay, well, good luck in your matches. Thanks, and thank you. We'll hopefully get to speak to you a bit more over the, the next uh, fortnight. Let's catch up again with Nick McCarvel.
Welcome to day two of Wimbledon. We are at the HSBC Fan Zone. It is a people's press conference. And guess what, guys? We've got a player here who just won his first match at Wimbledon. Give a warm Wimbledon welcome to Thanasi Kokonakis, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. First off, that, oh, come on, guys. Let's give him a little more energy. There we go. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I was actually telling Thanasi just then, Getting that Wimbledon win yesterday, your first ever, congratulations on that. But you had quite the atmosphere on court, uh, a few Aussie fans out there too. Yeah, I love it. It almost felt like I was playing at home. Um, had a few few drunken Aussies, which I, uh, <laughs> I never mind uh, that atmosphere. And yeah, when I came out and walked on court, the support was unbelievable. And yeah, to get it done for my first Wimbledon win is, uh, is pretty special. So yeah, couldn't be happier and can't wait for the challenge ahead. Yeah, the challenge ahead is Novak Djokovic in the next round. Uh, I was listening to some coverage back in Australia. They were saying you were maybe even thinking about that match during your first round match. How excited are you to get that opportunity? We would think on center court, but number one court uh, to play against the three-time reigning champion here. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, one of the coolest courts I'll, I'll ever get the chance to play on. I uh, haven't played on that centre court yet against such a great player. Um, it's obviously one of the toughest challenges in sport, let alone tennis. But yeah, I, I think I'm prepared. I, I feel great. Um, as I said, super confident after getting my first first win. I was a little bit doubtful coming into the tournament if I would even play or not. But uh, yeah, really happy to, to get that chance. And yeah, can't wait to soak up the atmosphere. The atmosphere here, I think we can all feel it. There's nothing like Wimbledon. And for you, you played here for the first time seven years ago. You've played qualifying. You've missed uh, the last five years. You haven't been in the main draw. So talk us through some of the emotions that you felt in getting in that, getting first, that win. first win. Yeah, it was a massive relief. Um, missed a lot of years uh, through various reasons. And yeah, to be back on the on the big stage after the year I've had, I've had a, feels like a bit of a resurgent year. So um, yeah, really happy. and. Yeah, to, to get my first Grand Slam win at Wimbledon, it's, it's been a tough road and uh, yeah, I'm happy I had a lot of Aussies there and my team there supporting me. So yeah, can't wait and hopefully enjoy the next moment with them. Yeah, okay, so how's the body feeling? Because you weren't sure exactly if you were going to actually play this tournament. You've spent a lot of time in London the last few weeks, yeah. but how, I think it was a knee injury yeah. coming in, right? Yeah, I slipped on a wet grass court about a month ago and I haven't played since. So, um, <laughs> as I said, yeah, pretty doubtful coming in. I'm a little sore today, but um, I'll get some treatment, maybe get in the ice, and uh, my trainer will want to hear that anyway. Um, but, yeah, I feel all right, and I'll be ready to go and, and give it everything I've got tomorrow. Okay, so you've played Novak Djokovic before, 2015, way back when, at the French Open. So much different yeah. Wimbledon, grass, Novak today, and you today as well. Yeah. How do you approach that situation, be it on center court or number one court? Yeah, I don't really remember that much of it. I just remember I felt like I was playing a bit of a human wall uh, when I played <laughs> against him. It was, uh, it was tough. It was in the third round of French Open. I was only 19 then, so uh, I've learned a lot since then. Um, haven't played as many matches as I did back then coming into it, but yeah, I'm going to play my game, be aggressive, and I've caused upsets before, so who knows? All right, so it is our second day of the People's Press Conference here at the HSBC Fan Zone. Thanasi Kokonakis is with us. And good sir, you've got a question. First off, what's your name and where you're from? Hello, Thanasi. I'm Seb here. Hi, well done for your win on Monday. Thank you. How are you feeling about playing Djokovic tomorrow? Then? Thank you. Um, yeah, can't wait, mate. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a great challenge, obviously. I think he's won the last three years. Yes, he has. Yeah, so I'm not favourite, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I can't wait. It's my first time playing on that centre court. Hopefully we get that court. Um, hopefully the atmosphere is unreal. And uh, yeah, I can just soap it up, soak it up and enjoy it. Should be fun. Good luck. Thank you, man. I think it's so cool. We've got a great crowd gathered here, a lot of youngsters. I think these guys have a couple questions too, Thanasi. But you're at this level where you've been on the Pro Tour now for a few years. And to see the Nadal, Djokovic, Vavrinka, Murray, obviously you put Federer in there, he's not with us this year. But how do you explain the level that they're at that I know that you're working every day to try to get at too? Yeah, it's incredible. I don't think uh, people quite realize, some people do, but I don't think people quite realize how hard it is to win a tournament, let alone a Grand Slam. And then someone like Nadal who won, I don't know how many French Opens now, is it 13? 14. 14, yeah. It's, <laughs> It's, it's stupid. Don't tell them it, short. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it, it's something you can't really even comprehend. And, and for all those, a lot of those guys to win 20 Grand Slams, it's, it's so tough to do to back up and have that consistency. So, yeah, we're looking at some of the all-time greats there ever will be. And, uh, yeah, it, sh it should be fun sharing the court with them. 
All right, another question. Tell us your name and where you're from. Hey, Tanasi, I'm Joseph from Australia, mate. So really big there fan. It's awesome to see you doing so well here. Um, just question about the doubles, mate. It was awesome to see you in the Australian Open have so much fun. Looked yeah. like you guys were really enjoying it out there. A, you pumped for it again, and B, how's the preparation going? And what have you guys been doing? Yeah, um, we were kind of hesitant. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, we were kind of hesitant playing uh, doubles here. Wimbledon's best of five, so it's tough. And our singles is always our priority. Um, Australia worked out perfectly. Uh, we kind of lost early uh, in the main draw of singles. And we kind of thought to just have fun with it. We weren't expecting anything um, with each other. We were just expecting to have fun. And we kind of just rode the wave of momentum. and and lapped it up and we're going to play here uh, again as I said singles is our priority and best of five sets is tough but anytime we can share the court together is, uh, is going to be a great great opportunity and yeah we're, we're just going to have fun with it and see how we go as I said we're not we're not expecting to win it or anything like that but uh, yeah who knows who knows Good man. yeah Thank you. that's awesome thanks for that question Good I mean Thanasi with Nick Kyrgios winning that Australian Open championship it was so unexpected but it ended up being one of the delights of the tournament and you and Nick wavering a little bit coming in here because it is best of five yeah. in the doubles isn't it yeah definitely it's uh it's tough I mean if you're just playing doubles I think best of five is fine um but if you're playing a lot of events it's yeah. it, it stacks up especially on your day off if you have a tough singles match where you need to rest and recover and prepare for the next singles match you don't want to be playing best of five set doubles that's for sure but who knows, uh, hopefully our bodies uh, pull up all right um, and, and we can have fun with it because I know if the atmosphere is re yeah. anything remotely close to what it was like in Australia, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a wild court out there. I, I think it might be a party like Wimbledon has never seen, Special K doubles <laughs> out uh, on court. Okay, first off, name, where are you from? Future Thanasi Kokonakis maybe. <laughs> uh, go ahead and ask Thanasi your question. Right, um, my name is Colin and I have a question. What age did you start playing tennis? Ooh, what age? Good question. Hey mate, um, I started at seven years old. Um, I played tennis and basketball a lot till I was about 12. Uh, and then I decided to just stick with tennis because I'm selfish. Oh, I like that. All right, we've got another one here. Who's got another one? All right, name, and where are you guys from? Moreland, where's that? Uh, Ipswich. Ipswich, okay. My name is Fabian, I've got a question. When did you start playing tennis? Just ask that. You got another one? No. Think on your feet. Come on, what do you got? Maybe. F what year did you start playing tennis? What year? Oh. oh. <laughs> He's doing my maths. <laughs> What got you, I like these, so these guys are obviously tennis players themselves. What got you into tennis when you started playing at a young age? Yeah, well, as I said, I started playing basketball. Basketball was my first sport, and then my brother had a tennis lesson. Um, he was losing in school sport playing tennis, so my dad's like, nah, we've got to get him lessons. Uh, and then while he was having a drink break, I picked up a racket and started hitting balls, and uh, yeah, I just fell in love with it. I was better than I expected, so I just kept playing from then, and I love the sort of one-on-one -on -one competitive aspect. There's no one really helping you and you kind of got to figure it out yourself. So um, that's kind of what drew me to that. Awesome. Are, are we tennis players? Raise your hand if you're a tennis player. Very good. What about any of the adults in the crowd? Are you a tennis player? Yes? All right, we've got another question here. What's your name and where are you from? Hi, I'm Maisie and I'm from Ipswich. There we go. And how long did it take you to be a professional? Ooh, great question. I don't know in hours, but it was a lot of them. I started when I was seven, uh, hitting my first ball, and I, I guess I got my first professional ranking point at 14, so that's very young, but kind of when I started tennis, I went almost all in with it uh, straight away. I was doing too many hours, I think, uh, but it, was, it led me to where I am today, so it probably took me sort of seven years to get my first professional ranking point. Wow. Uh, and something that maybe a lot of folks don't know about Thanasi is you've been through it all. There's been a, a back injury, there's been the knees, there's been mono, there's been several other viruses. I mean, you've had to face a lot of adversity. What's kept you going? What's kept you motivated in your career? Yeah, it's been really tough, to be honest. There's yeah. a lot of times where I legitimately thought about stopping every time I'd come back and I didn't quite feel like I was playing up to my level, right. up to my standard. Uh, I was kind of losing hope a lot of the time, but I had great, great friends and family around me that kept me um, sort of happy and, and supportive and just remembering on the good wins I had, the good times I had and thought to myself, when I'm healthy and, and feeling good, this is what I can do. Um, and just tried to rely on those moments and thought I can't do this forever, so I might as well play with no regrets. Yeah, so cool to yeah. still have you out here. Get your first Wimbledon win. Thank Djokovic you. next round, which is awesome. I see a Rafael Nadal hat here. Tell us your name and where I'm you're from, from. I'm from Nottingham. And what is your toughest match that you've ever had? Ooh, toughest match Toughest ever. match. Tough question. Well, the biggest beatdown I've gotten was probably from Andy Murray and Davis Cup. I played him <laughs> in Glasgow. 
Uh, that, that atmosphere was like nothing I felt before. It felt like I was playing against a whole country in a small tin shed. It was, it was crazy. They were cheering when I'd hit a let. So um, that, was, that was something different. Uh, one of the toughest matches I had. What about, tell them what, about one of your tough wins over a guy named uh, Roger Federer, maybe? Yeah. yeah, I'll take that one. That's, prob that's definitely my best win, not probably. Uh, he was number one in the world. Uh, defending champion in Miami Masters. I uh, played him second round, I think. Yeah. Second round and uh, yeah, beat him 7-6 in the third. Um, one of the all-time greats, a guy that obviously I looked up to and had trained a little bit with in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what a moment that was against a really good guy. He always finds time to to kind of chat with me and, and send me a message after a good result like that. So um, that's, that's a memory I'll never forget for sure. That's my best win. Yeah, awesome. Well, I didn't want to just stop with the B-Town. We've also <laughs> got to throw you a bone with the wind too. We're here at a People's Press Conference, HSBC Fan Zone. We've got young fans. We've got middle-aged fans. <laughs> Everyone is a fan of tennis and Thanasi Kokonakis. Thanks for being with us. Tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, um, I'm Ahmed. I'm from Bahrain. That's in the Middle East. Cool, um, yeah. Um, hi Tanasi. Hi Mike. Um You obviously had a great start in Australia this year, winning the uh, doubles with Nick, and great first round here as well. I just wanted to ask, like, what are your hopes in the end of the year in terms of ranking, and where do you hope to break into this year? Right. Yeah, good question. Um, thank you. It was yeah, Australia was a was a surreal experience for me. Um, you never know how you're going to come into a year, and I win my first title in Adelaide in my hometown. Uh, was was probably the I know the doubles probably looks the best on paper because it's a grand slam but winning my first title in my hometown somewhere I grew up was was my biggest achievement I think so far um, on a court that I've played at since I was seven eight nine years old uh, my goal every year for me especially is to stay healthy um, then I give myself yeah. a chance sounds like a stupid goal but trust nope. me it's important for me um, so and then beat my career high ranking, which was 69. I did that just when I turned sort of 19. And then uh, I got injured for a while and had surgery. So um, I think after Wimbledon, my ranking will go to 73. So I'm getting real close. There we go. Um, and then I want to break into the top, top 50 after that and just keep pushing. And yeah, hopefully win another title. We'll see how we go. But um, yeah, just trying to stay healthy and enjoy my tennis. And I think the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, how massive was that title in Adelaide? Thanasi wins his first ever career title, and you can play anywhere in the globe, and you play do it home fans, fans in Adelaide. Adelaide. That's amazing. Yeah, I know, especially after not really playing too many pro events the year before, to win in Adelaide um, in front of my friends and family. It's obviously been a tough couple of years for everyone involved, and to do it at home, um, so many memories on that court, and then to win, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem real. All right, we've got one more question, and then we're going to do and some, we're quick, do some fire quick fire with Thanasi. Your name and where you're from, and you Hi. can ask your question. Um, my name's Annika. I'm from the UK. Um, what's your favorite place to play? Ooh, good question. Well, apart from Australia. Yeah, I know. That's, I was going to say Melbourne, just because the atmosphere is yeah. unmatched. I do love, I do love Wimbledon. I, you kind of forget how special it is, um, even before you actually step on the court and play. It's uh, it's pretty nuts. I always, uh, I always do well in Miami usually, so mm. Miami's fun. Um, kind of the cities where I find it fun off the court, I tend to kind of play better on the court. So Miami's one of them, and <laughs> another sort of underrated place to play that's really fun is uh, Acapulco. Yeah. On the beach, it's uh, you go body surfing during the day, and they start matches at like 7, 8 p.m and they have parties going on till like 3 a.m. So it's a, it's a good place. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like fun. And that, you made the final in Acapulco a few years ago? Cabo. Cabo. Cabo okay. one of them too. Yeah, that's a pretty yes. good place too. All right, we're going to go quick fire with Thanasi and let's start off with TV show that you're into recently. I'm in England, so I've started to watch Love Island here and there, unfortunately. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I love Californication. Yeah. Californication is one of my favorites. And... Uh, what else did I watch? I, uh, I started watching Ozark as well, so I'm oh, going to nice. get back into that. Yeah, that's deep, Ozark. Yeah, right. um, a change there between yeah. us. <laughs> Favorite thing to do, you spent a lot of time in London. Favorite thing to do in London? Uh, I've been going out a little bit at times, not going to yeah. lie. I've, had, I've got a few mates that live here now um, that are from Australia. So, yeah, I've been catching up with them. and uh, There's just so many good spots in London. I was around Chelsea area. It's a good vibe, especially when the weather's good in London. You can't really beat it. Uh, coolest thing you've gotten to do off the court this year? You've done a lot of cool things away from the tennis. It's interesting. Actually, I got uh, in Delray Beach. I uh, 
I went 260, uh, 270 kilometers in a BMW on a racetrack. Wow. Yeah, so that, that kind of got me going. You a were driving. Bit. I was driving, yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't know why. I felt dizzy after. I felt like I was going to throw up. So I was on a track and a competition M4, so that was pretty nuts. Okay, other than your phone, what's a like must-have travel item with you? Wherever you go in the world, you have to have... iPad. iPad. Good boy. Yeah. Yeah, just basic stuff. I'm, I'm a pretty basic traveler. I try and travel light. Okay, and I know that in another life, Thanasi would like to be an NBA star, but right. who's the best basketball player on tour? Best basketball, I'd have to give it to Nick. He Is plays, he? yeah, I think so. He plays the most out of everyone I've seen. He almost does that more than tennis, so, and he takes it more seriously than I've ever seen either. So when he's <laughs> he in does. Sydney and I'm back, he's, uh, he's playing every day for hours, so he, he loves it. Yeah. Well, look, we wish you nothing but the best. You got your first Wimbledon win. Congratulations. Novak Djokovic next. How about a round of applause for Thanasi Kokonakis? Thank you, guys. This has Appreciate been it. another Thank People's you. press conference at the HSBC Fan Zone. We're going to see this guy next against the three-time defending champ. And Thanasi, thanks again. Thank you, man. Thanks. Thanks, guys. So I'm at the most amazing entrance to any clubhouse you will ever see. Here we are outside Centre Court and this is where all the members of the All England Club come when they want a spot of lunch at Wimbledon. Now what a day we have on Centre Court. We have Iga Sviontek, we've got Rafa Nadal and then Serena Williams to top up a box office day on Centre Court. Look at the horticulture, look at the plants, it is all magnificently pruned, preened and primed for this beautiful two weeks here. A, a classic sight is always the regalia that's out on all the kind of military support staff. Look how they guard that entrance, no one's getting in there, only a member of the All England Club. What else we got on? Let's come. I want to show you some, um, some of the amazing statues we have outside, some former winners from this amazing tournament. Excuse me lads, excuse me fellas, we're just going on a nice walking tour. Look at that, can you see inside? <gasps> Doesn't it look beautiful, those shiny stairs? You can imagine someone polishing those door handles before entering that very, very famous club. I wonder what it's like being a member of the All England Club, and I wonder what it feels like during the Wimbledon Championships to be in there. Apologies, everyone. Okay, look who we have here. We have Angela Mortimer, who famously won this amazing tournament in 1961. Virginia Wade, of course, 1977, resplendent in her statue, immortalized here forevermore. I mean, to be a winner here at Wimbledon just really is an impressive feat. And to have your head atop a plinth outside the members clubhouse of the All England Club on centre court, oh, one day please God by me. You're watching live on Wimbledon Uncovered here, and what a glorious day here. A look at the hill overlooking Court 18, and I have to say it is a sunny tennis Tuesday. Day two, a delightful day here at the championships. Truly the sun is out, lots of tennis to be played, some 80 matches. How about that look of number one court and the center court? So much tennis to be played, 80 matches across. We had that rain yesterday that came through, setting us back a couple of hours. So more and more tennis to be played. Actually, a lot of it happening here behind us on the Southern campus. Nick McCarville alongside Ann Piathavong. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite locations. We've got Court 12, just there, Paula Bedosa. Coco yes. Goth is in action, yes. number two court. And then we've got this beautiful bank of eight to 12 and four to seven, it's amazing. Yeah, and when the sun's out, it is just absolutely stunning. You can see so many fans in between the courts. And this is what makes Wimbledon so special. Very different to a lot of the other slams where the fans get right up close, but they're very respectful of the players who are competing. So as soon as they start walking past the court, there's a hush and they allow the players to get on with it. But yes, Coco Goff out on court two, just in the third set, starting the third set against uh, Gabriela Rus of Romania. Tough yeah, a little start. bit of surprise yeah. there because Coco Goff coming off of that run to the French Open final also looked good in Berlin, making a run to the semifinals. A yeah. little bit of a surprise, the fact that she did drop that first set. Yeah, very, very surprised. But she's worked her way back into the match, fighting and scrapping away. So, um, yeah, for Coco Goff fans, hopefully she comes through. Yeah, certainly. And Paula Bedosa also... Uh, she's had some struggles recently, 
but certainly uh, right now going to the good is Bado. So we're gonna take a look in now live. This is the number one court and we've got that. How about this? Uh, Hugo Delian feeling pretty good against Alex de Menor there. I love in the first week of a major, you've got all of these big stars. Alex de Menor is punching his way to the top of the game, but Hugo Delian feeling pretty good at jumping. Yeah, out of well, the it's chair. taken him two <laughs> sets to get into this match. Uh, de Menor won the first two sets pretty comfortably, but uh, his opponent uh, looks like he's fired up uh, and ready to take this. Further, uh, I mean, have you seen anyone smile so much out loud? <laughs> He's on the number one court, and let's go ahead and dip into the commentary. This is Alex Dimonor serving against Hugo Delian. Oh. That's it. Forcing it now, isn't he? <laughs> Untimely. Dimino not playing well. Could seize the moment here. Yeah, Dillian's actually made a couple of cheap errors himself here. He could be. That was an official body serve. Don't see, don't see too many of those, do you? No. We basically have one of the best views in all of Wimbledon. We're at the top of Hemmen Hill here, and this is absolutely stunning. And Livia, the sun is out. Oh. This makes Wimbledon so beautiful. This is an iconic scene. This is the type of thing you see on your television when you're at home. And if you've never been to Wimbledon, let me tell you what it feels like. There's a vibe. 
Yes. Can you feel it? Undeniable. There's a high vibe here. Everyone is happy. People are eating, people are drinking, they are relaxing. Now it's really hard to get tickets for Centre Court, number one court. But if you're here, you are part of the action and it's it's brilliant. For me, the best ticket is actually the ground pass. Now, I've got to also point out, up here, there's a bit of a wind. You can tell how much of a wind there is because Olivia's hair blows <laughs> and my hair blows. And when an afro begins to blow, that's a sign that it's the windy. wind is picking up. It's a little bit windy. Should we talk about what we can see from here? Absolutely. We're going to challenge Jeff the camera right here. There's going to be a lot going on. You're going to see a lot of potential contra zooms. We're going to make him earn his money today. Now, over there in that direction isn't the media balcony, but it's the media tribune, I think it was called. What's it called? Olivia. I think it's called the Broadcast Centre. That's what I was going to It was on the tip of my tongue. That, <laughs> that's where we often do our broadcast from, the likes of the BBC, NBC, ESPN are there. All the internationals are mm -hmm. there. Sky Italia, you know, all the different outlets from Japan through to the USA, Netflix, they all bank up there. What else can you see? We've also got some of the locked off cameras. So over to the right hand side, I'm not sure exactly the shot that we're on there, but you can see some of the broadcast cameras that, and to be fair, they capture so much here. I think what we don't realise is just how much uh, apparatus is used for viewers to get to see every angle of every ball struck. There are 360 cameras, of course. Exactly. Uh, there's amazing cameras on trolleys in really high up places. I assume there's drones. I, it's an assumption. I think there's certainly cable cameras, which get some incredible shots. Now, we're really going to challenge Jeff now because we're going to see a slight adjustment of the iris as we're going to go up into the sky because behind us here is an amazing platform that originally, about 20 years ago, when I came to Wimbledon, there was actually a cameraman stood no, up there. No, there wasn't. There was indeed. And now <gasps> they've got hot cams and basically they're remotely controlled and they get those beautiful panoramic shots. So when you hear presenters talking, especially someone like, say, Claire Bolding, for example, when they're talking about Wimbledon, the shots come from up there. And if you look, it's rock steady. It might be a number of meters up there, but it hardly moves. And this is just. I mean, you're of saying that I see it swaying gently in this breeze that we've just spoken about. Oh, do you reckon? Is that the clouds moving, or is that? I'm not sure. There which is one a it ladder, is. Jeff. If needs be, you might have to pop up that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> just check that hot head hasn't got too hot. You can't hear Jeff, but he's yeah, exactly that. He's, he's shaking his hand. But this is basically what it's about, and I have to say, it's very serene as well. We've got some koi cart behind us here. Well, I'll tell you what's beautiful. So up by the hill, there's like a lot of water features, which is very relaxing. It is there's gorgeous. some beautiful fountains, waterfalls. And then look, there's even lily pads. And I imagine the horticultural team here really nurture all this kind of flora, fauna. You know, I wonder if there's a tadpole or a frog. I believe there is, but I'm only amphibian. Oh. No, come on, Excellent. come on. That's, right, that's, that's good. I'm going to retire early, guys. <laughs> but the point being is that wherever you are in Wimbledon, there is something for you. Whether you want to have some pims and some strawberries, there's that for you. If you're lucky enough to be on centre court or court number one, there's that. But for me, right here is what it's all about. And sometimes just drinking all this gorgeous scenery in and taking in a bit of the old tennis. Well, one of those matches certainly on the big screen in the hill is this one. Right now, Paul Judd, the British player, the wild card, taking on Nick Kyrgios. I have to tell you, that's a look at one of the player balconies. You can see the player interest, the fan entrance. So much around the grounds. There are queues around the number three court to try to get into this one. You can see Kyrgios leading this match two sets to one. They're in a third set tie break. Can Paul Judd force a fifth set? Let's go ahead and Tune into this one as Kyrgio serves 2-3 in the breaker. Oh. Well, that forehand down the line has been so useful in the last 15 minutes or so, and he got the right one to go after. And he guessed it. He missed that one by a long shot. He's changing ends after six points. on in the day he's playing uh, Australian qualifier Jason Kubler out on court two right at the end of the day but at the moment fully focused on 
fellow compatriot Paul Jubb. Back on serve in this fourth set tiebreak. Three all. to suggest this might be the biggest moment of his tennis career so far. The look on the second serve to take us into a fifth set. A rattled Australian. Paul Jubb rising to the occasion and he takes us all into a fifth set. How about that for Paul Jubb into a fifth set against Nick Kyrgios? We're going to keep an eye on that, but this was just moments ago and on center court, Iga Sviantek, a 36th match yeah, in a row. She had to come back in that second set against Jana Fett. But the world number one, how about it? She hasn't lost since February and now into the second round of Wimbledon, having never reached the second week here. Quite incredible. Well, how many titles are we on now? Six titles. Six, in a row. <laughs> Six titles since uh, February. She is a young woman playing with so much confidence. It didn't matter that she didn't play any of the the grass court tournaments in the lead up to Wimbledon. First match on grass and uh, was made to work for it a little bit, uh, just a little bit in that second set. Uh, a little worked. scratchy. Yeah, but um, I think she'll be satisfied with that. Jana Fett though did a great job winning three matches in qualifying to earn her spot here in the main draw. Yeah, certainly. And what I love about Sviantek is she's taking every challenge as it comes. She was asked about coming onto the center court, said that it is an honor that she's happy to have. Of course, there was discussion if Simona Halep would be the first woman to play on this Tuesday, but a lot of appreciation here. And she just seems to back herself, doesn't she? She does. Well, she's a fine athlete, and it doesn't matter what surface you put her on. She makes, uh, she makes tennis look simple, which uh, is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not, and one of the new aspects of Wimbledon here is the post-match chat. Let's go ahead and hear from Iga Sviantek. Into the second round is the world number one. Well, Iga, huge congratulations. Um, victory out here on center court. You dominated the first set. She made you work a little harder for the second, but are you pleased with the way you've started your Wimbledon performance? I am. You know, it's my first match on grass this season, so I knew it's going to be tricky. In second set at the beginning, I, I lost my focus a little bit, and she used that pretty well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy that I came back and that I could finish in two sets. And, you know, I'm just figuring out how to play here and trying to implement all the stuff that we were practicing on. So it's pretty exciting. It's a 
new experience for me, basically. Yeah, the last time we saw you, you were lifting the title at Roland Garros, and everybody knows how great you are on clay, but what about this surface? Is it something that you're comfortable on? Um, <laughs> we'll see, honestly. Uh, I, I think so. I, it's pretty tricky, you know, because I still feel like I have only played, I don't know, like 12 weeks in my life on grass, so... Um, yeah, but the whole atmosphere, all the tradition that is here, it's really kind of pumping me um, up. So I'm really motivated to play here well, and I want to also use the experience that my coach has. So I'm just looking forward to the next matches and to seeing how I'm going to play here. You're on an incredible winning streak, 36 matches now. Um, I just... <laughs> You also have that number one alongside your name. Some people would see that as a pressure, others a pleasure. Do you enjoy that? I do. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty convenient. <laughs> Not just, I mean, I, I've really worked on that and I knew how tough the last weeks were and, you know, my team also gave me huge support and all the work that we've been doing, it clicked this season, so um, I think it's great. I'm pretty sad that Ash isn't <laughs> here. Yeah. And because I would love to play against her on grass and yeah, but I feel like even though with her retirement in the next couple of tournaments, I kind of um, realized that maybe it's the right, right place to be, but I'm still trying to figure out how to stay in that position um, and be consistent here. So yeah, we'll see. Well, it's very well deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got the number one here, whether she likes it or not, we're number one, Iga Schwantek. Thank Congratulations. you very much. Well, well done to Iga Sviantek. And also, I, I just love that she's showing her personality and, and doesn't even hesitate on how's the pressure versus the privilege versus the pleasure of being the world number one on that 36 match win streak. She really is taking it on. Ash Barty is the defending champion. She was the world number one. She retires at 25 in March. And Iga has just taken on that throne, you can call it. That, yeah, the, the, she's, that she's taken spot. everything in her stride. And, mm. um, you know, she looks like she really belongs and she really has, we've seen over the last few months, set herself apart from all the other women. Yeah, she, she sure has. So straight sets today, comes through 36 matches in a row, going for that channel slam too, not yeah. easy. and. I like there too, she says she's not necessarily fully comfortable on the grass yet, is she? She's only played a few no. weeks of it yeah. in her career. She's a junior champion here a few years ago. Yes, I remember very clearly watching her in the juniors back in 2018 uh, on her way to the title. I remember her beating Emma Raducanu in the mm. quarterfinals, actually. Emma only got one game on that occasion. That was on the court just behind us, court number two. Um, and I remember thinking, gosh, this, this young young woman is an outstanding tennis player she's going to be really good uh, never did i realize or think that she Ladies was going to be this good so soon you leave your seats, please make sure yeah you certainly so Sviantek now into round two and actually you watched a fair amount of leslie kirkov who she's going to get yes. next does kirkov next offer match, any sort of um, weapons to take down Sviantek? kirkov um she's a lucky loser in the draw i only found out this morning uh, because of Danka Kovinic's withdrawal due to injury. She beat uh, British wildcard Sonne Cartel today in three sets. Revenge having lost to Sonne Cartel mm. on a, a couple of occasions this year. But it's going to be a tough challenge for the Dutch woman. It's going to be played on a big show court. Dutch woman doesn't have as much experience on those big stages like uh, Iga Sviantek. And with Iga in this type of form, um, yeah, I don't see her being troubled too much. The difference too, you know, between Ash Barty, who had that brilliant run here last year, for me is that you could always kind of feel the weight and the pressure for Barty, and she handled it so well. But Iga almost looks like she's having fun with all of it too. Yeah, I'm sure behind the scenes uh, there are conversations. She, sure. We know she works closely with uh, her sports psychologists uh, and her coaching team. Um, but uh, she, she looks like she's enjoying the moment and taking it all in. Happy to sign as many autographs. She's not in a rush to get into that ice bath, is she? No. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's refreshing to see from someone so young 
um, who just really, the world is her oyster. Yeah, it certainly is. And we're going to have a couple champions. She's certainly a champion already. Two slams. We mentioned that's 36 matches in a row. We've got two more champions on center court to come. Rafael Nadal taking on uh, Sarundalo, the Argentinian, Francisco, and then Serena Williams making that return to court, taking on Harmony Tan. First off, Rafael Nadal, how crazy is it that for the first time ever in his career, at 36, he's got two majors, he's halfway to the yes. calendar slam. And he's actually fit and healthy for this <laughs> one as well, because at the French Open and at the Australian Open, we, were, we, we knew he was carrying an injury and we knew he was managing it. At the French Open, he had his doctor there. Um, and he has had foot surgery, a minor foot surgery, since um, his victory in Paris. But um, yeah, great for all of us to have this opportunity to see one of the all-time greats in action on the grass. And actually, too, Sviantec and Nadal are pretty good friends. They were practicing next to each other just yesterday. And Iga has just said, Rafa is this guy. And Emma Raducanu yes. was talking about it, too. Rafa is this guy who I just feel so motivated by. The fight, yeah. the beast mode, the way that he goes at clay and grass and nothing. Rafa says, I don't look in the past. I only look forward. We're looking forward to seeing him on court. But that's the kind of thing, do players feel that in the locker room when you've got the greats around and you can feel the way that they operate? Yeah, and I think in Rafael Nadal especially, because he just oozes so much positive energy and you just want to be around him and, and hopefully some of that electricity will rub off on, on your own tennis. Uh, but yeah, Emma Raducanu walking around in her Nadal t-shirt. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone wants to be Rafael Nadal. doesn't matter who you are. You, you want to play with his type of energy, with his type of passion. And he's a fantastic role model to so many people. Yeah, very cool. And also the return of Serena Williams. How about this? 20 years after she won her first Wimbledon in 2002, she's back. She's 40 years young. She's won this title seven times. What did you see in Eastbourne? You were down there last week. She only played doubles. I loved the serve. I thought the serve looked really good. It's hard to tell in the movement where the movement is, but there was that zest, that fight from Serena. No matter what, she's going to come out on court. She's third up on center court today. What are you expecting? from her. I don't know. I'm not sure Serena <laughs> Join knows. Join the club. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure Serena knows what to expect either. But, um, it, you know, it's, look, it, it's difficult. But last week, what we saw in Eastbourne was someone enjoying herself, having fun there with Ons Jabeur. Um, yes, she wasn't. She was only protecting half a court effectively, but she was significantly better in that second uh, doubles match than she was in the first. A lot sharper, striking the ball a lot bigger, um, and overall just looking uh, more consistent. And you know, she, she's had enough time um, on the grass to prepare for today's match, but um, I'm fascinated to see um, what we're going to get from her. Harmony Tan ranked outside her opponent today, mm. ranked outside the world's top 100. I mean, you know, this is what you dream about for any young professional going out on one of the biggest stages on the most iconic tennis court in the world. There's nowhere better than Centre Course at Wimbledon taking on one of the all-time greats. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good level. Um, well, it's, a, it's good just to see where you're at. Um, she'll be none the wiser than us as to what kind of tennis Serena will produce today. I loved, you know, there was the question put to Serena in press as we get some vision here of her in practice and that, you know, you could have drawn Sviantec or Halep or Coco Goff or anyone. And she goes, yeah, and anyone could have drawn me. Yes. So that is the attitude. I mean, to be a Williams sister, to be Serena, that's the attitude she's always operated with. One thing I was noticing courtside yesterday too, Anne, is she's really aggressive in her court positioning. She's right up there on the baseline. It's gonna be a lot about, for her, that first serve and first strike tennis, going after that first ball, imposing herself against Harmony Tan. Absolutely, when Serena's at her best, um, it's first strike tennis, and we know how well she can play that brand of tennis. And also, you know, first match in 12 months, fitness-wise, we don't know how she is going to be, and she doesn't know, you know, if this match were to go to a third set, how do, will she have enough in the tank? We just don't know. So for her, I'm sure the goal uh, today, tactically, will try to be to keep the points as short as possible, because if she can get through this match in a straightforward manner, then that's going to help her going into the next round. Yeah, it certainly is hitting with some intensity here in this practice footage. And also, that's Eric Heckman, who's worked with Venus for a couple years. Serena no longer with Patrick Moritoglu, so she's got Eric there. And I think it, 
I think it's so important too, when you've got a close family, like the Williams family, mm -hmm. the fact that Eric's been around, he's obviously been Venus's coach. Venus is also here. V She's Whoa, been can practicing we talk about Anne. Venus? Sure, let's do it. Venus, is she going to play mixed doubles what with do you somebody? Think? Uh, I think. I, I, a, I think so a too. There's there those floating question marks. Who's Venus Williams? Actually, who do you guys think Venus Williams <laughs> is going to play mixed doubles with who will she play yeah. mixed doubples full uh, stop That's i mean she she's got her pick of the guys out there yeah. hasn't she i mean what an opportunity that would be for anyone to play mixed doubles with venus williams and it would be an absolute treat i don't want to get too far ahead of myself but i feel like i need to sneak into that referee's office and see whether yeah, well, she's actually i mean come on Anne. you've got standard. your you've got your club me members <laughs> badge let's uh ann kathavang is going to be an intrepid <laughs> reporter and take a look at the mixed doubles draw which is meant to be out tomorrow tomorrow I yes think. the Sign in closes tomorrow. Okay, so no um, pressure on that. Okay, I, I'm going to investigate. Has Venus Williams signed up with somebody? All I'll right. let you know later. Where in the world is Venus Williams? We're going to find that out next, but actually, let's go ahead and catch up with Radzi, who's out and about around the grounds. Now, behind us, we've got a little bit of a queue going on for two things ice cream and PIMS. Which one's the most important? We'll let you decide, but we join by Polly and Karika, who come from exotic climes, but right here, it essentially is tropical here. Polly, I'll start with yourself. What do you love most about Wimbledon? Um, strawberries and cream. No, all the, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, all the tennis players, of course, and the atmosphere. And Karika, this isn't your first time in Wimbledon. How many times have you been here? Uh, I've been here maybe, this is my third time here, yes. For anyone at home who's thinking, I've never been, I've seen it on TV, what's it actually like? It's just amazing. It's the atmosphere, you know, the tennis players this morning when we walked in, we saw Nadal immediately warming up, so wow. that was fantastic. So, And I've actually brought my family over from South Africa. Well, they've come over. I've paid for them to come. It's my mum's dream to be here, so oh. they're here today on centre court, so they'll see Nadal play today, so that's just amazing. You've got the ultimate brownie points for your mum, <laughs> definitely there. For your family who might be watching at home or could watch this back possibly on repeat, would you like to give them a message? For my family, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, this is just for me a wonderful thing for that, you know, to do for for my mum and for my stepdad. So, yeah, I'm so happy to have them over here, and I hope this is something you know that they'll remember for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And what are their names? Um, uh, Martin Kuhn and Anita Kuhn. Martin and Anita, hope you're having the absolute time of your lives on centre court. But meanwhile, we're going to stop these guys because they've got some drinks to buy. <laughs> Spectacular movement. Yes, it set up nicely for him, but he deserved the luck. Terrific movement from Cam Murray. So impressive. It's really nice variation. Power and then the touch and then the winner. Small target, but he found it. What a wonderful pass. It will be a second time break of the day. What a shot from Ramos Finulas. Able to get himself behind the ball there. Executed drop shot. It's an entertaining player to watch because of the variety in the game. And we just saw it there. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that is a ridiculous shot. How the heck did he get that? How low hit that shot? Look at this, it's just raw Spanish speed, and then the racket work. Oh. Oh. Put that on the showreel.
for the end of the first day. That was lovely. 30, 15. Oh, what a stroke. That is absolutely exquisite. 15, 30. Nicely struck. What a way to put down your first love hold. Oh, that's exceptional. Not just the pass, but the work he put in to stay in the point. Great industry. Great agility from Harrison. That is a beauty. You're watching live on Wimbledon Uncovered. A beautiful look here on a Tennis Tuesday. Daily delights at Wimbledon. Day two of the championships. 80 matches on tap and well more than 80 fans on the ground i think we had 35,000 yesterday and you've got a uh, three of us here as well that are big time tennis fans as well there's some folks on the hill but very happy to welcome in to our coverage naomi brody welcome Thank fresh you. off the practice where you're working <laughs> yeah. with asia muhammad now in the doubles that's awesome i am that's it and it's so much fun as well but i'm not um i feel like i'm underdressed for you're the occasion Wimbledon Whites. i am i i at least got the dress code for the for the practice in the tennis courts but um not for the it works treatment. for us here no, right? it's fine not it's for the fine. media yeah. <laughs> very good and actually we were chatting just a minute ago about venus williams and naomi came in and said well, yeah, she is going to play with <laughs> she Jamie Murray. Is. They've requested a wild card. Will they get the wild card? Well, and that's down to Anne's knee. <laughs> In the hot spot. <laughs> well, I think it would be difficult for the club to turn down Jamie Murray and Venus Williams. Okay. Got it. Both uh, have been former first. champions here, whether it's singles, doubles, mixed doubles. Um, they know what it's like to lift a, a title here at Wimbledon, and I'm sure the fans would love to see Venus and Jamie in action. Yeah, it, it would be. It's it's so cool even just to see Venus back on the practice court, right? How how we suddenly have Venus and Serena back at the same tournament? I mean, how lucky are we? And it's here at Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, have, have you had a chance to see Venus on the practice court hitting? I haven't seen her hitting. I did yesterday. You she did? looks great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, good intensity. She's striking the ball well. Good timing. I, I thought she looked great. Yeah. I, I've seen her around the grounds, and I've seen them over at Arangi, just you know, in the warm-up area, yeah. and it's always super fun over there. Cause seeing everyone doing their different fitness sessions or warm-ups, and seeing what kind of different things people do as well. Um, but I haven't actually seen her hitting the ball yet, so it's it's good to hear that she's still got kept her eye in by the sounds of it. Yeah, she certainly has. And let us be clear, it's a requested wild card. So Hasn't been confirmed. Yes, yeah, so there are other players still have until I believe midday tomorrow to sign in. Is that right, Naomi? Yeah, that's my job as coach. I have, I have to go do that. So I'm, I'm going to go do it when we're done here before I forget. So, yeah. yeah, and very cool because you've got Asia playing with Anna Shibahara, who's a very, both of them very accomplished very. doubles players. And um, who is Asia playing mixed doubles with? Yeah, well, she's going to enter with Danasi Kokonakis. So, um, Amazing. So much fun. Um, we've seen him, of course, on the doubles court with Nick Kyrgios a lot. So it might depend as well how he gets on in the singles. He won his first round. Um, but no, he, he, I, I said to her, you know, she's such a great doubles player. Find someone that, that plays great doubles, but you enjoy it with. You know, make, mixed doubles is so enjoyable, isn't it? People yeah. always say to me, why do you not stop smiling and mix it? You know, you're just constantly laughing. And but I'm like, that's the point of mix. Like, it's so much fun. And I feel like the teams that have the most fun do the best as well. Well, you've done well in the mixed doubles here in the past. And Jeremy Shardy was your partner, <laughs> I recall, last year. What, yeah. did he, what did he tell you? What did he say to you that made it so much fun? <laughs> I mean, Jeremy and I have been great friends for years because we've known each other since we both trained at Moritoglu oh, Academy yeah. years ago, over 10 years ago now. Um, but I actually asked him at, at kind of a, the 11th hour, I was struggling to find, to find a partner <laughs> and I said to him, you're my last choice. And he was like, well, thanks. Like, I'm making me feel really good about myself. Um, but he was like, if you can't find anyone, like, enter with me. I was like, okay, like, I'll, I'll see. I'll try really hard. I didn't. 
Um, but no, he was everyone. After, after we got in, everyone was saying, "Why did you ask me if you had the chance to play with Jeremy?" Jeremy like, Shardy. Yeah. You're like, wait, what? Are, how did I not ask you first? Seriously. Essentially. Did you not give your brother Liam heat for not playing with you? Yeah, because Liam would obviously be my first choice, but um, with the playing men's doubles and singles here both best of five obviously mm. it's it's a lot to, to take on the mixed as well so Liam had said he didn't want to play all three events unless you know I was at a loss and couldn't find anyone but I, I chose Jeremy over Liam for my 11th hour pick oh wow okay so hopefully <laughs> this, hopefully Liam will forgive you for that I also you know working with Asia Muhammad who's had such an accomplished doubles career and yeah. you were accomplished in doubles as well the fact that these players go week to week sometimes you're only making a few hundred bucks and then you're going to the next tournament. How special and important is Wimbledon to a, a player like Asia Mohammed? Massive. She lost in the qualifying of the singles um, and she's in the main draw of the doubles and hopefully the mixed doubles as well will depend upon the list. We'll see how yeah. strong it is. Um, but, it, but it's massive, you know, especially as you say for Asia, who's kind of, it, it, it makes it for difficult scheduling to try and decide which tournaments to play in singles and doubles because she can get into the top events in the doubles now. They're seeded fifth here, she and Shibahara. Nice. But in the singles, she's kind of ranked around 150, 200, where you're kind of just getting into the qualifiers of the WTA, but not every single week, especially at the stronger weeks, you drop down and play some of the ITF level events. So it, it's kind of, um, the, the scheduling, there's kind of an art to this, the, the tennis scheduling, especially when you're in the same, and that's actually how she and Shibahara, their partnership came about, because Enna was of course playing with Shuko, and th were they finalists here last year, I think? I yeah, think yeah, Shibahara. they've done well here. So, um, yeah. so they were having a fantastic partnership, but Enna actually said to Shuko that she wanted to play a bit more singles. Ah. And for Shuko Aoyama, she said, well, you know, doubles is so important to me. I want to keep playing the top, top events. So Enna said, okay, well, maybe let's take a break with the partnership whilst I can have the opportunity to drop down for some singles ITFs. And so for she and Asia, it worked out perfectly. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I, I love those stories. Yeah, and how's the transition been for you from player, full-time player, to yeah. now coach of Asia? Well, it, it's been pretty easy, to be honest, <laughs> because the only time I do any coaching is with either Asia, who's my best friend, and Norma my brother so it, it's uh, I feel like they go easy on me well Liam certainly doesn't but yeah, I wouldn't does. think Liam would no. go easy on you but I, you know I'm just there um, with the best intentions maybe even more so than a coach would have because I want them to do well on a personal level so you know I do absolutely everything I can around the courts to make them feel comfortable and we're all sharing a house together just down the road as Are well you? so Asia's having to get used to how loud <laughs> my brother is I don't I don't know how many run-ins you've had with him but um, I'm sure Anne knows he by now. is so loud <laughs> and tell me he's got to be the messiest as well He's absolutely the messy. <laughs> but between him and my younger brother, but I feel like my younger brother is accidentally messy, whereas Liam will just leave his stuff and he knows someone else is going to tidy up. Too good. I, I love that. I, I'm shocked that Liam Brody is loud, a gregarious, messy. Love all of that. We are having some British chat. Let's check in now on the number one court. This actually was a match that was held over from last night. The number one court, and you were watching this, but Heather Watson now, she's got a break against Corpatch to open the third set. Yes, she actually, Heather led um, the first set 5-2 uh, and unfortunately lost it uh, in a tie break, but came back strong in the second. And at one set all, I think it was just after half past 10 last night, they actually uh, suspended the match. Obviously, there, there is an 11 p.m. curfew here at Wimbledon. Um, so it was only fair to come back today uh, for the one set shootout. Yeah, we, it, it's actually really good fun when Wimbledon matches end up running on so late, although I'm sure it's not so much fun for the players themselves. But, you know, we, we eat dinner, we're, st we're watching Andy, dinner's finished, you know, you, you've gone to shower, you come back down, Heather's still on, you know, it's just so nice. And I love that so many people around Britain are able to just sit in the evenings and watch tennis. And I think that's so important for the growth of the game in the country. And I love that, that we get that throughout Wimbledon. Yeah, Heather Watson has a couple WTA titles to her name in her career. I think a lot of folks will remember 2015 she almost beat Serena yes. in the third round, that match on center court. But, you know, we talk a lot about the elongation of tennis careers and the fact that now we're seeing players in their 30s and 40s. Is Heather 30 now? I think she's she right is. on the cusp of she her. Is, yep. just she hit the big 3-0 <laughs> recently. <laughs> but it's great to see her still out there and still asking of herself some of her best tennis. And, and I, I think that's been a massive part of Heather's career now is that she's just hanging around. She's not giving up. She's not going away. She's back with her old coach, Diego, who she always felt like she loved working with him. And for whatever reasons, they parted ways. He'd worked with other players since. But it just shows that kind of like Andy, she still wants the best of the best. She's not just here for the fun of it. You know, she's still trying to squeeze every ounce out of her game that she has left. And, and as we can see there, she's, she's battling away hard um, today as well to get through first round. 
when you have a match held over at, they were one set all weren't they and they so were, when yes. you're held over like that what's what's the chat with the coach or how do you prepare for a one you say one set shoot i mean the yeah. fact that you've got just that one set and that's the match yes well i was actually chatting to diego uh, this morning and he said well heather was fine tip-top shape getting ready for practice and um ready to come out firing today which she has done Okay, so Heather Watson leads there in the third set. And let's go from number one court into the center court where a familiar face is Rafael Nadal, a two-time champion here. He's halfway to the calendar slam. Just getting the final knock up here. There's the lefty in Nadal talking about his foot feeling mostly better. We're gonna see how it goes today against Francisco of Sorandulo. But I mean, what a start to 2022 against you know, the fact that he came back from two sets to love down in that Australian Open final, wins a 14th French Open, and a lot of people, he was on crutches after the French Open, a lot of people didn't think that we'd see him here. It's funny because we were doing commentary on Rafa's final for the French Open and for the Australian Open, and even before the tournament, not one of us picked him as the favourite for the tournament. Who, I mean, what were we thinking? <laughs> Who doesn't pick Rafael Nadal for the favourite to win the French Open? No, I, I'm there with you, Naomi. <laughs> he just, he's so humble, and yeah. he's mm. hes one of the few players that really lets us get an insight into how he's feeling and how his injuries are. So you, you genuinely buy into what he says, that you know he isn't 100%, and you therefore think that he, you know, with, with what strong field men's tennis is you know such strength and depth you know is he good enough to get through but he's done what he's done for the first time in his career now this year winning the first two majors of the year and is it not more frightening uh, for the other players in the field the fact that he's actually arrived here at Wimbledon and says he feels good he, <laughs> <laughs> he, no pain in his foot it's, it's almost a little mental, don't you think? Rafa kind of putting doubts in his own head, but then he can go out there and play against himself in the challenge. So Rafael Nadal just taking to center court. Let's dip in on this first game. His 2022 campaign starts here. He's halfway to the calendar slam for the first time in his career. And almost finishing off the list of Nadal's idiosyncrasies, the two socks have to be absolutely level up his shins. Otherwise, who knows what might happen. Tim Hemman joins me in the box. Afternoon, Tim. Can you see anything other than an Adal win here? Serendolo loss. No, I think in all honesty, John, it's, uh, it's a tough ask for Serendolo. He doesn't have the grass court pedigree, but, you know, this is a two-horse race. There are no scripts. Nadal's got to go out there and, and earn the victory, and Serendolo's got to try and make life as tough as possible and see whether he can create some chances.
Well, that was a very strange shot. 40-30. And an even stranger bounce. Welcome back. Um, my first question is, how is it for you to be back here at Wimbledon? I haven't been able to be here since 2019, so I'm excited to, to be around here for, for almost a week, so enjoying uh, that fact. How nice is it to be back here with the fact that we're going to have a full crowd? We were lucky that we were able to, to keep uh, going with our sport and our lives, uh, of course, uh, So, but at the same time, talking about just about our sport, uh, of course it has been uh, tough for the tournaments, tough for the players, uh, a lot of uh, efforts to, to keep running events and for the players to keep travelling uh, and playing without the crowd, uh, you know, it's completely different yeah. feeling, no? so uh, yeah. yeah, especially for uh, the older guys, I think, <laughs> because for, for the younger, I think that it's a little bit Easy, no? Because for them everything is new, and they still have the 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 passion to discover new things. No, but for us it's important to have the crowd because we play with the adrenaline and uh, with the joy of having uh, full crowd stadiums. And uh, yeah, uh, it's amazing to see all of them back. What is it about this place, this particular court, that's making you come here this year and want to play? Well, if I'm here, it's because uh, honestly the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, in terms of pain. Uh, Situation is better, no, but uh, it's very clear, and I talk very, very open and clear after Roland Garros. No, if I am not able to to slow down the pain, uh, I will not be in Wimbledon, no, because I can't keep going that way. Uh, because it don't make sense, no, in a in a personal way. But honestly, the last couple of weeks have been better. The things that I I did in terms of treatment treatment uh, looks. Like it's working for the moment, uh, you know. Uh, nothing <laughs> is proved, and uh, I don't, uh, I can't be 100% uh, sure on anything. But uh, the only thing that it's true is the last two weeks that the pain uh, is less than than what I had uh, the last uh, year and a half, and that's for me the main thing. No, so uh, that's why I'm here. I'm excited. Uh, I know a challenge, uh, how big is the challenge to, to come back to play on, on grass after a long time because it's, it's a surface that when you are not very familiar with, uh, it's difficult. Uh, but I accept the challenge no? and I am here to try my best and to, to see if I'm able to be competitive. Over the last uh, 100 years, which is why we're sitting here today, to look at this beautiful court, it's 100 years of this particular centre court. Um, We've asked a lot of players what their most memorable match mm. that they've watched or seen on this court, and a lot of them have said your 2008 match against Roger. Mm. Um, what about for you? What's the earliest memory of this court oh, for you? I don't know. I have a lot of memories. You know, I remember uh, Goran winning. I remember uh, Sampras, all the Sampras uh, titles because I went. That's when I was. Uh, Younger, the, the Agassi title. So, uh, and a little bit later on, I remember the Leighton uh, title, of course, the first Rogers title against Philipposis. Uh, I don't know. I, I have a lot of a lot of memories now uh, about uh, this place, and I was able to to visit for the first time Wimbledon when I was uh, 16, playing the juniors, and for me it was a great experience. So, t take me back to the first time you walked around those. I don't know what we call them here, curtains, mm. and walked onto this particular court. Mm. Do you remember that moment and what you felt? Only, honestly not. <laughs> I don't remember that day because I, I don't know when I played uh, for the first time here. It was too long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that old. I'm not 36, but I played here for the first time in 2003 that I didn't play in the center court. Uh, 2004, I was not able to play here. I had the first foot injury, and then 2005, I don't remember if I played here. So, I, I remember the moment that you won here. The sun was going down. It was very dark. Yeah, very dark. Yeah. 
what about that moment that that you remember that not many people get to experience playing on this court and having that moment? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, the match have it have it all. Uh, Roger in the other side of the <laughs> of the net. Uh, then uh, I think the match had all the ingredients to become. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, an important match of the history of our sport because uh, we're number one against number two. Uh, all the rivalry, the rivalry that we we have together, and then uh, rain delays twice. Uh, <laughs> I was winning uh, two sets to love. Then uh, big chance on the tiebreak of the fourth uh, match points. Uh, then uh, uh, the. The fifth, he had a break point, uh, and then the match was super long, so the, the, the sun was going down and down, and uh, I was having, at the end, chances and chances to break, but uh, Roger was holding and holding, and uh, yeah, finally I got the break, and uh, and then I, I know when I got the break, uh, I had the break, uh, I need to win the next game. If not, uh, we go back to the locker room, and uh, we're going to finish tomorrow, you know? so that's at a little bit of extra pressure for me. But at the same time, uh, yeah, one of the most uh, unforgettable moments of my tennis career, without a doubt. So, <laughs> we, we are here this year because of the 100 years of Centre Court, but across the street they're actually building new courts, they're going to have the qualifying here now. Yeah. How much do you think that'll help the young kids to think that they're so close, but yet not quite on the grounds yet? I think uh, all the slams have been improving. Uh, our sport in general is uh, improving in... in in general terms, and uh, Wimbledon uh, is not an exception. No, uh, they covered both courts. Number one, uh, center court. They, I, I saw the new uh, uh, area that uh, the they crossing. make crossing mm. the street. That yeah. it's amazing. And now, I think uh, the, in the future they have the plans to 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 go and uh, in the land near in the other side, in the left side. Uh, and I think it's fantastic that the bigger tournaments are investing on improving uh, things and uh, to make the things better for the fans, for the players, because uh, investing back on, on the sport, uh, the only thing that creates is value uh, for our sport. No? And that's the most important thing and makes the experience uh, more unforgettable for everyone, no? for the fans, for the players and for all the people who really love our sport and at the end the most important thing is uh, to make uh, our sport bigger and bigger. Okay, last question. I just asked uh, Coco Goff actually and she gave me a really unique answer to what is unique about Wimbledon, this court in particular. I'm not going to tell you what she told me. I think the silence. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, the silence that uh, you feel uh, when you are playing, uh, for me that's the most uh, emblematic thing of this court. No? You, you feel when you are bouncing the ball, you, you listen to the bounces, no? and that's uh, probably one of the most uh, special things here. Well, uniquely, that's exactly what Coco Goff said. Oh, yeah? So, yeah. <laughs> oh, so uh, <laughs> I'll tell her, she'll be really excited to hear that you said the same thing she did. So. Uh, uh, I mean, honestly, from all of us at the club, from all the television people, from the fans around the world, it is amazing and great to see you here again this year. Thank you very much. I wish you yeah. all the best. I am excited, so hopefully yeah. I can stay here as long as possible. <laughs> so do we. Now, the beauty of being at Wimbledon is that you can really get up close to the action. We're literally on court. I'm basically playing this match. So when I came here about 15 years ago, I got a ground pass. I'm not sure how much it was then. It's only 27 quid now. And the amazing thing is, of course, there's court number one, the centre court, they're ticketed courts. But for me, it's all about this. Players you won't necessarily be au fait with. Not necessarily household names. They could be. But over here, we've got eight courts. We've got courts four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And just on your right-hand side is court number 12. And you can actually feel the balls when they land. You appreciate how fast the this is. The reverberation. You hear the kind of self talk going on the crowd you can kind of really get involved in the match it's far more intimate it's far more personal and you're seeing the top athletes in the world up close you're seeing their muscles contort it's really amazing you also get to see the size of things you wouldn't otherwise get to see on tv so for example you can see the coaches and you might be sat five seats away from the coach so you get that emotional investment and you also get to see the disappointment
movement on their faces. You mentioned the muscles contorting, the facial muscles contort as well. So to see how disappointed they are, you actually you hear every single sight, every single grunt. I mean, listen to that there. It's this is so intimate, and so for me, I just felt sweat. That might have been a bit saliva from me. Yeah, that would be it. That's really intimate. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Well, it is impossible to find a bot, bad spot here at Wimbledon. I mean, just all around the grounds, so you've got impeccable access to the tennis. And I love that there with Olivia and Radzi showing us courtside, how that feels. Lots of action around the grounds. Nick Kyrgios and Paul Jubb in a fifth set. Let's go ahead now and dip into court number two. It was a long 11th game here in the third set for Coco Goff, the French Open runner up. The American still just 18 years young. She got her nails done, I think, maybe specifically for Wimbledon, and those look pretty good. They do. But she's going to serve for the match here. Yes, well, it has been some battle, and I, I didn't <laughs> expect Ruth to put up this kind of fight uh, against Goff. And, uh, yeah, I, I must admit, I was guilty of thinking this would be a straightforward win for Coco Goff, but it has been far from it. First round's never easy, is it? It's never easy. And, you know, these girls are fearless out here. She's she's going out there and absolutely going for it, Ruth. And why not? Why would you not, right? You're playing at Wimbledon. You, you, you want to hang around. You want another chance to stay in the match. But Coco Goff herself putting up an incredible fight as well. And now the opportunity to serve for the match. OK, we can hear it just from our where we're stood. And let's go ahead and see it. Can Coco Goff close this one out? Nice and smart brow, but just wants to get a little angle on that. Three quarter pace, three quarter serve. Love it. Let for serve. Twice here at Wimbledon, twice as a teenager, reached the fourth round for a place in the second round. Sometimes you have to just grind out the win, dig deep and find something within, and Coco Goff has found that here. Losing the first set, but coming back to somehow find her way through, and that's all that matters. There'll be better performances, better days ahead, but a win is a win. The smile is the same, and Coco Goff once more lights up Wimbledon, and she will go through to the second round. The number 11 seed. Perhaps she'll get better from here, but what a challenge laid down by Elena Gabriela Russo. It's a real shame for her for all she's given to the match. No, what a match for this young lady here, Coco Goff. She's just fought so hard. Russo, yes, I mean, we'll see her play some more great matches. You've got a feel for her. She was really the aggressor. She was dictating for, for many of these points. She wants to stay on court a little bit longer. She's going to get her towel as well. She'll remember this match and perhaps that double fault may hurt, but uh, certainly she knows that she can fight very well also. A terrific match from Coco. Yeah, some regret, I'm sure, from Russo, though, because you won't get many better chances to down a big name, a big talent than that, because Coco Goff was out of sorts, absolutely no doubt about it. But somehow she has found her way through. And she's just been reminded that she has to do a chat, a chat with her. 
this after the match, but uh, still a smile from Elena Gabriela Russo. And that will hurt because, again, it was an opportunity. So she'll go through to play another Romanian in uh, Mihaela Buzarnescu, but uh, through in three sets and chatting now to Carthy Nana Sigurum. Coco, congratulations. That was tricky. It was tense. Was it just one of those matches you had to work your way into? Uh, I mean, Alina played uh, an amazing match, and I think today both of us gave our heart on the court, and um, the crowd was great um, for both sides. I think it was an electrifying match, and I'm happy that I was able to come out with it today, but uh, I, always, I also want to condemn her on her tennis and on her fight. It was a good match. This is the third time that you have played here at Wimbledon. You've got to the fourth round twice before. The crowd here clearly appreciates your style of play. I think they appreciate your personality as well. How special is it for you to come here and play at Wimbledon on one of the show courts? Uh, it means a lot. I think last year I played my first round on this court, and um, I honestly like this court. Uh, court two is a really, really nice court. Um, I like that it's... <laughs> It's, um, it's like big enough for it's like, you know, it's pretty loud in here, but um, it's pretty intimate and you can really hear every cheer and every person, every gasp, everything. Uh, so I like this court a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the court likes you too, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, you were in the French Open final. That was your last Grand Slam match. You've just won this one. How much does that experience now help you going forward in other Grand Slams like this one? Um, it definitely helped me a lot. Um, French Open taught me a lot. And, um, you know, the first rounds are always tough for me because I feel like it's the most nerve-wracking um, than any match. Um, and with that experience, I think... Uh, you know, in the middle of the first set, I was kind of freaking out a little bit, and then I was like, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that I lose. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> um, so that's why I think I started to play a little bit better. <laughs> it was fantastic to watch. Ladies and gentlemen, Coco Golf. Thank you. Well, what a great atmosphere there on the number two court for Coco Golf, speaking to one of our colleagues, Carthy, out on court. And Coco saying she loved being on that number two court stage. And what a big win for her coming off the French Open final run to feel like she's got her feet underneath her on the grass. Yeah, and she was challenged, wasn't she, today? And probably uh, more so than um, any of us could have uh, thought. But mm. she, she found a way. It was a gritty performance. She's and fired up, huh? She's fired <laughs> up. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure now with that match under her belt... Uh, she will be able to just take a bit of the pressure off her shoulders and um, go into the next one well prepared. I feel like it's a good thing as well sometimes to get those tough, gritty performances as you described it, Anne, it, early on in the tournament because you can play yourself in a bit, can't you, as well? You get more time spent on the grass court. It's such a quick turnaround, especially for Coco after she's made the final doubles and singles at French Open. You're then trying to rest whilst then trying to get matches in on the, on the right <laughs> surface before the next quarter. Coco Goff, so the American into round two. Let's check out who's joining her, and it's actually going to be Heather Watson just a few minutes ago on the number one court against Corpatch. This match and held over from last night, but Heather coming out, firing one set shootout, and she wins it six games to two. That's got to feel so good. Yeah, fantastic effort from Heather Watson because it has been a tough few weeks for her. Um, in the middle of the grass court season, uh, she picked up a, a hamstring strain, wasn't able to play in Birmingham, uh, came back last week in Eastbourne. And uh, that was a hard fought win. Certainly was. Heather Watson next up against Wang Chiang, who actually upset Belinda Benchard. So a little, little bit of opening there for her in the draw. Well, I actually thought it was a really tough first round for, for Benchard and Wang. I, you know, 
every now and then they're not necessarily the seeds but you know their game's going to suit well to the grass i think heather looks like she's in absolutely fantastic shape i think she's been working really hard recently and um, as we say she's back with coach diego who knows her game so well they're really close as well which i think is, i mean we can see the beaming yeah. trademark smile of heather there happy. yeah and, and when you're happy off the court how often do we say that you perform better on it yeah, just so cool to see, and, and both of you have experienced it in person, but the specialness of it. Maybe if you have had a tough few weeks at a British player to come here to Wimbledon and get a W on a show court? Come oh, on. I mean, I'm sure she's absolutely delighted. But for every British player here in the draw, whether you're in on ranking, whether you're here on a wild card, you know, this tournament is so, so special. And, yeah, just to, to get that win under your belt, it just takes a huge weight off your shoulders. And for Heather Watson, you know, last year she went out to Christiane on court number one so she was able to bury some of those bad memories uh, from that loss last year and yeah create some new ones you know what i love too is we're stood here the southern campus is behind us here we've got courts eight to eleven and we've got coco just one on number two court we can see court 12. we also heard a lot of noise from number three court there's just so much action these first few It's a carnival of tennis in the best way possible. Absolutely. I always think if you've never experienced Wimbledon, come down the first few days, especially days one and two, you're going to see some huge names right on the outside courts. You're right up close to them. Um, and and you, can, you can see them all for the, for the price of just a grounds pass. So yeah. it's, it's so exciting. Do you remember your first Wimbledon experience? I do. We used to, so we're from Manchester, which is hours away. Um, Where, I was back up Manchester? north. <laughs> up north, that's all I know is it's north. Yeah, there you go. Um, and we used to drive down first thing in the morning, so it was still dark outside. They'd yeah. put all four, my mum and dad would put all four kids in the back car, which was obviously illegal. Um, we'd drive all the way down, which I used to think that must have just been such an unenjoyable start to a day with four siblings in the back of the car, all squished in, screaming, yeah, arguing. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'd get down, we'd park at the same family who was still still rent their car park, their, their driveway out as a car no park way. each year. Yeah, they're still there. And we'd park there and we'd get in the queue. We'd, we'd fake, sorry Anne as a committee member, we'd fake that my brother was five because you get in it for free under five till he was about ten. Anne won't tell, it's fine. We're good. But this is Liam, so, this is, this is Liam. So, um, yeah, we, we'd, we'd get Liam in the stroller and pretend he was about five. and um, <laughs> So we didn't have to buy one extra ticket and save us oh, some money. And then good. we'd drive home the same day. So, really? oh my so we, we, we have some great photos of us that we say at some point we need to recreate. We need to get all our siblings together and go recreate it somewhere because... Um, yeah, well, I mean, what special memories. And then to think we've then been back here as players, it, it's, mm, it's crazy. Amazing. What was yeah. your first one about? Well, I remember, I must have been about seven or eight when I first came here. And back in the day, there used to be a short tennis exhibition. Tell me, you used to play short tennis with a sponge ball. Never, near me. we just oh. went straight oh. to Am I that ball? much older than you? <laughs> well, no one plays short tennis with a sponge ball anymore. But um, if you were a, a county or club level yeah. junior, um, did anything for your county you were invited to come and perform at the short tennis exhibition and if you were lucky one of the professional players would come out and greet you and that was a free grounds pass into Wimbledon so um, of course you accepted the invitation yeah, you have to course. do whatever you could to get these grounds yeah, passes yeah. absolutely no so um, yeah a lot of fun and I, I do recall just running around getting autographs of, of players I, you know I had no idea who half the players were yeah. but um, it was so much fun and who was the player that came out to greet you at the, the mini tennis event yeah, Do you remember I remember that? Monica Sellis coming out one no year. Way. That's a yeah. good one. Amazing. Yeah, got the photo somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to dig that up in the trek. Uh, great Wimbledon memories, great access around the grounds, of course, for all of us and for the folks here. But just in the last few minutes, Nick Kyrgios and Paul Jubb doing battle. And this one was a big one, Naomi, for Paul Jubb to force the fifth set. He was actually down a break and then was trying to serve to take it into that match tie break in the fifth set. Couldn't do it. But what an effort today from, from Jubb against Kyrgios. Well, Jubb's been struggling so much with injuries. Both of the players actually having not played all that much because Nick obviously uh, picking and choosing which tournaments he wants to play and Jubby being injured but what a fantastic experience for Jubb I hope he's going to take so much confidence from that because when he is fit and healthy ready to play he's got so much potential and um, you can see a big smile from him at the net there that, that one will sting but um, I, I think he'll have enjoyed the atmosphere because the crowd just next to us were going absolutely mental for him yeah and he battled well didn't he coming back from a breakdown in yeah. that uh, final set and really uh, hung in and had the crowd support and you know never easy playing Nick Kyrgios because you never know what's coming at you whether it's uh, the tennis or whether it's uh, some of his other <laughs> antics which makes him the entertainer he is. And sometimes too, sorry Naomi, sometimes talking to Anjabor before 
this tournament about her loss at the French Open. And for Paul Jeb, obviously a whole different experience. But to have a match like that against Kyrgios at Wimbledon on a show court, that can maybe, maybe start some momentum for him. Absolutely. And, and he'll want to have this experience again, you know. I think that's one of the, the things that people don't realize for the wild cards. You know, this, it's such an inspiration to play on these big courts, the big stadiums with the home crowd against big name players. You gain so much self-belief. We, we, we've seen um, Katie Swan as well go out this morning against a player ranked way higher than her, but it, again, in such a tough three-setter. Um, and, and hopefully take that belief forwards for the U.S. hard court season coming up after, after here. Yeah, really huge. And, and, you know, for Jeb, the struggle with injury. He's been a college tennis player. He's someone who's trying to make his way. What a, what a just a life experience, not only a tennis experience. Yes, uh, I'm sure he will in time find... Uh, yeah, find, take a lot of confidence from this kind of performance and hopefully he can push on up the rankings. Well, Nick Kyrgios is someone that no one wants to face in the draw. He gets through in five sets. And what an atmosphere on this number three court. This is what we love on the first few days of Wimbledon. Another familiar face for us, Jenny Drummond. She spoke to Nick after his victory. Nick, first of all, Congratulations. I mean, that was a fight and a half you had on your hands today. Just how tough was it to get through that five-setter? It was incredibly tough. Uh, obviously, you know, he's a local wild card. He had nothing to lose and he just enjoyed the moment. He played some exceptional tennis at times. Um, you know, uh, the crowd was pretty rowdy today. Um, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of people in the, couple people in the crowd, um, not shy of criticising me. So that one was for you. Um, you know who you are, um, but <laughs> no, he's, he's going to be a good player, uh, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, I'm just happy to get through. I, th <laughs> I think there's also a few in this crowd who are supporting you as well, right? <laughs> this, this is your, your favourite tournament. Grass is your favourite surface. Just how special is it to be back and competing, you know, with a raucous crowd? Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, um, you know, Wimbledon the last couple of years has been a strange one. Obviously, bubble last year and this year no ranking points. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different feel, but it's always obviously special coming out here every time. Playing in front of full courts like this is is pretty is pretty special. Um, you know, I thought I was going to go down there for a bit, and that would probably would have been a tough tough loss to to take. But um, you know, I'm just happy to be through and now just rest up. And Nick, you, you love to have a wee chat to yourself on the court. Some might say, some might say a th third commentator maybe on the court. Have you thought about potentially commentary after tennis? <laughs> um, maybe. Um. <laughs> Come on, give us some more than that. No, I just, I just talk a lot uh, on court, but um, you know, off the court I'm not too bad, but on the court it's just, it's crazy. But uh, you know, if they pay me well enough, I'll probably do it. <laughs> and, and finally, I want to ask your, your great friends with Andy Murray. Uh, he was on yesterday, had a great victory in his first round match. Did you see his underarm serve? And if you did, what would you rate it out of ten? Um, I heard about it, uh, but I didn't actually see it. But Apparently he won the point and I actually asked about him. I asked about it today in the locker room and he said, I said it was like pretty bad and then he said oh, I won the point though. So I don't know. <laughs> we have some fun chats in there, that's for sure. But it's just good to see him obviously competing at his, at his favourite tournament. He's won it before and it's just good to see him back and playing level. He beat me in Stuttgart the other week and he's, and he's, and he's playing some exceptional tennis. So. He is indeed and, and so are you today. It's great to see you back as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Indeed, congratulations, Nick Kyrgios, five-setter over Paul Jeb, 7-5 in that fifth set. The debate, we could have it here as well, the underarm serve. What do you think, Naomi Brody? I'm a fan. We actually saw Andy use one as well yeah, yesterday, yeah, didn't we? Exactly. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's great. It's, it's within the rules, so why not? And, and as we see the players like Medvedev, Nadal, team standing five, six metres back behind the baseline, it's, it's a perfectly good tactic to use to drag them back up. All right, here we go. Naomi was just talking about it, so was Nick. Out there it is. 10, how do you rate this under on serve? We made the box, but it was nearly on the service line, so as we can see, Duckworth had lots of time to catch it. I actually thought Andy was going to go for the body shot. I didn't go straight at the point. <laughs> but, uh... 
I actually liked, and especially Andy was asked about it, of course, in press. Here's a replay of it, is that he had seen that Duckworth had changed his positioning, so he's standing so far back. So he was like, well, tactically, it made a lot of sense for me to hit an underarm yeah, shot. Why wouldn't uh, I? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> if um, if you have the nerve to, to play it and, um, you know, you, you don't feel too self-conscious, because I don't know about you, Naomi, but when I played, I don't think I, I used the, the underarm serve once. No. Um, not because I didn't want to. In fact, I should have, you know, given the number of double faults I hit throughout my career. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I just never had the guts to do it, because I just thought, no, that, that wouldn't be right. I'm a professional tennis player. I cannot throw the underarm serve in. But I should have done. Okay, well, <laughs> we do have Naomi Brody here, here who's joined us today, and you are coaching Asia Muhammad, so I want to see one underarm Arms okay. In Asia this tournament. Okay, maybe, maybe in the mixed doubles with Kokonakis because he'll be used to it, <laughs> yeah, right? He's, right? He's used to playing with Nick, so maybe, maybe that'll be a good time to throw it thank in there. You, thank you for chatting with us today. Thank we you for having me. It. This yeah, has been so much fun. A absolutely. Thank, thank you. you to Naomi. And let's check in now with Olivia and Radzi. What are these guys up to? Check it out. All right, we are in the American Express experience, and what an experience it is. I challenge you yep. to the center court challenge. There's a leaderboard of which I will top. Ooh. Millie, you're going down. 1600, that sounds good. Jake's 1440. So 1440 to get on the leaderboard. On the leaderboard. 1600 to win. I don't think I need to worry about the winning as just much as get on trying it. to beat someone. Me. Okay, so all we have to do is roll balls, hit strawberry. Oh, Andy himself. Beat my high score. Very easy. Got. It's very easy. All right, let's do it. I'm going to pass over fun. the mic. You know what? I'm feeling confident. I'm oh, feeling no confident. Way. Yes, yes. I'm going to commentate and do it. Here we go. We are ready. Good one ball down the lane. Oh, just one. One, one at a time. Andy gives the ball a kiss. I'm going to do the same thing. These are clean balls, by the way. Beautiful smelling. Oh, we are, we've got to wait for a berry and we're going to try and line up the bowl to hit as many berries as possible. What could possibly go wrong? 1600 is the aim. I think we've got to just roll. Oh, that's the join. Okay. A, a slight pregnant, a slight pregnant pause there. Andy's welcoming us. We're talking about a man who knows about victory here at Wimbledon. But can we get victory when it counts? Because this is the big one. The ball boys and ball girls. I wanted to be a ball boy. Me too, who doesn't? I wanted to be a ball girl more than a tennis player. I wanted to then be a court cover when I was in uni. Also didn't happen. Chance for glory now. What score do you reckon you're going to get? 1620. Ooh, strong. She's committed. She's committed. Here we go. And we're off. We want some golden ones. This is actually surprisingly difficult. Okay, we're looking for that golden berry at the back. You get the golden berry, you do very well. Now, I'm not really sure how I'm getting on here. This is a little bit like the Nintendo Wii, but it's on a big scale. You also feel a bit of a burn on the old quads. By the way, you don't get many points for uh, getting a number of strawberries. I think it's about 10 points per strawberry. It's all about the golden straw, apparently. And there's a trophy at the back. Try and time that one. You get the, okay, currently I'm 60 points behind Olivia. I need to get better. How on earth has somebody got 1,600 points? Quadrupled what I've managed so far. I've realized. Okay, all of a sudden it's all golden strawberries. It's gotten serious. And there are umbrellas in the way as well. There's an awful lot going on here. Try and get that trophy at the end. Andy saying great shot. I'm absolutely shattered. I'm not going to lie to you, that was awful. the scores on the doors are <laughs> Olivia, 850, who, who, got, who came first? Was that, was, that wasn't the... What's weird is that I'm out of breath. I'm massively I'm out, of breath. out of breath. All I will say is rolling balls yeah. in a crouched position when you are 75 kilograms of Wolverhampton beef <laughs> does not go down too well. Oh, but. You may not have seen the film you did earlier on. Olivia on that one. It's now one apiece. But I'm not bothered at all. Well, delighted to say I'm joined by the number four seed from Spain, Paula Badosa, through to the second round. You weren't hanging around, uh, Paula. 56 minutes against Luisa Chirico of the USA. 6-2, 6-1. Uh, you must have been playing well today. 
Yeah, um, I'm really happy about the win today. Um, it was a tricky day. It's windy, a uh, tricky match as well. Uh, Luisa, she's she's been a top 100 player. She did big results in the past, so I know she has the level. And, um, and yeah, I'm really happy about the win. I think I played very well for being the first match here and um, I'm through the second round so it's always important um, this kind of wins for me so yeah I'm happy to be in second round. As one of the top seeded players all the rest of the players in the draw are always looking at you I want to beat you I want to get uh, knock you out in the first round are you aware of that and uh, do you like playing with that little bit of pressure? Yeah of course I'm aware of that I can feel that energy as well and uh, it's normal and um, when I play against them um, you see that they play with no nothing to lose and that you play with the pressure but um, I I think it's very new for me all these feelings and uh, I'm learning um, to be a, a top seed and uh, and yeah I'm getting used to it but um, I'm happy that I mean that pressure is a privilege as well so um, I'm really happy on, on the position that I am today and I, I hope I can be, be here for many years. You mentioned that you've been learning you've had a great year though haven't you? you're up to number two in the world earlier on uh, this year your best year so far on tour what's changed? Yeah, I mean, uh, last year was an amazing year for me. Um, I won big tournaments, uh, being on the top 10 the uh, first time. And this year it's a, a learning year for me. And, um, and of course, it's not easy either. Um, you have tough matches. And well, last, last uh, week I had a very tough defeat for me, but I try to learn from this kind of defeats. And uh, I think um, it's a process. And, um, and yeah, I'm feeling well. And, uh, and I hope I can win many matches here. And now you started to play more matches throughout your career on grass. Are you starting to feel more comfortable on this surface? Because being from Spain, I'm guessing you grew up playing on, on clay and slower surfaces. Yeah, that's true. It's been tough for me uh, to adapt my game in grass. Um, I'm trying to serve very well, trying to return. I know the first shots are very important, but in grass anything can happen. So I'm, I'm really aware of every match. And um, I think uh, I, I have to do what, what's in my control. That's serving and fighting. And that's what I'm going to do here. Just finally, obviously it's a few years since we've had full crowds here back at Wimbledon. It was cancelled the year before. Um, how nice is it as a player to be back here at the All England Club in front of full crowds, the sun shining to play at Wimbledon? It's amazing. I mean, it's one of the best tournaments in the world and having the crowd back, it's an amazing feeling. I love to play with the fans. Um, I feel the love from them as well. And I think that makes me that extra uh, motivation uh, that I play on court and it's lovely to have them back. And I think that's, that's a sign that everything is getting back to normal and that's uh, very nice um, to have them back. Thanks, Paolo. Good luck in the next round. Thank you. All right, Neil, I'm here with you. Neil Stubley, the um, head of courts and horticulture here at Wimbledon. Now, actually, one of the most crucial roles, of course, at Wimbledon. You've been here a long time, Neil. How does it feel being here this year at full capacity? Um, it's, it's actually nice to get back to some, some sort of normality. Like you say, this will be my 27th championship, so it's, it's been a... It's been, a, it's been a long journey, but again, it, because it's so variable, it just every year just feels like a new championship. So it's, it, it keeps you in, sort of invigorated and, and on your toes. Now this year is a bit different in that we are playing the middle Sunday. Now a huge component of that is that the courts are still okay on the final day of the championship and in a good condition. How big a task was that for you to manage to give the go-ahead that we can play on middle Sunday? Well, over the years, we do a lot of research on uh, agronomy research on the on the on the courts, the grass, the soils, irrigation, nutrition, how we how we main, maintain and keep the grass in good condition. So, I think just with modern technologies, we kind of become year on year more confident that we that we we aren't reliant on that that middle Sunday rest. Uh, and it just felt that we were kind of at that stage now where we were comfortable that we can do it. There's always that slight risk if it's a really hot championships, the grass will stress out. But again invariably if you if you kind of you know if you look at the odds and everything you're going to get a very sort of relatively up and down championships a little bit of rain a couple of days are hot um, but invariably it's it's quite steady so we're, we're confident that we will uh, we'll get there and and we shouldn't see any difference finals weekend okay that's really exciting to hear look already on day two it looks pretty gray and miserable and yesterday we had that huge downfall, pretty biblical rain for a minute there. What does that mean? What's going through your head when that happens? And what have you kind of, what, what does this mean for the courts? Well, it, to be fair, it, it doesn't affect us once the championship starts. It's, it's more the week leading up to it when it's practice week. We want the players on the grass, we want them practicing, we want them to get used to it and be comfortable on it. 
once the championship starts, you know, it ends up kind of being is, is what it is. And if you get rain delays, that's part of the game. The fortunate thing is now with the roof, we can guarantee the tennis on centre and one. So as part of our pre-agronomy on Sunday, we were looking at the weather forecast and, and just making the final tweaks with, with irrigation stuff. So we just knew what we could, couldn't do. So, you know, we were confident going into yesterday. We knew that invariably would get some good long dry spells and it was just how long the wet would last invariably it's more it's not when it rains because you'll play until it rains and then come off it's it's more important to know when it's going to stop raining so we can preempt it we can we can drop the covers we can get the covers off as almost once the last drop of rain has fallen and get the players back out so then you know invariably we can then watch you know more tennis and everybody's kind of happy it's also part of Wimbledon, isn't it? I mean, the rain is part of the whole thing. Now, your courts are, first of all, a thing of utter beauty, but they are, you know, worldwidely known as just an amazingly iconic symbol of Wimbledon. How does that make you feel? It's all on you. Well, we try not to think about it too much. You kind of, as long as you give 100% and you know, you know, and the team collectively pull in the same way, you know that what you deliver is the best it can be. And, because it's because it's a living surface, you know that the, the weather will have a big part in how it wears. The un, the unknowns and the uncontrollables is the weather and the players and the style. So you never quite know what style of play they're going to have. You never know how long a match is going to last, and you don't know what the weather's going to be. Those three factors can have a massive impact on how the court wears and how the court performs. So again, it's one of those. You know, yesterday we had two big male matches in centre court. Today we'll have two ladies. So they are kind of counteract yeah. the, the wear that's on the court. So by the end of day two, centre and one should be kind of quite similar because they end up having roughly the same amount of matches. So it's again, it's, it's all swings and roundabouts. And are there things you do if you assess the court at the end of the day and think, uh oh, this is going too fast? Do you have lots of tips and tricks up your sleeve to help slow down the wearing away of the grass? Not really, and that's one of the and that's one of the beauties of the sport is that you know year on year the court will wear different. So the player has to adapt. If a player's playing every other day, not only are they having to adapt to the, a new opponent, but they're also having to adapt to the playing surface because that court underfoot will be slightly different. It will be slightly firming up. The grass will start to be wearing out, and it will just mean that the player has to then adjust to the surface as well as the player. So it, again, it's one of those ones where it's always evolving. It's a living surface, and you know, Mother Nature will have its say. Mother Nature will have its say. Also, the animal kingdom could have its say, but. Rufus the hawk does his job. Is he still around, Rufus, or is that a few years ago? Have we got a new one now? And what do you do to keep birds away and creatures from disrupting the turf? Well, year round, we, you know, there's a lot of the time because it's a busy site, things like foxes and stuff tend to stay away because it's, it's too busy. Yeah. And, and certainly during the championships, because it's so busy, they just don't come around but we have things like um, cattle electric fences around certain courts to stop you know sort of foxes and stuff coming on not that it's it's going to hurt them it just it's just a deterrent to keep them away again you know we have rufus we have hawks flying around throughout the year just to sort of you know make sure that when the pigeons are around if they feel like there's a there's a hawk they tend to not be sort of but again you know that's part of nature and you know you work with it and and you kind of work alongside it and it's you know it's just part and parcel of of, of what we do Are there, do you have any funny kind of anecdotes stories tales of things from years gone by that have happened in relation to your courts the grass you know or things you've had to adapt to like tell us something well i guess you know we've we've had a, the mishap in i think it was 2018 where uh, one of our irrigation guys was punching in the numbers for for what he thought was a practice court and it ended up being a match court and there was a mixed doubles going on on court 16 and one of the irrigation heads popped up <laughs> and because he realized after about two seconds that it punched in the wrong number because the head that he wanted to come up Didn't come so up. they had the security guard standing on the irrigation head to stop the water going around okay. Again, you know, it didn't affect play, and it was it was more. I think it I think it got in, I think it was one of the highest um, hits on Twitter that day. I think from the championship. So, you know, we try not to get into the um, into the limelight if we can help it, but unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes we can't help it. Um, and just finally, with the tennis generally, you're a big tennis fan. Who have you got your eye on? Who would you like to see play, win, progress nicely? I. To be fair, I, I just hope that we just see some really good tennis. 
I hope that the courts, we always say that the courts are the canvas, the players do the painting. We, we don't care about the canvas. The canvas sh should be in the background just doing its thing. It's about, the, it's about the matches, it's about the players, it's about the excitement of certain matches. Um, and, and we hope that the grass just sits there in the background looking nice, looking green, but not really being part of the show. Okay. Well, as the rain starts to fall, I'm going to let you go in case you have some calls to make. Thank you so much for talking to us. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. second day on day two then at the All England Club. The fans are really being treated with the weather today. L overlooking Henman Hill where our studio is based, it is packed. There are so many people enjoying that classic British picnic down there watching Centre Court and it's Nadal at the moment, two-time champion here. He hasn't been here, Radzi, since 2019. The fans really are treated. It's kind of you know, if Roger Federer isn't here, Rafa Nadal is. It's one of the legends, and this time we have Nadal here. It's great to have him back, isn't it? Do you know what I was just thinking? For Nadal, this is what Wimbledon is. He's got no memories of COVID Wimbledon. It's always absolutely packed, and that's exactly how it should be. And there's a feeling you get from these guys. It's, just, it's expectation, it's traditional, it's wonderful. And this is, this is why we look forward to it every single year, H. Yeah, it's a great atmosphere around here. I feel like it's much busier than yesterday, actually. You could kind of walk around with ease. Today it is packed. It is back to Wimbledon at its best. They Wimbledon, heard we were going to be full here. Full capacity. Well, we were here yesterday. Did they not hear that? But they didn't, they were, we were going to be here. That's why Henman Hill is absolutely <laughs> jam-packed. It's my first time seeing you today, Radzi. What have you been up to? I have been earning my keep, Rach. So basically doing a lot of interviews, meeting so many of the guys who are pumped to be here at Wimbledon. Me and Olivia Wayne, wonderful presenter, new to the team here. So we had a challenge, which was, who's come the furthest? So we had to ask three people, random people, how far they've come. I had three people, one was from North London, one was from Portsmouth, the other one was from North London. Olivia's first person was from Guam, in Micronesia. So she basically won straight away. And so that's just a flavour of what I've been getting up to, H. Well, I'm going to beat you on a second one because obviously, Ooh. if you come to the championship, Ooh. you have to predict who's going to go the furthest in the run. And I asked Radzi yesterday who he thought may win the men's title. Yes. Do you remember who you said and who's now no. out of the competition? I'm just trying to scratch my, my head. I, I can't quite remember what Berrettini. I said. Berrettini, what uh, happened to him? He, okay, very unfortunately, got COVID. That's the C word we don't like to say. Unfortunately, he tested positive, which means he's had to withdraw from Wimbledon. So one could argue he hasn't n not won, but he also hasn't won. No, there's, there's just no, there's, I've got no recourse in this one. Matteo Berrettini played fantastically well at Queen's. Amazing form. Made the final last year 
and then Italy then went on to beat England that same night and then just thought oh this could be could be his year not to be yeah it's such a shame that we don't get to see the six times Queen champion in action finalist like Razzy just said last year he could have possibly gone one further is playing some great tennis but yeah we've had some great results already out and about Sviontek Iga Sviontek like we mentioned she went through with the six six love at six three over her opponent Jana Fett first up on centre court is that now 36 in a row 36 She's now beaten Venus Williams' record um, in matches undefeated in the open era, which is quite the feat. So, Steffi Graf, do you know roughly how many she was on? You're now testing my knowledge. No, we don't. You are the oracle of all things unbeaten matches, Rachel, which is why I was <laughs> asking you that question. Someone might tell me my <laughs> We're waiting with bated breath. With 36 matches undefeated since it's, February, it's quite the record. It really is. And we were talking yesterday um, off air about the idea of learning the skill to win. And she's undeniably got that and how confident she must be feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's so many great matches on. And one that I also want to draw Radzi's attention to because this is his second pick to win the title. Felix Auger, <laughs> Ali Asim, the Canadian. FAA. Go on, Felix. Do the business, my friend. We believe in you to go all the way. But first, he's got a round one match on court number three to get underway and it's safe to say all the crowd here they are enjoying this one yeah this is an interesting matchup isn't it so we've got felix of Asim, the canadian the sixth seed here he's up against the american maxime cressy who again has been playing really well he's a finalist in eastbourne um, in that match up there and he actually knocked out so many brits on the way to that final uh, taylor fritz was champion there um, but this man the young canadian coached by nadal's uncle uh, he had a great run didn't he at roland garros he took nadal to a fifth set there he's in, also had uh, so the many 16. finals think about all the finals that he's made and hasn't managed to get across the line he's so young he's so athletic and you mentioned about his coach as well if he can get into his brain belief I think we can be looking at a multiple Wimbledon champion there. He's got all the, all the ingredients to do it. Yeah, well, let's stay with this matchup then. It's the third matchup on court three. It's seen some great matches already. Maria Sakkari and Nick Kyrgios are champion so far on that court today. Well, let's stay with this one then. Felix Ojo, Ali Asim and Maxime Cressy. Go on, Felix. <laughs> Feels like he's been around for years, Pete, doesn't he? He's only 21 years of age and he had a glittering junior career. He was one of only seven players to win a challenger title by the age of 16. That's going some. Must have first seen him at the U.S. Open at the age of 14. He was so highly touted. Everyone was raving about this kid Shapovalov, and then people were saying, "Yeah, but then there's Felix. Felix yeah. is even better." He won. He won that year the U.S. Open 2016. He won the boys' singles title. <laughs> Pushed him up to two in the world. So yes, a glittering junior career certainly has uh, evolved nicely. 40 and he's showing us all of his rich variety here, the Canadian. He can serve and stay back with as much effect as he can serve and volleying. He's mixing it up nicely. Just uh, suggesting to Cressy that I'm not going to be giving you the same picture. As athletic as Felix is, he is certainly very strong, very fast. He's a bit mechanical, isn't he, in his technique?
Black for six. You get the feeling if if things go wrong, if 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 he's not feeling it on any given day, that that things could go badly wrong. It's interesting, we spoke about the wind earlier and how generally the, the sort of premise is that the wind is, when it's extreme, it's a great leveller. And I'm wondering whether that might favour Cressy today if it keeps blowing. It's not too much, but... Well, nothing to trouble these guys at the moment anyhow. That's a super ace down the tee from the Canadian to draw level. Two games sold, first set. So because we're totally partisan, Rach, I'm delighted to say that Felix is now levelling that match. I was getting a little bit concerned that there could, be, could have been a potential break of serve. So much tennis action here in Wimbledon. And you mentioned something actually a fantastic stat, Rach, about the champions that are playing right here, right now. Yeah, at the moment we have three former Wimbledon champions playing at the same time, obviously on different courts. You've got <laughs> Rafa Nadal on centre. Here we are on court number one, Simona Halep, and then Petra Kvitova is on court number two as well. So that's, you know, great. There's five singles titles between those three. Obviously, Nadal's got two. You've got Halep as well. She was champion in 2019 against Serena Williams. And uh, then Petra Kvitova, twice a champion here in 11 and 14. And Rachel, while we're off air, you made a really good point, and it was about the fact that a lot of people would focus on coming on final Saturday, on final Sunday. But for you, the best day is a different one. Which one is it? Well, I think it's the beginning of the week because you get to see so much action not on the main show courts. OK, now we're currently on one of the bigger courts, um, on court number one here. But, you know, if you're lucky enough just to get a ground pass, and I say lucky enough because the queue's quite long, so if you haven't got a ticket ahead of time, then it's quite tricky to come to one of the, the best sporting spectacles on the planet. But then you can just wander around. I actually saw a mate of mine earlier, and he's got a ground pass, and he was here with his girlfriend. He said, she's never been. We're going to wander around, soak up the atmosphere, and, and just see some of these great matches. They are only £27, by the way. It is worth pointing out. And I personally, like Rach, think it's one of the best ways to see Wimbledon. Although if you are lucky enough to be on court number one, and you watching Mukova and Halep play, then you'll be absolutely delighted to be watching this match get underway, where it's currently Halep leading three games, four games to three. Service game for Simona Halep. She only lost four points on serve. Halep leads by five games to three. First set. Think of her as a big serve. Round winners keep on coming to speak to us here on Wimbledon Uncovered. Barbora Krachikova has just joined us. For a player as accomplished as yourself, it must always still be nice to be through the first round of a Grand Slam. It's amazing to be first to be through first round, and and I'm really happy with the way how I was playing today because I think I, I had a I had a really tough match. I think my opponent was playing really well, and also I think the conditions were really tricky because it was really windy today. And I have to say that I was serving really well, and I think that was the key. Were you happy as well that you missed the rain that we had yesterday? At least you knew today. It was looking earlier on it might rain, but it's been sunny since then to go out on the court and not have to stop your match. I mean, it's it's always it's always better not to stop match, but I mean, just that's how it is. I mean, sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't. And I mean, it's always very nice when it's sunny here at the, at the Wimbledon because the grass, look, grass looks better. <laughs> In the year or so since you won your first Grand Slam title at Roland Garros last year, what's that last 13 or so months been like for you? Uh, 
very up and down. There, I mean, there are so many things that happened, so many very nice things, so many positive things, so many you know new new people that I met, so many uh, new inspiring uh, moments that I was able to to live through. And also, I mean, there were some negative negative things. I was I was injured. That was that was really one of the I would say most negative thing that that happened to me. But yeah, I mean, now I'm here. Now I'm finally healthy, I, I feel good and I mean, f yeah, last year was amazing, but let's let's live through right now. <laughs> I was going to ask about the injury because it was an elbow problem, was it? Are you, are you back now fully yes. fit? You yes. feel good? 100% fit, finally. I'm really happy with that and I want to keep it this way. You've won a doubles title here at Wimbledon though, so you have plenty of success uh, on the grass. How did you find, um, you know, success in doubles on grass can translate and help you in the singles? Uh, I think for sure it can help me because I mean doubles is a is a different competition. The the the, the game the game and the game style everything is totally different. So, but I think it's it's helping. I mean I surf a lot there. I, I return. I think it's really good to surf and return on the grass because that's the two most important shots on the grass. So I'm sure it's it's helping, and I'm looking forward to 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 keep playing in both categories. Just finally, a lot of people are looking forward to your second round match. You're playing Victoria Golovic, who has been around on tour for a long, long time. You've played against her, I'm sure, in the past, and she got to the to the quarters here last year. Are you looking forward to that one, testing yourself against her? I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm I'm just really looking forward to play matches and to you know to stay healthy and I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a great match against Victoria and yeah as you said we, we know each other for for a very very long time and we we played a couple of matches against each other so I'm, I'm really looking forward for that. Thanks for speaking to us and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. No matter how small, how tiny, or how minute, the technicalities, the particulars, the seemingly insignificant. At Wimbledon, these details matter. And this year with Oppo, we'll capture the detail like never before. In low light and high intensity. Because when you take care of the detail, the rest takes care of itself. Greatness. It's all in the detail. Well, Radzi, we're going to join court two where we didn't possibly predict what's unravelling at the moment. Petra Kovita is a set down 6 2 to Jasmine Paolini of Italy. Um, we were just saying what good form she has been in coming into this. She was the Eastbourne champion only last week, defeating Elena Ostapenko there. She's obviously twice a champion here at Wimbledon. OK, she, she hasn't been past the fourth round since her title in 2014, but she looked in fine form coming into this. Obviously, she's had so many well-documented problems over the last few years, but this isn't what we expected. No, she isn't. And it's, in fact, as, as I was walking my way to the studio from uh, the, some of the back courts, I like to be early, Rach, you know that, punctual as always. So I was walking a little bit earlier and I happened to see her walk past us. And it, you get a bit of appreciation for just how tall she is, sort of a Serena Williams frame. And you suddenly realize just how physical the game is in all aspects, whether it's the men's, the women's, and she's such a powerful player. If you know what time we were meant to be on air, that was uh, 31 minutes ago. This match has been in progress 32 minutes. That shows how punctual Radzi was at getting to our studio consistent, position Consistent, Rach. Always consistent. But it's taken half an hour then for that first set at the moment. So we'll keep bringing you up to speed on this. But uh, yeah, not going Petra Kvitova's way at the moment. Let's see if she can bounce back in the second set. Fifteen thirty. Thirty. 
Teal. The palm of the hand just a little too open, flat through the ball, rather than getting the front edge of the racket up and around. couldn't it? 30, a feeling 40. if Kvitova can get the early break in the second, then the momentum could really swing her way. Let us. Paolini scrambling and surviving. Yes. She understands herself as a tennis player so much better now. Even off this shot, making sure she gets the racket head up the back to get the depth. There's another chance for the two-time champion. And Varej Kvitova. She takes it for the second time of asking. Kvitova has the early break in the second. First game, second set. Well, Kvitova then fighting back in that second set against Paolini, the Italian player who took that first set. Well, Petra Kvitova, like we mentioned, she's been coming here in great form, so we're hopeful for her that she can bounce back in her first round matchup. But Renee Stubbs caught up with her ahead of the tournament. Well, hi, Petra well, hi, Kvitova. Petra Kvitova former champion here, of course. Welcome back. Um, what makes you the happiest being back here? I just, I just actually came in, uh, walk uh, straight here to the centre court, so it's the best probably welcome what I ever had, uh, even before, so it's beautiful to sit with you here. Um, you know, having um, centre court in our bag, and uh, it's a beautiful feeling to be back. So, obviously, the last three years has been quite interesting for everybody around the world with the pandemic, and including Wimbledon, where we haven't had full crowd for a long time. But this year, all the crowd are back. What does that mean for you? It's the best. I think it's the best news what we can have for like, everybody. Um, hopefully, everything will be settled down again and we'll have a normal life and uh, enjoy the full crowd. Um, I don't know, you know. I enjoyed it even last year, but it was still, you know, bubble and it wasn't the, the best what I always had to before that we could have a house again and, yeah. you know, be more like a home. So, of course, your form coming in here, quite good. You just won the lead-up tournament in Eastbourne, um, so we know how well you play here at Wimbledon. Um, how would you assess how you're feeling? <laughs> well, I feel a little bit tired right now. No, the draw can, can come and it can be a really tough one or, you know, you don't have a good day and then that's how it is. So, but um, yeah, I mean, I already have a two titles from here. I'm already very, very happy with, with everything, what, I, what I've done here, but I'm really looking forward for the, this year again. So Petra, one of the reasons we're sitting here today is uh, in front of this beautiful, magnificent court is it's its 100th year anniversary. Can you tell me that um, first moment where the center court was a reality to you, whether it be on television or in person? It was in a TV, of course. Uh, my dad showed me a lot of you know, shots of Martina Navratilova when she was playing here, winning here. Yep. I do remember when she took a, a grass as well and, and ate it. Um, so it's, it's um, uh, that's, 
what I do remember like from the TV as a kid. But of course, the, the best memories I have by my own, right? So um, they are they I'll never forget. What is it about it? And because it's hard for people to understand and describe it. What is so unique about this particular court to you? Well, uh, the particular thing is definitely the grass, of course. Uh, all the tradition Wimbledon still has, uh, especially the center court with the Royal Box. You know, all the people, very VIP people are sitting there. Um, I do remember my final in 2011, Martina was there crying. Um, <laughs> So it, this is very, very special, like overall, I mean, how historical the court is. Actually, that's interesting. I haven't really asked this question to anybody, but do you look up to the Royal Box to see who's sitting there before you start the match? <laughs> no, actually, when I started, uh, you know, when we are returning, you see it a little bit. So I knew that Martina is there because it was full of Royal Box. But of course, the main thing I, I found was when I won and then I had an interview. So I looked to her, especially, like, Especially, so that's what I, well, how I saw that she is crying. If there was a sporting place where I could put a tennis court that's not a tennis stadium, where would that be for you? Well, I'm pretty big fan of the soccer club in Prague, uh, Slavia Praha, which it's already grass, so it would be very easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to use a mower though and get the groundskeepers from Wimbledon to head over there. Um, we probably could guess what moment on this court is the moment that inspired people in the Czech Republic. Um, but what do you feel is an inspirational moment for you on this court for others that you achieved? That's up to them probably the question, but um, I think uh, the tennis is very popular in Czech, not only because of me, but uh, because of many of us who are playing uh, really great. Um, I think that for those who watched Wimbledon, it's probably the me who is like really uh, turning up. Um, and I hope it will be against Maria because it was great final, especially for me, for Czech. I was the outsider of the of the match, and I just I just won it somehow. So I think that was probably the the thing. We have spoken to a lot of players about the uniqueness of um, the court and the fans on center court. Is there something that you can really tap into and go, oh yeah, that only happens here? I know exactly what is it. It is the silence. Before I'm just, you know, bouncing the ball before the serve, I can hear it. So this is a really funny moment because uh, you can't have it anywhere else. It's just so silent and the people are so respectful to both players. They're supporting great tennis and that's, I think, it's, it's very good. It's amazing that you said that because that's actually a couple of other players have said the exact same thing. So across the street in the parklands across here, Wimbledon are making a concerted effort to expand Wimbledon. So now qualifying is going to be over there, more practice courts. Um, how inspiring is that, that Wimbledon is making an effort to really grow this event even more? No, I think it's great. I mean, I'm pretty sad for the, for the players who are qualifying somewhere else. <laughs> it's really weird to have a two events kind of yeah. for the same one. Um, so I'm very happy for it. Of course, I know Wimbledon people had so many issues to, you know, start to build just across the street. And yeah. I know how expensive it was and kind of, you know, work they had to put it in. So I'm really glad for them that they made it. Um, you know, they are going for it and it will be just amazing. Okay, inspiring moments that we've talked about with the locals, you know, sort of what inspires them. Uh, growing up, might be seeing their kids ride a bike for the first time or whatever it is. Um, is there one moment in your life where you felt um, t totally inspired, just in life, it doesn't have to be tennis at all? Wow, well, for sure I did, many times, of course. Uh, I always inspire people who never give up, who always in the tough situation in life came stronger. So I think maybe I even took it, <laughs> this inspiration from them and that always something very special in the life, not in the sport overall, but you know, uh, in the life it's tough situations and I think that's this very inspiration. Uh, last question, um, sometimes the members wear the badges, you know, do you keep your little badge somewhere in particular? Well, I didn't really wear it yet, uh, overall in those years, so uh, my moment will come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Petra, it's always a, a delight to have you here. Um, you know how much everyone loves you, uh, not only on tour, but of course in the stands, and I'm sure they'll be fully behind you. And hopefully maybe we'll see you here holding up that trophy that you've already held twice before. So good luck over the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Well, it's always so great, isn't it, to get some time with former champions here just to get their thoughts ahead of their opening round and Kvitova now has broken Paulini in her first 
round match up there. So it was Paulini 6-2 in the first set and now it's 2-1 to Kvitova in the second. The Kvitova is serving, but we can just have a little look at how beautiful it is down at the All England Club. That's centre court at the moment. Nadal is on there, of course, with Serendello is the uh, his opponent, the Argentinian, 127th ranked, up against this, the second seed. Nadal, again, it was a little bit of, is he going to be fit enough? He didn't really play much coming into this. A couple of matches at the Hurling Club beforehand, but it's a bit unlike Nadal, isn't it, Radzi? Well, the thing is with Nadal, he's one big question mark. The guy could turn up and go out in the first round, or he could go on and do the calendar slam. I mean, and it's plausible. I'd go as far as to say it's probable. And if it were it to happen, it would be a fairy tale. That man, what an ambassador for the sport, the greatest of all time. He was crowned after the exploits in Melbourne. That was an incredible tour. If he were to do it here, I mean, that will live long in the memory of a court, by the way, that's celebrating its centenary year on Church Road. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? To see him back, and I think loads of fans, he'll have lots of Nadal fans. That's the beauty of having all the fans back here as well. They all come out in full force to support their heroes. So I'm sure he'll have plenty of them that will be after a glimpse of this man in the flesh before he retires, whenever that may be. Again, there's so many of these players that are, you know, getting on in their careers and we don't know when they'll bow out. And also, when it comes to, we are talking about the return of the 90s. I'm currently wearing some sunglasses that our researcher, AP, Sean, is a massive fan of. Nadal's had his cap backwards since before the 90s and it's still in fashion. It's not a comeback, Rach. That man is a staple in the fashion iconology of Wimbledon. That for so. You just sense this is a very important game here. <laughs> After the opportunities Serendula had in the last game. Yeah, love 15, that was a, a poor miss. You don't expect to say that about Nadal's forehand. that gave him the chance to power away that forehand. He certainly has been aggressive on that forehand side all afternoon. That ball kept low, but it also held up in the wind, so he was having to reach and stretch for it.
fabulous hitting. Juice. Corner to corner, you're seeing the Dar really using that open stance backhand. Just again using the power from the court. He's naturally right handed, so really getting the right hand into that backhand. 40 15 back to Deuce. Serendolo's got to stay strong on his serve here. waiting for it but he still couldn't get it back yeah we've talked about the power on the serendolo forehand but this time on the backhand cuts down the angle steps in and just rips the backhand Serendolo's first backhand winner of the match. But what a shot it was. Yes. Was he almost guilty there of trying to end that rally too early? I think against most players, yes, but against Nadal, no. If any time he's got the opportunity to unload on his forehand, we've seen how effective it is, he should go for it. Again, he's not going to have an impact in this match if he plays conservatively. He's got to be aggressive. of hitting from both players. It's not only the quality of the hitting, it's the and movement, it. it's the balance, that it's out. changing direction with not only the ball but their bodies. As you say, a shame to finish with an unforced error, but Serendolo was up 40-15 in this game. Now Nadal has break point to be up a set and a break. You can continue watching that fascinating tussle between the greatest of all time and one of Argentina's finest on all major broadcasters. And Rach, the big question is, of all the people here, these sunglasses, yay or nay, Rach? Is it a yay or nay for you? By the way, I never know what Rads is going to throw at me, FYI, if I look confused. <laughs> That's why. Because I don't know what's coming. Never heard of a um, script. Nay. It's a nay for you. What do we reckon at home? Please get in touch. Use the hashtag. Rachel's wrong on the sunglasses, and then you can make a decision about and give you a full look. Flinging them over there is they what I'd like to do. 90s really is making a comeback here, although what is also making a comeback here is the sun. It's absolutely glorious here. And Rachel, at the very heart of the stuff we're watching here, people care about sustainability. Yeah, they do, of course. That's a, a massive theme that's running through Wimbledon this year, and it has done for years gone by now. And this was what actually I was greeted to on day one yesterday when you I went love to. You love an Earl Grey, don't you, Rachel? When I went to ask for a coffee, um, they gave us these mugs, which I think is great because 
you obviously can take them home and keep them for the fortnight um, and just keep reusing them, which is important because you can see how many people come here. 15,000 alone in centre court. So it's, you know, you'd go through a lot of these every day if everyone wanted a coffee or a tea while they're, they're here. But yeah, that's super important, of course, isn't it, Radzi? And the refillable water stations that are dotted around the place as well. Absolutely right. And they say here that if you don't use, reuse them, you're a mug. That's one of the policies they've got here, one of the catchphrases, one of the monikers, if you will. Simon behind the camera, love that punish, by the way. But in all seriousness, Re Olivia Wayne, who's new to our team, has been catching up with one of the people at the very heart of all things sustainability here in Wimbledon. OK, I'm here with Hattie Park, who is the Green Queen of Wimbledon. Yes, she is the sustainability manager. Now, what does that mean to a layperson? So that is all about driving us forward towards our environment positive goal. How can we ultimately give back more than we take from the environment, you know, take action to address climate change, resource depletion, biodiversity loss, and really involve everyone who comes to Wimbledon so that they can have an environment positive day out. Okay, so you've brought us to this particular spot on the hill. Why is that? I really wanted you to enjoy and see the living wall, which is right behind me here. Um, one of our, we present tennis in an English garden. One of our aims is to have a to improve biodiversity, help nature. This wall, which arrived in 2019, is deliberately planted with flowering plants to encourage pollinators. Those are great for biodiversity. We need loads of bugs and creepy crawlies. And it's an amazing, beautiful backdrop for people to enjoy uh, the tennis from as well. It's really stunning. There's lots of water feet. Like, it's a very tranquil garden, as you say here. But that adds something really positive. So in terms of food and uh, all the kind of paraphernalia associated, what do Wimbledon offer? Yeah, and, and there's a lot. I mean, this is, this is a really large event. Um, our menus, we really pride ourselves on sourcing seasonal British produce and this year we're indicating on the menus where there are low carbon options as well. Um, we want people to have that choice if, if they're interested. Um, so, yeah, and there's the strawberry available with plant-based cream as well. <laughs> Uh, the, there's a lot less plastic in the food packaging, the, card, the strawberries come in a card container, um, the, all of the drinks are in a reusable cup. We really want people to return their cups to us so we can use them again and again year after year. Really try and encourage a culture of reuse. And even uh, water fountains on site available to fill up bottles. Yeah. Um, the ice cream? Can you get vegan ice cream? You can even get vegan ice cream yes. and it's really delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what else? There's been a lot more kind of structural change around Wimbledon in the last year, two years. What else yeah. could, have you kind of done in a kind of green capacity? Yeah, well, we're really thinking about how we regenerate our site for the future. So a lot of that, there are things that you can't see behind the scenes. You know, we buy renewable electricity. You can't see that necessarily. We have a new building this year that the Hawkeye team sit in. Uh, and that has been built in such a way that it can be deliberately dismantled, lifted, moved, retaining the resources that were used in its construction to use again. That's this, this kind of principle of the circular economy, keeping things in use. So all of our new buildings, we're really looking at how we can integrate those and low carbon design principles. You're real leaders in this and it kind of all big sporting venues need to take note of what you're doing. Now, there are a lot of kind of things that the players use and then don't have any need for after the event, i.e. their racket strings. Yeah. What have you done with those? Well, that's, it's great to talk about that. We collected racket strings that the players, uh, the stringers um, had they'd taken from the rackets last year. Uh, we've ground them up, heated them, worked with another guy. I haven't done that myself. <laughs> Send them away. Uh, and they've been mixed with other waste plastic. They've come back on site in the form of a countertop on a couple of ticket desks. So we've got them back to be used again. Something useful, mm. um, you know, that we can use again and again. And hopefully we're collecting them again this yeah, year. So we'll be producing more things for next year. Okay, and finally, if you don't know, there's a place for bugs to have a, a respite and relaxation in Wimbledon, a bug hotel of sorts. What's that about? Yeah, indeed, we have a centre court inspired bug hotel, which is in, in the queue. So as you're walking down the queue, you can see it as you come by. Um, we're waiting for lots and more bugs to move in, come along with their little suitcases and settle down and start munching it all up.
And what will that do? As you said, oh, you need lots of yeah. bugs. Again, that's just about helping nature to thrive, you know, thinking about all the, the bugs do so much for the soils for, as, you know, creating habitats as food for the ecosystem. So the more we can do, uh, you know, for every little creature, the better. <laughs> well, thank you, Hattie. It's brilliant to hear what Wimbledon's doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wimbledon really does stand for so many things and quality is one, food, PIMS, tennis obviously, but sustainability really is at the heart of a lot of what we do here. And in terms of future starts when it comes to British players, none personifies that more so really than the man we just saw there who played so fantastically well, actually in Queen's last year. He's a tall lad, he's a strong lad, he's growing. I think he's about 21 years old, Rach. Yeah, 20 years old, and it kind of shows the depth of, I guess, tennis in this country because he's the fourth-ranked Briton here at the championship. And yeah, you mentioned, didn't you, uh, his performances at Queen's, um, and this year alone he's won four Challenger titles, so really kind of establi establishing himself on the scene here. And do you remember last year? He was the guy that took that first set off Novak Djokovic on, right. on centre court. And obviously Novak Djokovic yes. lost his first uh, set here yesterday yes. as well. So that's a running, running theme with Djokovic on centre, isn't it? And talking about last year, I interviewed him uh, during his run at Queen's. He wasn't surprised. I think you can tell a lot by how somebody responds to questions. And he was sort of quietly confident, but he wasn't surprised at his performance. And again, against Djokovic, he wasn't shocked after that first set. And yes, he went on to lose that match, but he did not fall apart by any stretch of the imagination. So we know the fortitude is absolutely there. And what a bright future that young man has. Yeah, it's great to see him coming out um, here at Wimbledon. And, you know, he's against Bergs here, who is obviously trying to go into the second round. And this week as well marks his top 100 debut. That was last week, I believe. So he's now in the top 100 for the first time in his career. So let's see how far Jack Draper can go. It looks like he's having a good shot of making it into the second round as it stands. 14. Well, that was serve, isn't he? First serve percentage just missed the one first serve in this third set. Five out of six. Yeah. Game over. Hold of serve to love. Draper. For Jack Draper. And having to fight his way from behind that love 30 deficit. In the blink of an eye, Zizou Bergs finds himself serving again. Well, back then over to court one. And Simona Hallett, we were talking about her a little bit earlier. Champion here in 2019. Taken the first at 6-3, now the second, and she's currently leading 5-2. But again, Radzi, this is quite an entertaining match that everyone's being treated to. First round of the ladies singles on court one. Yeah, we just saw a touch of class there, sort of cross drop shot. And we're seeing all sorts of, actually, I'm going to be totally honest, it's why I prefer to watch women play than men, because I think you see a lot more variety of shot, you see a lot more uh, delicate shots. I love watching men play, obviously, but if you gave me a choice which final I'd go to, which day I'd turn up to, it would be the Time. Tuesday because of the women's matches. Yeah, there's such strength and depth in the women's side of the draw. You never really can, and can pick an outright winner. You have to just watch how it unfolds. And a lot of, I guess, the women, they play themselves into match fitness. We saw that from Ash Barty last year. Didn't come out and play her best game till the end of the tournament. She, of course, won the entire thing and is now retired, bowed out this year, which was really unexpected for most of, I guess, the tennis community and fans around the world. But that does just mean that it's even more open this year. And, you know, anyone at this stage can obviously go on to win it. We're so early in the competition. This is the first round matchup for these two women. But it just shows, doesn't it? I guess, you know, if you are in form at the right time, the door is open at the moment. It really is open, especially on the women's side. Um, I mean, you mentioned Ash Barty. You know, you coined the phrase, Rach, there ain't no party like an Ashley Barty. I remember it very well last year. 
But when it's wide open now, you've got the likes of Coco Goff. How far can she go? A teenager still. 18 years of age, what a talent she is. Made it to the final of the French. You know, Serena Williams with her comeback. It's so, so exciting. And you've got the likes of Anne Jabeur, who's in fantastic form. We mentioned Eager at the very top of our coverage here. So this is a tough one to call. And how the bookies manage it is beyond me. Very impressive. Match points. It's just away, yeah, and it's a length seven, return eight, to get two, the job done again. Two, what a, a performance three, six, of, of efficiency, power, accuracy. Great start. Simona Halep, former champion here, defeating Serena Williams. You remember that, 6-2, six, 6-2. Two, six, two. A really fine fettle. And that is a statement match for Simona Halep, already in the first round, is looking very dialed in. She served well, returned extremely well. And being a former top 20 player, with ease, very straightforward. Mukova will, will gain from the match. She'll gain from every match because she's been injured. Thoroughly enjoyed watching her play. Uh, one of the uh, sweetest all-rounders on the circuit, uh, not really able to give her best uh, today, but she will be perhaps later on this year. Simona Halep advances to play for Lee or Flipkins. Okay. And Simona Halep advances to the uh, second round. 6 3, 6 2, just over an hour played, very efficient on court one. Let's get her thoughts now, the 16th seed and former champion with Rishi Passat. Simona, congratulations. Your 10th appearance at Wimbledon, but your first since 2019. How good did it feel to be back? Well, it feels great to be back. Um, I have great memories uh, from 2019, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come here in Wimbledon and to play. I'm really happy that I could win this match. It was very difficult. She's a very tough opponent. She's playing great. So uh, it was uh, pretty emotional before this match, but now I want to enjoy it. I'm really happy about it. It's a terrific performance today, great way to start, but obviously we've all learnt and read in the last couple of years, things have been tough for you, but you've spoken about reigniting your passion, that drive to get back to the top. How close are you to the player who won in 2019? Yeah, I've been struggling a lot the uh, last few years, uh, many injuries, no confidence, uh, everything that happened in the world, so it was not easy to handle. But thanks to my coach, Patrick, because uh, he brought uh, this fire back. And now I love tennis again. I love being on court. I love uh, playing and I love working, which is not very, <laughs> very easy. <laughs> well, many congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, Simona Halep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, flags waving, national pride there, and you just hear what it means. Regardless of how many times you win at Wimbledon, each one is special. And obviously the final will take place on centre court, which will make it extra special. Winning at Wimbledon in the centenary year. I mean, what, what an accolade to tell the grandchildren about, Rach.
Yeah, great. And, you know, it was quite a, an easy, quick victory, like right, the encore yeah. interviewer just said. 6-3, six, 6-2 six, in an hour and six minutes there over... Carolina Mukova. So, uh, you know, it's always quick. It's always nice sorry, to get these quick matches out the way, just building, not wasting too much energy in these early rounds of the competition. And I mentioned centre court. Currently, Nadal's playing there. You would expect, or it wouldn't surprise you, to see him go five sets on virtually all of his matches. And I wonder how much that takes out of your body physiologically versus what we just saw there. 66 minutes, very, very easy work. Get yourself a nice ice bath and it's on to the next one. Yeah, exactly. I don't think he wants to spend that much time on these courts in the opening rounds of this tournament. Well, Simona Halep then, former champion here, she goes through to round two pretty safely. And Renee Stubbs caught up with her ahead of the tournament starting. Hi, Simona. Welcome back. Um, I guess the first question is, how nice is it for you to be back here this year? Well, uh, it's great to be back um, here in Wimbledon and to be healthy because uh, last time I couldn't play, I was injured, so I was really, really sorry about myself because I had the chance to open the tournament, but I lost it. Uh, but I'm really happy to be back here and to be ready to, to play. Yeah, it's been a tough uh, three years really for a lot of people with the pandemic, etc. And how nice will it be that you get to actually come back here and experience it with full crowd again? Yeah, it's amazing to have the crowd back. Uh, it was really tough uh, the pandemic period with the bubbles and uh, nobody in the stands. So it was a challenge, big challenge for everybody. I felt it, but uh, we went over it. So this is the most important thing. And now we have just to enjoy the crowd, to enjoy the energy and uh, to give our best. How do you feel about coming into this year with your form and with your play? Well, um, I struggled this year, um, I must say, because it's the truth. And um, but I found the pleasure to play tennis again. I am happy on court, uh, of course. Probably I don't do what I wanted to, to do. I didn't do what I wanted to do during the year, but every day is a new challenge. So I'm going to fight, I'm going to stay there, and I'm going to give my best to, to touch the highest level that I can. So this year, it's the 100th anniversary of Senna Court. Um, can you remember your first memory of Centre Court, whether it be on television or in general? Oh, well, yeah, on television I watched a lot and uh, I always dreamed to, to be able to play on this court, to have the chance. Uh, and honestly, I don't remember my first match on the Centre Court, but uh, I remember uh, my last match on the Centre Court, <laughs> three years ago, the yeah. final. So, uh, yeah, I have great memories. The court is super elegant, super... Uh, like uh, you see all the people super well dressed and uh, everyone is like um, quiet. You feel the tension, you feel the pressure, but in the same time you feel the, uh, you know, the, the, the way that the tournament is the most prestigious. So you feel the people that they are really loving tennis. Yeah, that was my next question to you. What's the most unique thing about this particular center court? I think the crowd, um, how it's made, the court and uh, actually the people because um, they are like into tennis so much and they respect everything. They are super quiet, but they are super fair as well. So it's uh, an amazing atmosphere when you play on center court. I played a few matches and uh, I, had, I was lucky because I had such a nice atmosphere that I cannot, never, I can, I cannot ever forget it. So take me back to that last match, uh, because it is the last time you played on what we consider the, the mecca of tennis, really. That last match, that moment you walk onto the court to play a final, you hear the crowd. Take me through that a little bit. Well, when I left the locker room, I was uh, actually when I woke up in the morning, I felt the pressure of everything. But I said I have nothing to lose. It's um, the biggest match of my career to play a final of Wimbledon. Never dreamed for it because I never thought I'm able to play a final uh, on grass. And I was facing Serena, so it was uh, everything on my shoulders. But in the same time, I said I have nothing to lose. So when I came in the courts, I just warmed up a little bit. I felt good. I felt chilled. And uh, then going to the court, I felt the pressure again. Um, I had her next to me, so I felt even more the pressure. But when I entered the court, I saw people. I saw that they were looking forward for this match. Uh, I had my family, I had my team, so the Royal Box, which was full, and uh, it was like uh, super emotional for me. Uh, but I calmed down and I said, now I have just to do what I do the best. So to play tennis and I just enjoyed. And I could see that I could play the perfect match. Do you think there are moments as a kid where you're inspired by seeing something? 
How many people in Romania do you think you inspired by winning that, that match? I think many kids uh, because uh, we never, uh, we were not growing up with this dream to play deep in Wimbledon to be able to win the, the tournament. And um, as I saw when I arrived home, many people came to see me and to celebrate with me the title. Uh, so I, I think I, uh, yeah, I, I gave to the, to the kids a lot of uh, hope for the future. So I get to give you a free ticket. So there's been many great matches on Centre Court at Wimbledon. So if I could give you a ticket to sit on Centre Court to watch which match over the last hundred years would you choose that you weren't involved in? Well, yeah, of course. Um, well, uh, I think the most uh, impressive match was uh, Djokovic with Federer, when uh, Federer had two match balls. Yeah, that one. I watched it on TV, uh, but yeah, that was very impressive for me. Now, as a, as a member now, you can get tickets in there. And I wanted to say, but <laughs> now I have my seat there because uh, when I, before actually, when I came to, to, the, to this tournament in 2019, I came two weeks before uh, and I met all the people from the locker room. I used to go down because I didn't want to go there. I felt like uh, a little bit shy uh, and I said, no, I'm not going there. And all the people from there, they said like, you can, you have to come here. We have a little bit of champagne. You have the bath so you can enjoy more. So I said, okay. And uh, they said like, you have to be a member of this club, but you have to win it. And I said, well, well now the, big, the biggest challenge is to be the member of the tournament, not to win the title. <laughs> and it was super nice, the story. So I felt super good with them. So across the street, the Parklands, where a lot of people would queue to get into Wimbledon, uh, is now uh, being turned around. They're going to have qualifying over there. They're going to have extra practice courts. How inspiring is that, that Wimbledon has really grown the tournament even more? How, how, how great is well, that going to be for the young kids too? Well, it will be great and uh, they are improving also for us, it's great and uh, they are improving every year. Uh, it's, it's beautiful to come here, everything is about Wimbledon, is super nice. So I'm super happy and thankful that uh, I have another chance to play this year and hopefully many more years ahead. Uh, it's always a pleasure and for sure when I will be done with tennis I will come here because now I have the possibility. <laughs>
in their dress code wandering around the grounds. I mean, so many people, Radzi, do really take the Wimbledon dress code to the extremes in terms of dressing up and, and trying to catch the likes of our attention to actually go, go and get spoken to. And I don't know why they want our attention because we are not exactly bastions of fashion. However, the effort, like you say, that go, they go to, it's amazing. That's part of the whole Wimbledon vibe. And it's at this kind of time now that the whole complexion of Wimbledon just changes. A different energy arrives, the resale tickets. So where we're sat here, behind us here, about 30 meters behind the camera, the resale ticket queue starts. Now the resale ticket office is about 10 meters to your left, and then it stretches the queue beyond farther than we can see, because everybody just wants a piece of the Wimbledon action. And so they're discounted, Rach, and then you explain to me that money actually goes to charity. Yeah, so what happens with the ticket resale queue is if anyone has finished with their ticket from mainly the big show courts, they can go and hand them back in and then they get resold. So anyone in the queue can get a chance to go back onto court one, centre, two or three, of course. And then the money that they um, pay for them goes directly to charity to help some of the Wimbledon Foundation charities, of which there are so many. And we bring you up to speed with a couple of them throughout the fortnight as well so you can see exactly where that money is going to. But it is great, so people can get to go in into centre later on and maybe see Serena Williams take on Harmony Tan. That's the last matchup on centre court today. And just to kind of touch on what you said, and thank you for the explanation, is that we spoke about women's sustainability, but there's also that, if you like, the, the charitable endeavour as well. So many foundations that benefit, especially in this area, whether it is supporting tennis, supporting fitness, or supporting people, as we saw throughout the whole COVID pandemic, of feeding people with a lot of the food that didn't go to wastage whatsoever. But I mentioned to you earlier on, Rach, one of my favourites to go all the way to the final and win is Felix Auger, alias Seema Seed coming into this, or well, he took the first set with all of his athleticism and it's looking like he's performing well in the second set he won his service game love the team. although he's now leading this one 15 love excellent poise and balance around that forehand return That's a great jump. That's a terrific point all around. Oji Aliasim did really well to ask such a difficult question. You haven't been told what you just know now. Yeah, yeah. really going to be interesting right now to see how Maxim Cressy kind of responds. He's, he's, he's pressed the reset button nicely after the loss of that wounding first set. Still landing a lot of first serves in. There's an uber angle right there from Cressy. That was just delicious. One game all, second set.
Well, now we're going to head over to court number one for the fourth match of the day, where Stefanov sits past the fourth seed from Greece, takes on Switzerland's Alexander Richard. Stefanov sits past to serve. Very Well, I think we know what Sitsipas is going to do. He's going to do what he normally does, and that's be aggressive from the baseline, get to the net when he can. But Rishan, well, it's new territory for him. Since the past, hasn't actually won a match at Wimbledon now for four years. The last two times he played in 2019 and last year, he lost in the first round to Thomas Fabiano and Francis Tiafo, respectively. Yes, it set up nicely for him, but he deserved the luck. Terrific movement from Camno. So impressive. It's really nice variation. Power and then the touch and then the winner. Small target, but he found it. What a wonderful pass. It will be a second time break of the day. What a shot from Ramos Vinulas. Able to get himself behind the ball there. Executed drop shot. It's an entertaining player to watch because of the variety in her game. And we've just saw it there. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that 
is a ridiculous shot. How the heck did he get that? Let alone hit that shot. Look at this. It's just raw Spanish speed. And then the racket went off. Showreel for the end of the first day. That was lovely. Oh, what a stroke! That is absolutely exquisite. 15, 13. Nicely struck. What a way to put down your first love hold. Oh, that's exceptional. Not just the pass, but the work he put in to stay in the point. Great industry. Great agility from Harrison. That is a beauty. No matter how small, how tiny, or how minute, the technicalities, the particulars, the seemingly insignificant. At Wimbledon, these details matter. And this year with Oppo, we'll capture the detail like never before. In low light and high intensity. Because when you take care of the detail, the rest takes care of itself. Greatness. It's all in the detail. Now, if you go walking through Wimbledon, one of the brands you will see absolutely everywhere, at the very height of fashion, the most luxurious on the market, is Ralph Lauren. And here is the store right here. They've been kitting out the line judges and the umpires in this glorious outfit here. We've got Eddie here, and I'm going to talk you through what he is wearing, whether it's the trainers, the socks, the trousers, the shirt, the blazer, the tie, or the fact that he is like uh, a siren to the sailors with his intoxicating beauty that he presents us there. Never speaks, just lures people in with his looks. Some people do that naturally, and other people put a little bit more effort in trying to do that with their attire. Olivia, how is it up there on the umpire's chair? I gotta tell you, I think I found my place in life. <laughs> I am living the dream. I'm in the sun basking. I like being high up, you know, looking down on, you know, everyone. And that smell of pizza cooking. Oh, I'm just living the dream up here. So Olivia, I've just served a shot. You've called it out. I'm going Hawkeye. Mm. We're waiting for the update. And then, how do you update us, please? In. <laughs> what happens if I go, umpire, what are you talking about? I'm so sorry, it's in. No, actually, I'd just be like, sit down, shut up, be a good loser. Not like Olivia, who was a really bad loser earlier. When she says that, that's actually not her acting. That's just how she is, really. Olivia showing her officious <laughs> side there Hello. with Radzi. Adam and Nick have taken back over here on Wimbledon Uncovered. Pleasure to be with you as we head uh, towards the evening here on day two of the championships. These are live pictures from court number two. Uh, this has been an interesting match so far. It has not sure has. been plain sailing, shall we no. say, at all for the number 25 seed, a former Wimbledon champion, Petra Kvitova. She lost the first set. Thank you. 
against Paolini, the lady in your picture there. 6-2, produced a brilliant performance. Then Kvitova fought back, took the second set 6-4, and it's been a bit more plain sailing in the third. She leads 4-1. Uh, Shall we join the commentators, shall we? Uh, with the left-hander Kvitova uh, serving at 4-1, as I said, in that third set. Love that was the wind, it all of a sudden picked up. Oh, you could hear it from the microphones, couldn't you? I do have a lapse in focus at the beginning of her last service game. Just want to do that again here. herself into that point. Internal. by quite some way, over a metre beyond the service line. And trying to stay in the moment, it can be so frustrating. I feel like you're closing in on the victory and then your game just goes away, but you need to continue to think of the things that make your shots work well. Right now, get more slice on that serve again. to one final set. Jasmine Paolini is producing a really good performance there, pushing Petra Kvitova all the way. And uh, the former Wimbledon champion, as I said, is having to use all of that guile and brilliant left-handed forehand to get through uh, that first round match uh, against the Italian Paolini. And just to give you a, a sense of where we are at the moment, we are just to the right of uh, Henman Hill, above court number 18, and there is a well, we love a queue here at Wimbledon. There is a very large queue that has started to gather. Sure do. And it's not, uh, most of these people aren't here to uh, see Nick McCarvel, although I'm, no, I'm assured that some of them none are. None of them are. <laughs> <laughs> they are queuing here at the ticket resale queue because 
one of the unique things about Wimbledon, I don't know if they do this at the other Grand Slams, you can fill me in, is, is it Wimbledon the only one that has a it's resale queue? It's pretty unique, to Wimbledon, unique yeah. to Wimbledon. Um People who leave the show courts, so centre court and court number one, because they need to go home, they've got an event to go to, kids to pick up from school, they can give back their tickets and they're then sold to charity. So these people here are, are queuing up for a chance, potentially, to watch Serena Williams. Yeah, uh, any Serena fans? Serena Anybody? fans. There we go. There we go. I think everyone's here to watch uh, Serena for a chance to watch her against Harmony Tan. Um, let's just mention the, the, the resale queue because as you said, it's unique to, to Wimbledon. And one of those lovely little things, I remember when I was a kid and, and came to Wimbledon for one of the first times, we didn't get a centre court ticket, but we, are caught, uh, we got a court number one okay, and what'd uh, you get? A ticket. I can't remember exactly who it was we saw, I think. I want to say we saw Roger Federer in, in the you? early in the early days. It must have been one of his first few Wimbledon's. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a great opportunity for, for the fans who haven't managed to, to get a show called well, ticket you, to get one later in the day. This country loves a queue. Everything needs a line <laughs> in the UK, and it is really special. You know, oftentimes, Adam, we've seen it at the start of the day. Is you've got folks who are here. This is the first thing they do, and you can kind of feel some of the action. You also can see some of Court 18 is just over Adam's shoulder. So mm. it, it's a cool thing, and I'm pretty sure it is pretty unique to Wimbledon. I remember a few years <laughs> that you said, us Brits love a queue, and we do. I remember interviewing someone in the queue, and he was with, I, I won't name names, I, I'm sure they're not watching, but um, <laughs> he was with his wife, who was a massive tennis fan, and I don't think he was particularly bothered. Uh, and, I, and she was oh, desperate to, to get a ticket to see, I think it was Rafa Nadal, who, yeah. who they were queuing up to see. And I asked the husband, are you excited to see Rafa Nadal? And he said, well, I haven't really enjoyed Wimbledon so much so far. So far, We've queued for the last day to get in, and now we're queuing again. <laughs> yeah. um, but we, uh, we do love a queue here it's at SW19. It's a true SW19. fan experience. Exactly. It wouldn't be Wimbledon without yeah. the queue. And, and, and it's a very um, fair experience because it's one of the very few. I think Sally Bolton was saying in the interview yesterday, it is one of the few sporting events at this level um, in the world where you can just pitch up not necessarily on the day, you've got to pitch up a day or so beforehand, but you can get a ticket uh, to get in and watch a show. Yeah, court. and I've got some friends coming over on Thursday from the States and saying, well, how are we going to make sure that we see Serena? Well, maybe she's going to be on number one court if she wins. She could also be in center. So you join the resale queue and you have an opportunity to take that look. Yep, absolutely brilliant. And it will be interesting to see how Serena uh, gets on uh, on center court. At the moment, it's the match uh, previous to that. Uh, Rafa Nadal up against uh, Francisco Surundolo, the number 41 in the world from uh, Argentina. And although Nadal has won uh, the first two sets, 6-4, mm. 6-3, Surundolo is giving him a pretty good match, isn't he, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Surundolo has actually had a good look here at the Argentinian, a player who's had some good results recently, Adam, and actually on the grass, too. He's had mm. a few wins coming into Wimbledon, and what an experience for him to be out here against Rafa, someone who he would have watched for years and years. And so against Rafa on center court in the first round, and this has been some good work for Rafa out there. We saw it yesterday with Djokovic in the four sets, and today Rafa being challenged here in this third. I know we haven't seen Rafa at Wimbledon for a little while, but it yeah. was really interesting. I was reading an article in one of the, the British newspapers a couple of days ago speaking about the comparisons between Djokovic and Nadal here at Wimbledon. Djokovic, I don't believe he's ever lost at a really early stage, mm. apart from perhaps early on in his career, whereas Nadal, there was a few times where he lost in the first and second round. I remember that match against Steve Darcis, yeah. where he lost Lucas Rossol yep. as well. So he is a bit more prone to a shock uh, compared to, to Novak Djokovic. So for him to get through that first round match, especially as he hasn't been here at Wimbledon especially for a while, here, is, is big. Especially at Wimbledon, I think, because we haven't seen him in the last three weeks, right? He took that time off after mm. winning the French. Yeah, and uh, the crowds there inside centre court enjoying the sunshine and enjoying this uh, brilliant match uh, between these two. Let's settle in and enjoy this uh, sixth game of the third set with the commentators there on centre court. What happened there? Got to blame the court again. Anything. <laughs> Anything to take the onus away from yourself when you nearly have a fresh air from the back of the court. That hit the very bottom of the racket. So maybe it didn't bounce quite how he thought it would do. That's what we're, that's what we'll go with.
Silla. Well, that's another mistimed ball from Serendolo. And he shouted something up to his box there. Again, it was probably about the bounce. One keeps low, one gets high. Yeah, big service game for Rafa Nadal there on centre court. He's looking good, isn't he, back here at Wimbledon, having lifted uh, the Roland Garros title a couple of weeks ago and seems to be over that foot injury that was uh, troubling him uh, during that uh, French Open title run. And that's the scene above this part of southwest London at the moment. Thankfully, no rain clouds as we had yesterday. Uh, Nick, plenty of blue skies and we're enjoying the uh, early evening uh, sunshine. Let's hear from uh, one of the winners here on day two at uh, Wimbledon. Coco Goff had to work pretty hard, didn't she, yeah, against she did. uh, Elena Gabriela Roos. Uh, Roos produced a really good performance in the first set, took it 6-2, then Goff 6-3, 7-5, uh, and she'd have been happy to get through. Let's uh, hear what she thought speaking in the press uh, conference after that match. Please raise your hand and state your organisation when asking your question. We'll start off. That was quite a battle today. Uh, just give us your thoughts on the match. Uh, the match, it was definitely a difficult match. Uh, first rounds are never easy. Um, she played well um, and she really gave, like we both gave her all in that match today and I'm just glad I was able to come out with the win. Hi Coco, um, well done on the comeback. Um, Joseph Regal, tennis head. Um, tennis is a very individual sport, but sometimes players fight on court for something greater than themselves. We saw that with uh, Naomi when she won the US Open in 2020 um, and the mask that she wore after every match. Um, you've already spoken about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, but in light of that and as a young American regarding issues like that and I definitely it definitely does fuel me to and it's and motivates me to do even better um and today even that helped a little bit um just because you know people were saying um you need to like shut up and focus on tennis blah 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 and yeah so I like to win just to put that in their faces <laughs> good for you <laughs> thanks <laughs> Coco, Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Do you think there's an art to getting out of trouble in matches? And are you learning that as you go, sort of? 
Yeah, it's definitely an art. Um, just because like you're, it's impossible to play the best um, every day. And I feel like um, the last couple of tournaments that I played, I've been playing like really good tennis. Um, and you know, today I think e even though I lost like against Egan, I lost against Ons. I think today I kind of played even worse um, in the in moments of the match. And I think that's like what makes you a champion and and what makes you get to that next level is how you figure out how to win in these tough moments. And I think today made me a better player. Bill Simons, Inside Tennis. Um, I did want to ask you, what were your thoughts when the Supreme Court came down with its decision? Um, well, my first thought was I was very shocked. I thought in no way and how whatever, in no way that this decision would be overturned. Um, and you know, I was disappointed too because Roe v. Wade, Wade was um, a decision made, I forgot which year, but a decision made that led to many other things being overturned, such as same-sex marriage and, and other things. And I think, I just hope that this isn't, you know, a decision to be going backwards and lead to more decisions that make us outrage and that I think are unfair. Um, and, you know, I stated my thoughts in other interviews too. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm against it. I think, you know, me being a woman in America and being my age, I think that I should have the right to do what I want with my body. And um, I just hope, I don't want people to get too discouraged and given up. So I hope um, that there will be change. And, I, and I'm pretty positive that there will be. I mean, there's a new generation coming up and I think that there will be change. So I'm not worried that this dis decision will remain long-term. Willie Weinbaum from ESPN. Hi, Coco. Hi. What do you think is most important to you that enables you to come back when you're down? Um, really, I want the people in the crowd and the people watching me to always remember me as a fighter. Um, even if I lost today's match, I, you know, I would be disappointed, but I know that I gave it my all. And so when I'm down in those moments, and I was definitely finding some inner demons in that match, and I think um, that's what inspires me. I want the crowd to know that I'm a fighter, and I want my opponent and the opponents watching me to know that I'm a fighter. Just one follow-up. Is that something that's... Is that something that's We've had a bit of symmetry, really, on court two, hasn't there? Coco Goff yeah. lost a set, then won the next two to get through uh, in the second match of the day on court two. And it has gone exactly that same way in the third match. Uh, Petra Kvitova losing that first set, as we said, 6-2 against Jasmine Paolini and then fighting back to win 6-4, 6-2. You can see uh, the relief with that fist pump uh, to the crowd. Kvitova, the 25 seed at this year's championships, now through to uh, the second round. It's interesting, Nick, when we chat to players, isn't it, that they actually quite like to be tested in the first couple of matches here. Conversely, obviously, they don't want to be tested so much that they lose, but they almost don't want it to be too easy. They, w they don't really want to win 6-love, six 6-1 six because they get lulled into a false sense of security. They want to have some time out on court, get used to playing competitive matches on the grass uh, here at Wimbledon. So I don't think Kvitova will necessarily look at this as a negative thing that she's lost a set. No, absolutely not. And actually Coco was just talking about that, wasn't she? You know, the fact that she was so fired up at the end of that match to beat Roos and then for Kvitova to come through against Paulini. And you know, Kvitova winning that 29th title just a couple days ago in Eastbourne, that was a big win for mm. her. The first in over a year for her on the grass. She's a two-time champion here, but she's a player now, you know, reaching a point in her career where she's 32, and perhaps, you know, is she wondering about what's on the other side? So to win in Eastbourne, to have all that momentum to come in, Paulini's a really tough customer. Beat Sabalenka in the first round, yeah. first match that she played uh, at Indian Wells earlier this year. I think this is a big win for Kvitova, and for her, she just got to build on that momentum as she goes through the draw because she's certainly a dangerous one for anyone who yeah, comes up against her. Yeah, it's almost, she's a, very much like uh, Angelique Kerber here at Wimbledon. It almost doesn't matter what number she's seeded, or even if she isn't seeded, because of that previous record, the fact that her game, the lefty serve, the way she moves matches up so well uh, with grass, she's almost always in that yeah. lower group of contenders because yeah. of just how, so, how well she's played on this surface in the past. Petra, congratulations. That was a great effort. How pleased are you with the way that you came through that, particularly with the way that Jasmine started that match? Yeah, I think I, I started pretty badly. Um, 
Yeah, I'm glad I found a way in the end. Uh, to be honest, I really don't know how I found it, but uh, I made it. That's, that's counting. And of course, it was a difficult match with a lot of wind today, and uh, she can't really miss any, any, any points. So it was really tough for me to, uh, to play good and have a transition from East Bend to here with the different conditions as well. So I'm really glad I made it somehow. You are a two-time champion here at Wimbledon. You won your fifth grass court title at Eastbourne, as you mentioned. Well, it is a bit tough and you don't feel you're playing particularly well. How much does that get you through the match? Um, it's a big relief for sure. Uh, I did not serve well. Um, the serve in Eastbourne was helping me so much and I was a little bit counting on it and today was really a disaster. So, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> somehow I made it, but... Uh, yeah, I have to improve a lot. <laughs> I don't think it was quite as bad as you're making out that it was. But you are a two-time champion, as I mentioned. How special is it for you to come back, play here at Wimbledon, be in front of this crowd, finish with an ace? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, well, it's, it's beautiful to be back uh, with the full crowd. I'm glad you can take some positives out of that match. Ladies and gentlemen, Petra Kvitova. Thank you. So Olivia and myself thought we're going to try and find the busiest place in all of Wimbledon to essentially have a little bit of a competition. Now the competition is who's come here the furthest. So I'm going to hold a microphone, I'm going to ask a person at random where they've come from and then it'll be over to Olivia. I'm we'll highly, highly competitive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to do it three times. Olivia will do it. Three times. And then the winner will be the person who's found the person who's come here from the furthest. Sir, Mr Slim Shady on your shirt, how far have you come from today? Uh, North London. North London! Oh, livid! I'm already I mean, I'm an Arsenal livid. fan, but I'm gutted. It's over to you, Olivia. <laughs> All right. Hello, excuse me. Where have you come from today? I came from Guam. Guam. Wow! Where is that? A small island in Micronesia. Wow! Oh, yes, <laughs> have a great day! Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, I mean, North London to Guam. I mean, <laughs> that was absolutely incredible. Oh, the I micro know. island that I, I, I don't think this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to select very carefully yeah. here. And try and not hey, go for the hey, first person. Okay. Texas, you missed one. I missed. Okay. So, lads, we're asking people where you've all come from today. Where have you come from, sir? Uh, from Plymouth. Plymouth. Thank you very much. You're we're having a bit of a competition. Fartish. Fartish, thank you. Fartish. Not quite as good as one, unfortunately. Olivia, you're still slightly in the lead by about five thousand miles. Slightly. My, my geography's shocking as well, so I literally don't know. But I'm gonna pick a good one. Hello. Hello. Where are you from? Where have you We're come Saudi from? Saudi Arabia. Wow. How are you enjoying it here? Oh, it's fantastic. You're You're wonderful. A good day? Yeah, absolutely. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So Saudi Arabia and Huam versus Plymouth and North London. There is a, a slight clear winner at the moment, but all can change. This is the magic of TV. Although I, technically I've won. No, 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 because it's, it's not accumulative. Oh, right. Oh, Got to be clear. Round. I'm sorry. So it's the per, the overall person. Basically, I'm looking for an Australian or a Kiwi. <laughs> that, that's the situation. I need to channel Kiwi vibes. Hello, so we're asking you where they've come from today. Where have you come from? Ah, uh, it's London. Not far. Oh, not far. Well, thank you. We're not going to hold it against you, mate. Have a great day. Cheers, pal. Nice one. I'm devastated. I'm absolutely devastated. So. You, without you My even face needing hurts. to, I'm so happy. I'm smiling so hard right now. Oh. Okay, come on, then. This is my final is one. This for Jeff. glory. You don't even need it. I just want to win properly. I want to win all three times. Okay, are you ready? No. Are you ready? Hello. Hi. What's your name? Uh, Jones. Jones. Yeah. I have a feeling you're local. Where are you from, yeah. Jones? Uh, we're from Chichester. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Love have a great day, Jones. Yeah, thank you. So sometimes radar for people from North London. Yeah, exactly. Um, not going to be luck. too many people in the crowds here today from Guam either. No, where have you come um, from? 
where have I come from? <laughs> Weybridge, which is about 15 miles away. So he won't be picking me. That was quite a good game. I hope yeah, I love that. Um, wow. Let's get back to some of the action. We can head down to uh, court 12. Uh, Jack Draper, who's had a brilliant year so far, particularly on the, uh, the grass, one of the uh, British hopefuls here at the championships. The most uh, number of British players in the men's and singles draw for 21 years, uh, I believe. And uh, Jack Draper is through with a straight sets victory against Zizou Bergs from Belgium, 6-4, 6-4 at 7-6. And it is uh, great to see the home players uh, doing well um, here at Wimbledon. Uh, Nick Ryan Penniston, he won his match as well today, had a great run at, at Queen's and played well at Eastbourne uh, too. And often, I mean, you, I'm sure you see it at the US Open, for example, yeah. with the Americans. When one does well, it's no surprise to see the rest doing well because they almost act like a team each other on. Yeah, it's the pack mentality and I think for Jack Draper we saw last year against Novak Djokovic the way that he was able to win that set on center court but how good has Draper been? Mm. I love the confidence that he's shown the last few weeks. Had some good wins both at Eastbourne and Queens to get through this one. Alex Dimonor is next and someone like Draper with all that firepower, the way that he just attacks the ball, Dimonor doesn't really have necessarily a big weapon so Jack Draper, you know, someone who's a, a, had a lot of success as a junior, I think he's slowly developing a, as a really, really tough contender. On and the people ATP will remember tour. him from from last year when he pushed Novak Djokovic, didn't he? Yeah. he took that first set uh, against him in the in the first round match. Here he lost that day, um, but he said in some interviews coming in here that he took some inspiration from that match and and learned how to to play on the grass here at Wimbledon, and that's helped him uh, today. Talk, speaking of Brits in action. In the men's draw today, we can take you from uh, court 12. A short distance away, it's next, next door, aren't they? Court 12 yep. and court number two, so not too far away. Uh, Dan Evans uh, is in action. There's his uh, box there. Beyonce looking on and the rest of... He's come with such a big team these days, tennis players. Gone are the days <laughs> where there's just one person one sat in the box. One lonely person. Friends, agents, wives. You know, um, this... It is a real team game. It, it certainly is. And I mean, Ladies Dan and Evans, you know, he's the seed here seat, on the number two sure court. Adam, and we're, we're going to see this court would only fill up more. Kvitova just finished. But Jason Kubler is a former top junior himself. He was a junior world number one and actually for years had really tough issues with his knees. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple, three, four seasons where he was only playing on clay and they managed to finally get his knees right so he could eventually play on hard courts. So now he can eventually play One on minute. grass. He's someone in his late 20s, but every player's got a different story. Yeah, right? that, you know? and, and that's the great thing about, you know, Wimbledon and the slams is if you dig a little bit further into the, the backstories of all these players, some of them are on the outside courts. They may not be the big names that, that draw the big crowds, but they've always got um, a, a story to tell. And Jason Kubler is certainly that. It's great to see him on the grass. Uh, makes, I suppose, his career in terms of getting ranking points slightly easier in that he doesn't have to just play on clay anymore. He came through the qualifying as well, came through three qualifying matches, for people who don't know, um, 128 uh, men and women in the draw, but some of those are made up with players whose ranking might not be high enough um, to get into the uh, main draw properly, mm. but they can then go and play the qualifying tournament at Roehampton, a short distance away from here. I think it's, is it eight spots or 12 spots 12. that are at 12? Uh, spots are available for uh, players who can come through three qualifying matches to take their place in the main draw. Kubler's done that, and qualifiers are always a bit dangerous because they've come through three matches, they're confident and ready to go. Yeah, the only difference, right, of the qualifying here is you're off-site, you're at Roehampton. So oftentimes at the other slams, at the US, at the French, and at the Australian Open, you're used to the conditions of the courts on site. Well, Wimbledon, they're a few miles down the road at Roehampton. That's going to change in a few years' time. We're going to have qualifying here on campus as the club continues to expand. But certainly Kubler's going to build off of that confidence. And, you know, Evans is always dangerous. I, I like this one as a first round matchup for Evans to try to get himself bettered in and talk about the success for the British players. He's another one trying to join Andy, Cam Norrie. Mm. We just saw, you mentioned Penniston, we just saw Jack Draper. Uh, Dan Evans. You're on in his career. 
Um, but then he was able to really turn his career around in the latter stages and has turned himself into a really dedicated uh, professional who has enjoyed some great results in, in the latter stages of his career. And also has been tapped quite often by Roger Federer as a practice partner, someone I think that Roger really respects and the fact that, you know, off court Jason he's got uh, to someone to look up to like that, I think that's big. Certainly is. Aussie, Jason Kubler to serve, he's got through qualifying, he's made it to the main draw and he gets through to the second round. He's up against Play. Dan Evans, lots of British fans in court too. We can join the commentators for the first game. And that's the ideal start for someone like Kubler, who's maybe feeling a little bit of nerves, having not played too often uh, on, the, on this kind of court, that's for sure, let alone here at Wimbledon. Uh, you always feel like you want to get your, you know, the game underway, get your first service game away and get a lead, and uh, that's a great way to start with a nice ace. Left for service. there from Kubler. I think uh, he caught Dan Evans off guard there with that second serve. Dan Evans trying to set his stall out early by running around the second serve. We'll be probably seeing that a lot, especially on the deuce court. But actually the serve was really good and it caught Dan off guard there. Ah, oh, nicely done. A little fortunate perhaps. He'll take it. Yeah. Apologising to his opponents, admitting that it wasn't the cleanest of strikes. That's something I've seen recently from uh, Dan Evans. He seems to be using his topspin backhand a little bit more than in the past. Realizing that actually a change of pace and a change of spins may suit him a little bit more by keeping his player, his opponent, on his toes. Something similar this time up the forehand line, but let's judge that one. 40 30. Well, Dan Evans is someone who really believes in his forehand, he's got a lot of confidence in it. And even though he's quite a little bit outside the court there, he still thought that he's favorite to make that. Heather, it is such a pleasure to talk to you after your victory. How does it feel? Uh, I feel really good. Um, really happy with how I turned the match around from yesterday to today. Um, I was just fighting really hard yesterday. I wasn't able to find my game, but 
managed to somehow get through that second set and then today I came in with a fresh outlook and was raring to go and I played much better tennis so I'm really happy to get through that. An emotional end you know we saw your emotion and you do show it and that is so lovely to see and feel it with you. Why were you so emotional? Oh well. <laughs> oh, tell us. Um, well, it's that time of month, so I get emotional. <laughs> no, you're telling me. And uh, I cry at anything. I'll just see a dog and start <laughs> crying. Um, but also, just because it's been a really tough few years. I mean, for everyone. But but with my career and and I've been on the tour so long. I haven't had the best couple of years with my tennis and results. But I've kept plugging away. Kept fighting. So. You know, I was really fortunate that our match got moved to court one because it's so special to play on those big courts at home. Um, so, yeah, I think it just all it hit me and I didn't know where it came from because that's not usually me. <laughs> but you know what is lovely to see as a spectator, as a British fan, it's wonderful to see how much it means. Mm. Um, and how much does it mean? Like, what does this mean? You've progressed through to the second round. You've been here before. What's your head saying now? Yeah, I have to say, like, when I'm a spectator watching tennis or whatever sport it is, I always want to see the emotion from the, from the players. Um, so when there's that lack of it, I'm a bit let down. <laughs> so whether it's good or bad, I love to see it. So I hope, I hope people felt it. Um, but, yeah, I'm happy to be in the second round. Um, I'm guessing I'll probably play again tomorrow. Um, but just stick to my routines, eat well, sleep well, and um, hopefully put in another good performance. So you don't like have a blowout or take your foot off the gas while you're in it, you're focused? Absolutely. I, um, I get a lot of lovely messages during the tournament, but I, you know, really try and not even look at that just to keep my mind clear and, and just totally 100% focused. All I'm thinking about really is everything I can do to prepare as best as I can for my match, my next match. It's been a great year so far at Wimbledon for the Brits. We've had some great, you know, wins and results. Does that mean something to you? Do you are you buoyed by kind of your compatriots? Yeah, so uh, not just here at Wimbledon, but over the grass court season, I feel like it's been one of the best that I've seen for the Brits. So it's um, been really inspiring and it's just so great to see so many lovely people and good friends doing well. Um, I shout out to Jodie Burridge, who's at a career high now. Um, she's had a great grass court season. Ryan Penniston, such a great guy. He's been having a great, and he had a great win today. Um, so I think, because we're quite a small group, um, we're all closely knit, all very supportive of each other. So it's great to see everyone doing well. It really is. Now, Wimbledon's so iconic, so special. You know, it must feel incredible to play here, have a home crowd behind you. Do you get to enjoy it? Um, after your match, do you get to wander around and experience it, or do you have to keep removed to keep your head straight? Honestly, I don't have time. No, <laughs> like, right. it's already... Well, yeah, media commitments. <laughs> yeah, yesterday, I warmed up for my match at 11 a.m., and I didn't get on court till 8.30 p.m., so... Did you, you know, cool down in between then? <laughs> I mean... Well, I actually, fortunately, I stay with a family um, just uh, by the practice courts yeah. in a house there, which I've stayed with for the last 12 years and they're, they're like family now. So I actually went back to the house um, and rested there because we knew it was going to rain. So it worked out perfect. I'm a bit intrigued by this. 12 years you stayed with the same family. Do they offer to host and you get assigned to them? Uh, so the first year, because I'm from Guernsey and I, I didn't have a home here in, in the UK, um, I reached out to the agency and asked if I could be put with a host family and I was placed with them and it's one of the best things I've ever done. And now I don't just stay with them during Wimbledon, I see them throughout the year as well and we're like family, yeah. That is a gorgeous story. It's the, they're the Skinners, shout out to the Skinners. Yeah, Skinners, thank you for hosting our girl. Um, I will wrap this up soon, but I'm a bit fascinated. First of all, oh, your outfit, are you into your fashion? Do you like kind of, to pick, I mean, you've got such a great sponsor, I'm completely jealous. Thank you. I 
I'm so lucky to be with New Balance. I've been, this is my eighth year with them. So most of my career and um, they have super trendy stuff. Oh. And I'm, I'm Can you hook me up, Heather? Like, are we gonna have to talk off camera and do some good things here? Well, they were stood here a second oh, ago. What? Come on. Yeah, we just missed them, <laughs> but they're great. So I feel really lucky to be with a brand like them. I'm also a big fan of your lashes. Oh, thank you. I actually got them done on Saturday because it's really important <laughs> to you. look good, feel good. That I couldn't agree with that more, but that's so interesting. They don't distract or you can, you're focused when you look through them. Well, I can't wear makeup to play, yes, so I, I, I just can't. I sweat too much. <laughs> um, so it's, it's like the one thing that I, I, I do. I think you look amazing and I'm thank really you. proud of you and go for it. Can thank I have a hug? Yeah. Wish you luck. Go on, go get them. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Heather. Thank you. Tennis chat and makeup tips. What more could you possibly want uh, here at Wimbledon? And a good performance from Heather Watson. Bit of an epic in the end. Two hours and 33 minutes over the course of a couple of days because it got uh, stopped yesterday uh, against uh, Tamara Korpach, having lost that first set 7 6, fought back 7 5 6 2 to take her place in the second round. Delighted to say. Daniela Hantikova is alongside me here. Um, Daniela, welcome again. Thank Let's you. talk a little bit about Heather Watson. It's lovely to see a smile on her face. Eyelashes been, or the tennis? Uh, <laughs> both. Um, and great to see a smile on her face after, you know, the last few years for her have certainly been up and down. Uh, injury issues, loss of form, expectations from, mm. from the British public. But she looked like she was really enjoying her tennis today out on court one and she, she was rewarded with a good result. Yes, and it's so nice to see that smile back on and there should be all the reasons for Heather to have that more often here. I remember one of the last matches I played at Wimbledon was losing to Heather on court one. She played unbelievable mm. and I, I just wonder you know, why she hasn't been able to produce that type of a, a tennis more often. I believe after beating me, then she had those, I think, four or five match points against Serena Williams on center court. So, so, so we know how well she can play. Also, uh, we watched her closely in Miami where she had some great matches. Uh, it seems like, you know, she's fighting again and, and really still hungry to play her best tennis, which is great to see because it's always so much more difficult to do it at the later stages of your career that where you maybe feel like, okay, I could have done much better. And, you know, you just never know when the momentum can start uh, going for her once again. It's just about being disciplined without putting all the hard work in. And I all, always believed, you know, she's so talented. She has, mm -hmm. especially on grass, everything that it takes to play great tennis. So let's hope, you know, she can build on this win today. OK, good win for Heather Watson. Great to see her in the second round, joining many British players mm. who've, who've had some good results uh, so far here at Wimbledon. Let's head down to uh, Court 12. Been keeping you up to speed with what's been going on uh, down there. Slightly bigger court 12 this year. They've added some yeah. seats, so it's, a, it's a, a larger capacity than it was uh, in the past. And it's Taylor Fritz, uh, the number 11 seed from the US in your picture there against the Italian Lorenzo uh, Massetti. Fritz has had a brilliant year. He won the title in Eastbourne up towards his uh, career high rank. He did uh, very briefly crack the top 10. He was ranked number 10 in the world. And we can join the commentators with Massetti uh, serving at 2-1 with a break. Good start for him there on court 12. Nicely done. That's the example there of where Taylor Fritz, he's just, he's not the quickest, obviously. He's a tall man, but he has improved in that area, the defensive play, but they're pushed too far wide. Very close that was. 30, not, not challenging. Didn't challenge that one. We have old eyesight, John. I don't know. We do, but that was right below us, and I think that was worth a challenge. But anyway.
Ja, det er Fifth. Ambitious from a long way back. Juice. Tactic there, you don't see him do that very often. Advantage Musetti. A good sneak attack there on the serve volley. He saw the racket face there of Taylor Fritz open it up so he knew he was going to chip. And he got that ball before it dropped. So a bit of pressure on the number 11 seed there, Taylor Fritz. We were saying, Danny, that was a, a good match, isn't it, against Lorenzo Massetti, who was one of those dangerous, unseeded players in the men's draw. Yeah, it's, uh, we were saying could be easily a quarterfinal match, and that's where you know players like Lorenzo become so dangerous in the early rounds because all the seeded players are just hoping not, not to have to face someone like that. Obviously, uh, Taylor strong favorite uh, this year anywhere she ent he enters, but uh, against Lorenzo, I feel like this is going to go the distance and, uh, you know, the, the fans over there, they will be sitting on that court for quite some time, I think. Yes, it could be an interesting one. We'll keep you right up to date with what's happening there on court uh, 12. We said why the queue behind us. You can see this uh, uh, ticket resale queue is growing and growing and growing. And that's because everyone wants to see yeah. Serena Williams. I'm, I'm not going to break it to them that some of them are not going to be getting a ticket to yeah, get inside. Yeah, please don't tell them. Court, been I'm waiting there for I'm not going to tell them now um, <laughs> against Harmony Tan. Uh, of France. I, I suppose genuinely, be, uh, generally, before we start focusing in on, on the match itself, just brilliant to see yes. Serena back here and playing at Wimbledon. I mean, obviously, there's been so much buzz ever since she announced that she was coming to the UK and already having uh, her scene last week, um, you know, playing doubles and having so much fun. I think it was such a smart step to play with Ons Jabor to kind of see where the woman's game is at the moment because it's easier to tell when you are with someone actually on the same side of the court so you get a feel you know how fast Ons is hitting the ball and what, and what she's capable of doing so I think that helped the process of you know getting the practice matches in and uh, and I always felt like she could have done that more you know when she was really into playing a lot of tournaments you know to, especially on grass to maybe take that extra week go down to Innsbruck and get your singles even even more ready for the first week because I think the, the danger always with the champions is that if they're going to go out it's going to be uh, in the first week uh, obviously now when St Serena steps on the court no one really knows what to expect uh, I, I don't think even Serena can being a champion as she is uh, it, it's going to be I think a little bit uh, 
tricky the first few games uh, just for the pure reason that she's been away for so long and there is nothing like that match playing no matter how many uh, practice matches she would have played in her preparation coming over uh, I'm sure there will be quite a few nerves but mm. that's where you know then she can back it up with all that experience she's got playing on that court and I think within a few minutes she will start to feel more comfortable. Yeah, because it, you know the fact that she has played so few matches in the last year, like two years really, mm. um, obviously will be on, on one side for her, but on the other side she's got the Serena effect. Yeah. No one in the draw wanted to play Serena Williams, no matter how many matches she's played in the last year, because it is so intimidating to see Serena Williams down the other end of the court. You had to do that many times earlier on in, in Serena's career. Just talk about what that is like playing against someone like Serena. Yeah, it's such a good point, Adam. And there is, uh, it's, it's hard to explain, but when you play against someone that you know that has won this tournament so many times, and especially Wimbledon, you know they know what it takes, how to play on the surface, uh, the experience of that center court. And a couple of times I played Serena here when she was having a good day in the office. It can be really embarrassing <laughs> as the opponent because you just feel like you're picking up, uh, you know, balls and uh, just going from one side to another. Because if she's going for her first serves and after after her returns, there is hardly anything you can do, no matter how long she's been away from the game. So, if she can put it on like that and go for her shots, not make mistakes, she's going to be super dangerous whoever she faces here. But the qu big question mark is can she do that after being such a long time away we can only wonder you know about you it. know better than me but it's un i would say you know having heard serena in an interview she was very quick to say i'm not retired i'm not retired mm. i wasn't retired i'm i'm still playing yeah. she wouldn't be here if she didn't think she could win it well yes and no i mean i think she also understands you know the the tennis always involves and um she understands she hasn't been around for a long time and that she's going to feel the nerves. I think it's important she accepts she probably will not be playing her best tennis. But yes, it's that inner belief that all the champions do. You know, when uh, Novak now was away for a long time, we wondered, you know, how he was going to be able to play. And the, the champions biggest trend is that they improve within few games, within few matches, suddenly they can play their best tennis. And that's why we still see Serena around, we still see Andy Murray around, because they have something we, we don't have and we never had, is that ability to, to adjust quickly and bring that champion's attitude within few minutes on the court. And I wouldn't be surprised if she's able to do that today. You, you said the way that the women's game has evolved and moved oh, yeah. on and her career, she's enjoyed so much success over a long, long time with, with her and her sister. What specifically do you think she needs to focus on here if she is to enjoy success here at Wimbledon this year? What's she got to do well? I think it's about accepting that what before would be winners for her. Now these girls are so back. fast that she has to be willing to, you know, play longer rallies and, uh, you know, maybe having to hit three, four winners in the past that are now are still a normal working shot because the girls just get it back, that it's going to take her longer time to finish the points. Um, I would say that she has to be even more aggressive. I didn't really like it when we saw her at the US Open and she was start trying to stay in the rallies more. I understood why she wanted to do that, but at the same time, that's not Serena. I think everyone gets overwhelmed by her game when you see her going after her serve, after her returns, and trying to make the rallies as short as possible. That's Serena, and that's then you know the the fear that she can uh, send uh, against you that uh, okay, you you better don't uh, don't don't drop anything short because I'm going to be after every single of those shots. And the difficulty for Harmony Tan today will be knowing that I know. She uh, Serena Williams has had some tough moments on centre court in the last few years, but over the course of her career, she's had so many special moments yeah. on that arena. And I think when she walks out, that yeah. will be what's firmly in her mind. Yeah, again, it's that Wimbledon champion aura that you have around you when you step on a grass court, suddenly everyone respects you even more. So I remember I had a similar kind of feeling when I had to face Martina Navratilova when she was doing a little comeback and played singles at Eastbourne and I had to play against her. I, I think I was top 10, so on a paper it's like an obvious match I should win. I was so overwhelmed and so stressed out that I was a sudden breakdown just because I kept thinking, oh my, it's nine Wimbledon titles. And, you know, they know how to move on grass. They, 
you know, becoming one of the greatest grass court players, it takes so much time and suddenly when you get to face that, it's like, how am I going to win any points? So it can easily happen that Serena will be just overwhelming her opponents. Still a little while to go. Uh, before they step out on court because Rafa Nadal and Francisco Sarundolo are still uh, in that second match of the day. Let's take you from focusing on centre court to court number one where they're racing through the matches, aren't they? Three <laughs> down already, although I suppose Heather Watson's match against Korpach was just one to finish. This is the final match of the day uh, there. Stefano Tsitsipas, uh, the number four seed, a real fan's favourite. So many people love watching him. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how he gets on at Wimbledon uh, this year against Alexander Richard. Uh, a qualifier uh, from uh, Switzerland. We'll focus on uh, Tsitsipas first because Danny, his best results at the Grand Slams, safe to say, haven't come here um, at Wimbledon. He's said in the past how he's found grass a little bit more difficult to get used to. But when you watch him play, the power he's got from, from the baseline, big serve, he has all the tools to, to be successful on grass. He does, except I would say the return can be still improved, especially off the first serve. I feel like he could improve that slice, blocking a couple, just to make sure he makes, uh, makes more sense. points on, uh, on his return game. Um, but sense. other than that, huge serve, moves incredibly well. I just love the fact how much more he has transitioned his game towards the net as well. I think playing doubles a couple of years ago helped him to, to believe that he's a great net court player as well. So. Just like I said before, you know, it takes a while to, to have the belief that you are a good grass court player. Uh, s same kind of thing, but just later stages, uh, Carlos Alcaraz. I think it's going to take him a while to, to develop his game to what he, it's the best way for him to play on grass. And I think Stefanos is getting there. I just would like to see more, more block returns um, on his side of the court. Yeah, well, he got the first set on a tie break, 7-6, and it's his Richard serving at the start of the second, and we can join the commentators there on court one. Fifty nine. Sits a pass there. Replaying the backhand, as we talked about, that sort of punch through return. That will get better throughout the tournament. When we talked about that he needs to get really working. Now those four hands, aren't they? 15, a little run a few games ago where he missed a few, but as I said, the top players keep going for him. They have full confidence that okay, he'll miss a couple, but they'll come good. Passing shot, gone astray. Just a fraction. Forty thirty. Still not all flowing just yet for Stefanos Tsitsipas. 
And that will give this man First hope. Game. Second set. Because he's... OK, let's uh, hear from uh, Stefanos uh, Tsitsipas then, having taken uh, that uh, first set 7-6 against Alexander Richard. Lost that uh, opening game, one love. Here he is speaking prior to the tournament with Rene Stubbs. Stefanos, first of all, welcome back to Wimbledon. Um, I guess the bottom line is, how does it feel to be back here? I first came here in 2015 and played the juniors event, so it's great seeing that transition happen over the years where I was able to transition into professional men's tennis and uh, make my way to the, to the actual thing that we've all been dreaming of uh, being part of. Um, I feel a different energy this year. It's, it's a bit kind of more refreshing uh, yeah. coming back here and I hope for, for a good tournament. Tell us why it's more refreshing. I feel like we're re less restricted this year. You know, with all these things going on in the last couple of years, it hasn't been very easy. Um, both physically and mentally, kind of adapting in and out. Uh, I feel like this year is going to be a little bit different. Personally speaking, I've also had a, a bit more of uh, competition on the grass. I've had more matches being played yep. on the surface, so I think it would be absolutely normal to feel a bit more confident uh, coming into the tournament. Yeah, that was my next question to you. The form coming in here this year, how do you feel? And I guess, what do you feel like you have to do to maybe get on this court? and hold up that trophy? I think winning will solve a lot of problems uh, in regards of that. <laughs> so just winning and competing and giving it my everything out on the court. I'm pretty confident and sure I'm going to book a spot in this court if, if I do all of the above. Yeah, the reason we are sitting here today doing this interview is it is the actual 100th anniversary of the centre court. Really? Oh. And as you've already told me, you've never been out here to play a match. But what do you remember? What's the first memory that you remember about this court, whether it be on television or in person? John McEnroe yelling, you cannot be serious to the referee. <laughs> um, obviously, I was not there to witness it myself. Yeah. I could only see that from uh, years later on on YouTube, I think, yeah. that I was watching at the time. But the memory that I, I very vividly remember um, uh, as a young kid watching it on TV was that match Federer Rodic, which lasted a lot of hours and it was a, a great final. Yeah. In fact, uh, I remember a great battle between those two uh, legends of our sport, uh, Rodic, with a lot of opportunities to clinch, uh, I think, his first ever Wimbledon title. Yeah. Uh, and it was definitely a thrilling match to watch. I stayed throughout the entire match from the very beginning till the end. And uh, I remember being really uh, amazed by the quality of tennis that these two played uh, that day. What is it, I know you haven't played on the court itself, but what is it about centre court at Wimbledon that makes it just so unique for, for every player? It's, I would call it the home of tennis. It's where the traditions remain and nothing has ever been kind of touched. Everything is so raw and pure. Uh, it's tennis at its uh, finest in a way. Uh, you won't get, I think, any better than this. It's, it, it, it kind of feels that, that like the roots of tennis are connected to this place right here. Yeah. And you mentioned to me before we even started that not, no Greek player has played on this court. Um, are you hoping that you get on this court maybe before Sakari does? <laughs> this is perhaps my goal for this year. Be the first Greek or the second Greek. I am not competing against Maria. I wish the best. Uh, I wish the best for her as for me. Uh, so I hope we can become the first two Greek players to make it on that court. Um, it will be great. This is the, probably the goal for this year. So we've spoken to all, a lot of players about the special, I mean, this is such a special place. It's like a mecca to, to, for, for all the tennis players. If you could set up a tennis court anywhere else in the world Ooh. that's not a, not a tennis stadium, where would you set up a court in what sort of stadium or where? Look, going back, going back in time, ancient Greece was a, the, the place where culture was developed, philosophy and all of the above. Um, I would love to see a center court right next to the Acropolis on top of it. Uh, what inspires you about this place? I guess the royal part of it. If there was royalty in tennis, it would be Wimbledon. Wow, that's a good answer. 
Um, listen, Stefanos, we, we wish you all the best over the next two weeks. We know how fabulous a player you are, and we'd like to see you have that opportunity to be the first Greek person to be on centre court. So best of luck over the next couple of weeks. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, great to hear from Stefanos uh, Tsitsipas. Let's take you to some more live action over on court three. Felix Auger Aliassim, plenty expected of him, the number six seed here in the men's singles at Wimbledon against Maxime Cressy, the American. Auger Aliassim took that first set 7 6, but then Cressy fought back and uh, won the second 6 4. And we can join it at 4 3 on serve in the third. Selfie moment. <laughs> Super low there. The sixth seed. It's another illustration of his excellent concentration at this stage. age five with his dad who was a tennis coach. Felix's idol is Roger Federer with whom he shares a birthday. Just enough purchase on the backhand volley to get it to slip through the court quickly so that it buckled the Canadian. 40, 30. Super sharp from Cressy. Great dig from the Canadian there. Good uh, end range control yes. with low forehand. Not easy. Yeah, exactly right. Just to get his racket on the ball was a good effort. But again, when you go cross court, opens up the court. It so makes it so difficult to cover the entire net. If Cressy had gone up the line, he, he would have had just about everything covered. He does have a lovely drop volley, doesn't he? But I'm with you. I think sometimes it's good, but he, he should play the straight one a little more. That's that's a good call, Peter. I like that tactically. He could add with that, couldn't he? Narrowing down the angles because he's got fast hands and he can make those kind of pickups. Thirteen face to uh, draw level with that tally of uh, the Canadians. And uh, incidentally, they've both hit a handful of double faults. It's that time of the evening, isn't it? Just keep them quiet with a pizza, Mum. Game pissy. Back to back aces for the American. As he draws level again. Four games all. It's a big serving there from the American Maxime Cressy from one American to another. Taylor Fritz, we showed you some of this match earlier on in the first set. The number 11 seed having been a breakdown in the first set against Lorenzo Massetti was able to take it 6-4. So plain sailing so far for the Eastbourne champion. And here he is at the start of the second set, serving in that first game.
30 love. Got an easy power he has. He's mm. reasonably tall Fritz. Just a whip in the serve. Taylor Fritz was on my, when I was coach of World Team Tennis, he was on my team when he was 17 years old. Uh, I signed him up um, and he played very, very well. The problem was with him, he only would eat fast food in those days. And game, Fritz. as I was. First game, second set. Some more big serving there from uh, Taylor Fritz. Let's go back to the match that we saw before that. Felix Auger Aliassime being tested by Maxime Cressy. He's had some good results uh, recently. Auger Aliassime, he's been put in that group, hasn't he, of the next player who could win a Grand Slam uh, on the men's side. What is it that he does particularly well? What do you think is. Um, he needs to improve on that if he is to, to lift one of these titles. I think he's on the right track. Uh, I felt like... He's say, a great athlete, isn't yeah, he? Oh, yeah. I mean, his physicality is incredible. And I think that effect of having Uncle Tony around has been a huge help in a way that I feel like he structures the points much better and he's able to use his physicality in a more effective way. I feel like before he was more like reacting to whatever was coming to his side. But I think having someone from Rafa Kemp it just naturally brings you the ability to read your opponents a little bit better and s stay connected to, to the ball and move in the certain uh, patterns that fit uh, Fe Felix's game. And I think that's where Tony has, has done an incredible job uh, with Felix, trying to understand him. It's not about as hard as you hit the ball, because we know, you know how, what a wonderful timing uh, Felix got on the ball, but it's about you know, putting it together so that you are as effective as possible against your opponents. It was interesting, that partnership, because obviously Uncle Tony Nadal mm. and coached Nadal and worked with Nadal ever since he was a young boy playing uh, tennis to then move on and, and yeah. start working with someone else. I guess they must have had a conversation. Are you okay with this, Rafa? I'm sure. And uh, it was interesting to see when uh, when Felix. They're still Felix, rivals, aren't? I mean, they're they're competing for the same titles. Of course, but I think uh, Felix, you know, is such a smart uh, player, a very intelligent of the core that he would understand that. Of course, whenever he's going to play Rafa. Tony is his family that there's going to be um, probably a neutral position where Tony will be watching the match from. Um, but I think uh, um, also for Tony, it was a lot of adjustment because when you're coaching someone like Rafa, obviously he's going to do things on the court that no one else does. And then to try to accept that, OK, with Felix, it's a completely different game plan here and uh, to adjust his coaching uh, methods to, to another player coming from Rafa, that's not an easy thing to do but I think it took them a while but I think now they are in a in a right uh, right uh, place where it seems like all that hard work and all the I'm sure a lot of conversations of the court are starting to you know pay off on the court as well he's quite thoughtful in interviews yeah. as well he's obviously an intelligent young man and I, I was listening to an interview with him um, a little while ago and he was talking about the fact that there hasn't been that many Canadians on the men's side who've had success right at the Grand Slam level. They've had some doubles players, Daniel Nesta, for example, who've done well, but not in the singles. And it wasn't until Milos Raonic obviously yep. reached the final here and kind of paved the way a little bit. And he was speaking about how to see a player that's a little bit older than you enjoying success right at the top level can inspire a younger generation to want to do a similar thing. And even though they're not that far apart in age, Felix and, and Milos, it did inspire him to believe that he could do it at Grand Slam level. Yeah, I think it's always such a huge um, help when you have someone from your country doing kind of the things you want to achieve one day because then you feel like, well, if he's done it, why, why can't I do the same thing? Happen to, to the Italian players now. We had one having incredible results and then suddenly four or five follow just because of, you know, they train the same way, same places. So you just keep telling yourself, my time will come as well. So I think what Milos Raonic, particularly here at Wimbledon, has done uh, in the past uh, is helping Felix to have that belief that, uh, right, you know, I can do just, just the same, if not better. Danny, you got to take the comfy seat from Nick. I don't know if it's necessarily comfy, but we sent him out and around the grounds to go and get some interviews, do some work for once. Let's Thank see you. what he's been uh, up to over the last few minutes. 
Well, tonight on the center court stage is Serena Williams making her return to this tournament. Alongside me is Jill Krabus, who is a commentator for the radio channel here at Wimbledon. And Jill, Serena, the comeback at 40. What do we expect? I feel like it's expect the unexpected. I think that's a perfect way to say it. I think it's difficult to know. I think it's very good that she played a doubles, some a couple doubles matches last yeah. week in Eastbourne, which I think was really important. Um, we don't know because she hasn't played a singles match in a year. It was a year ago here. So I think everything is a little up in the air. I doubt she even knows how she's going to perform. I think, you know, she has high expectations, which is totally normal. And so she, she's going to want her best. But I think she has to be willing to kind of work things out just because she hasn't played a competitive match in a while. You and I are in our jackets. It's pretty windy. Is, if yeah. the roof stays open, talk to, talk to us about conditions and if the roof closes conditions. Yeah, it can definitely be tricky. I mean, just watching the matches today, a lot of players are struggling with that, especially on the grass as well, because you don't always get a true bounce. And with the windy conditions, I mean, everything it can be up in the air, especially on the stadium courts. It tends to swirl. So even if the wind is in one direction on the stadium courts, you never know. It's always changing. So I think the important thing is the footwork in that situation you've always got to keep moving and adjusting and I think it, that could make it maybe a little bit trickier for Serena because I think Harmony Tan has a type of game that has variety she has different things where she can adjust and so I think she might adapt a little bit better but I think all, obviously all eyes are going to be on Serena to see how she performs. Jill I buried the lead you have beaten Serena here at this tournament what will it take for Harmony Tan and actually how much is the ball in Harmony court we're all talking about Serena but she's on the other side of the net yeah I think she's got a great opportunity I think when you play these champions it's always good to get them in the first round um, especially for someone that hasn't played a match in a year because that's where a lot of the nerves come into play the first round is always hardest to get through I think the biggest challenge for Harmony is to the situation being on center court for the first time having never played Serena that can be a little bit intimidating because she has such an aura and a presence about her so I think to be able to block that out is going to be really important for her I think she's got a very experienced coach in her box, but Sam Sumik, who's worked with Azarenka, Muguruza. So Sam is gonna know exactly how to get her, get her in the right frame of mind, but it's being able to walk out into the court and remember that frame of mind and to forget who's across the net. So I think that's gonna be the biggest challenge for Harmony. You are someone who played late into your career. Serena now at 40 years young, I'll say. She what, beat me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does she have to do, especially physically, body-wise, to make sure she's taking care of herself? And how much are we going to be watching out to see, is she okay physically, say if she goes into a third set? Yeah, I mean, I think the good news is she was good physically in Eastbourne yeah. in the doubles. Um, so that is a good start. Singles, obviously, is different. I think she would have made sure she's prepared to play here. I think she's got the type of game that she can work herself into a tournament. She knows she's got a big serve. She hits big off the ground. So I think if she gets a lot of quick points and have some rallies, she can work her way into into the tournament physically. I think she looks good. So I think it's just going to be about her competitiveness, which we know she brings to the court every single time. All right, well, Jill is going to be in the radio commentary booth. You can listen live around the world. Um, I might need some hot chocolate for this one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you too. <laughs> A hot chocolate hot soup, yeah. you name it, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have some uh, hot tennis as well. Jill, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. We'll leave those two to go and try and find a hot chocolate. Rafa Nadal is struggling on center court. The man in your picture there, Francisco Sarundolo, producing some brilliant tennis. Having lost the first two sets, the Argentine, it was plain sailing for Rafa, 6-4, 6-3. But Sarundolo has fought back. He took the third set, 6-3. And here he is at 4-3 with a break, an all-important break in the fourth set. We can join the commentators there on center court. He needs a first serve here. Well, 
two consecutive arrows on the forehand side from Serendolo. Love 40. And the M word, momentum, is suddenly all on the other side of the net. doesn't want to dwell on that game. It really was a horror show. And the going gets tough. Rafa gets going. He is broken back against Sarundolo inside the centre court. It's been an intriguing finish to that match. Don't forget, you can watch it uh, over on Wimbledon's uh, major broadcasters all around the world. We're going to hear from Petra Kvitova in just a second. She got through uh, in three sets in her match earlier on today. But just a word on Rafa. Mm -hmm. When his back is against the wall, it's always going to be difficult for his opponent. Exactly, and I feel like it's going to be a typical Rafa set. Um, you know, his opponent having so many opportunities and somehow yet he found a way, uh, not playing his best tennis yet, understandably so, first first play, uh, match on grass, no matter who you are, it is going to be awkward. And uh, I felt like at the first few games, at the beginning of the match, uh, I think his movement wasn't there yet, he's getting there, but uh, also his opponent is starting to be more and more comfortable. So it's one of those matches that can still go the distance, but I just feel like he might find a way how to finish it in, the, in this four set. Yeah, Rafa having to work hard today there on centre court. Another player who had to work hard was Petra Kvitova. She lost the first set against Jasmine Paolini of Italy on court two and then fought back to win 6-4, 6-2. Let's hear from her speaking after the match. Um, I'll start. A tough match today, Petra, but uh, how are you feeling out there? <laughs> now I feel much better. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, it was a um, tough one with uh, different conditions and, and uh, uh, transition from Eastbourne here, uh, playing different opponent as well. So it was really tough and um, I don't know how I made it, but uh, probably it was just the fighting spirit today. Um, probably the strongest would I, uh, how I beat everything and beat my opponent. Uh, Paul Newman from The Independent. Uh, Petra, you've said in the past that um, you often you feel nervous here at Wimbledon in recent years. When you, after that first set, were you thinking, oh no, not again? <laughs> I'm always thinking, <laughs> every year like this. Um, I've been nervous, but um, I had the worst um, days here, for sure. Um, I think I felt a little bit be better because of the Eastbourne tournament, how I played there and so, but here it's, it's different, even the gr grass is different, I think it's a bit slower, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> and uh, yeah, um, always the first rounds are just tough, so that's what I expected, uh, on the other hand I was telling myself that, you know, uh, Jasmine is not really a grass court player, she prefers more a clay court. Um, I had tougher draws here f before. So um, I knew that I have came to, to beat her somehow, but of course with the nerves and with uh, I didn't have surf today at all. So I lost it probably in Eastbourne or I don't know. Um, so yeah, it was a bit tough. And, and just generally, do you feel your confidence is much better now after what you did at Eastbourne? Yeah, for sure. I think so. I mean, I had a great five matches in a row, which I didn't have whole season. So um, for sure, it's helped me. On the other hand, this is a different tournament, different week. And tennis, it's pretty tricky in this case that, you know, um, um, well, not really tricky for Iga, as we see, but <laughs> for other ones, uh, it, it is. It's, it's just different. It's different conditions, different grass. Um, everything is just very similar, but still different, and we can feel it. So I hope that next match can be a little bit better, hopefully. Could see a smile on the face of uh, Petra Kvitova. She's been through a lot, you know, in the last uh, couple of years, and her, her ranking has slipped a little bit, and the seedings lower than, than previously. But we were saying this earlier that as a two time 
former Wimbledon champion, a bit like Angelique Kerber, she always brings her best yeah. tennis on, on the grass court. And no matter where she's seated, even if she isn't seated, she's dangerous on these courts. Yeah, 100%. And uh, it was so cool to see her winning at Eastbourne uh, because I feel like on grass, uh, she still got it. And just like Serena, these champions that have won the tournament before, they know what it takes. And uh, if she can stay injury free, keep up the, you know, the fitness levels where they need to be, um, to me, it wouldn't be surprised if we see her at the later stages of the second week, because when her game is on, just like with Serena, a couple of times when I had to play Petra on grass, uh, again, you, you, it can be very frustrating uh, for the opponents. Petra Kvitova through to round two. She's earned herself a day off tomorrow, but these are the players that will be action on centre court and court number one. We'll start uh, with centre. First up, it's Novak Djokovic against uh, Tanasi Kokinakis, who, I mean, Djokovic is the overwhelming favourite for that one, but Kokinakis, when he's on, yep. he's got some serious power, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Nola will be really getting ready for that one because that's not an easy second round. And uh, like you said, Adam Kokinakis is um, able to do any anything really on and the court. He won the doubles, didn't he, with Kyrgios yeah. at the Australian Open. That gave him a lot of confidence for the rest of uh, the season. After that, Mm. This arguably yeah. the match of the day. This could be really intriguing. We were talking about this one yesterday. Emma Raducanu, great for her to get through the first round against Alison van Oudvank, against Caroline Garcia, who, as we can see there, isn't seeded, but a dangerous opponent for Emma. Yeah, 100%. I think to me that is going to be the match of the day as well. Um, and Caroline is going to like um, the opportunity to maybe cause a big upset because no one expects her to get through that one. But she's starting to play uh, her best tennis again, winning the Roland Garros doubles title, winning a, a single title last week so Emma has to step it up another level it was very impressive how she managed to deal with all the expectations in her first round and, and let's see what she can come up with tomorrow. Andy Murray produced some great tennis against uh, James mm. Duckworth rolled back the years really on centre court didn't he a couple of days ago but he's got uh, a difficult one against John Isner who it, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who's playing, it's always going to be tough with that big serve and the way that he's able to generate power on the forehand. Exactly, but it was so so fun to watch Andy yesterday and uh, so impressive to be witnessing what he's still able to do on the court and uh, obviously the energy from the crowd is going to help him big time tomorrow as well. But yeah, it's always so awkward to face somewhere, someone with such a big serve on grass court. So uh, Andy definitely will be looking at trying to get as much rhythm on, her, on his return game as possible and uh, try to get into longer rallies because that's where Andy's going to have the edge. So that's uh, centre court. Let's rattle through uh, court number one as well because some interesting matches for us to look forward to too. Annette Contevite, the number two seed, she struggled, didn't she, in her first round match. She really had to be at her best. She was down a break uh, in her first round. Um, and, and she's got a chance against Julie uh, Niemeyer first up uh, on court number one. How do you, I mean, she's the number two seed. How do you view Annette's chances of the championships this year? Yeah, it, it's a long way, I think, for, for Annette. Um, not having the results probably as she would have expected the last couple of, of weeks. Also splitting uh, up with her, her coach. Uh, it's never easy. A lot, of, a lot of things to deal with. But at the same time, you know, she moves incredibly well. Um, when her serve is working, there is no reason why uh, she can't be dangerous and go deep in the, in, in the tournament. If she can go all the way, I have my doubts there, but uh, yeah, let's hope she can prove me wrong. Cameron Norrie, the British number one, he had to be patient because he was on court two for his first match. Some people feeling perhaps he should have been on uh, centre or, or, or uh, court one rather than court number two, but he's got his opportunity tomorrow against uh, Jama Munar. It's been a brilliant year for Cameron. He's one of the hardest workers uh, on the men's tour and uh, you'd fancy him that match as well, wouldn't you? Yeah, it has. And I have to say, Cam has done such a great job sometimes not being on the on the course that he deserves, uh, being ranked as high as he is and the results he has had. We had that in Indian Wells, was a de defending champion. He had to work himself to the center court and he just goes uh, so greatly about it, you know, just really focusing on what he has to do on the court. And like you said, I'm one of the hard, hardest working players out there. So, you know, whenever he's doing well, he, he, we can only be super happy for him because he really deserves every bit of it. And then after that, Maria Sicari against Victoria Tomova finishes the action on court one tomorrow. But let's uh, go back inside centre court because there was a big cheer just a few uh, moments ago because this happened. Rafa Nadal was able to take his place in the second round. He had to fight so, so hard against Francisco Sarundolo, the Argentine, who produced some brilliant tennis, really pushed Rafa all the way with some of these long rallies, but that backhand just missing 
and you can see what it means to Rafa. He'll be delighted to be back in Santa Cruz and enjoying the victory after a while away. And he is through. Uh, and we were saying, Danny, that he would have liked the fact that he was tested today. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have wanted to go out there and win easily 6 1, 6 1, 6 1. He's had to get used to the grass and get used to what it's like to be uh, back on uh, centre court. And you can see just how much it means to him, what a true competitor he is. Yeah, it's that much sweeter when you have to really fight for the match and just the uh, right amount. If we went all the way to five sets, yeah, that's, I mean, one thing is to be tested, but it's pushing it a little bit. So to be able to turn around that fourth set and finish it actually not even going into the tiebreak, that's very, very impressive. And it just shows uh, where his confidence levels, obviously, after that Paris wins are. And just finally, before we go with Rafa, I mean, we, we, he was talking, wasn't he, about the, the foot injury, he was having injections and all sorts of problems. He says he's OK. Uh, for Wimbledon. Are there too many questions about him physically or from what you've seen today looks like he's moving okay? Uh, I think he's mo moving okay considering it was his first match. I think he can be much sharper but that comes with you know spending more time on the surface which he didn't really have so that's why it's even more impressive the way he was able to uh, come through this match uh, today and yes he I don't think was as sharp as we've seen in Paris but I think with every match he's going to get better and better, better and fingers crossed that um, you know he can stay pain free or or at least manage the pain to, to, to a point that he can keep playing. Okay day two is done for us it's getting a little bit chilly so time for us to head inside and get a hot chocolate we're looking forward to watching Andy Murray and Emma Raducanu back in action tomorrow. Have a good evening. It's bye for now from myself and Dan. We'll see you tomorrow. He didn't really have, so that's why it's even more impressive the way he was able to uh, come through this match uh, today. And yes, he, I don't think, was as sharp as we've seen in Paris, but I think with every match he's going to get better and better, better and fingers crossed that um, you know, he can stay pain-free or, or at least manage the pain to, to, to a point that he can keep playing. OK, day two is done for us. It's getting a little bit chilly, so time for us to head inside and get a hot chocolate. We're looking forward to watching Andy Murray and Emma Raducanu back in action tomorrow. Have a good evening. It's bye for now from myself and Dan. We'll see you tomorrow.